as uh, as Bill O'Reilly famously once said, uh, "Fuck it, we'll do it live." Do it live. <laughs> All right, I am uh, joined now um, for the beginning of a very very long live stream. For the first hour, I'm joined. Uh, by uh, Matt McManus, uh, who's pretty face people have seen before on the podcast. Uh, he is a professor of politics at uh, Whitman College. Uh, he's the author of a bunch of books about postmodern conservatism and other things. Um, Put me out of and- business tonight is what I said. <laughs> well, you know. <laughs> uh, and then um, by a fresh face uh, for the show, um, though, though certainly somebody uh, who uh, I've been following a long time, um, uh, my friend Rob Larson, uh, who is uh, the house economist now uh, officially at Current Affairs Magazine. Uh, he is also the author, among other things, I just happen to have this right by me to use as a prop uh, of this book, Capitalism Versus Freedom, The Toll Road to Serfdom. So That was your first one, right, Rob? Oh, it was technically my second. I had a book, okay. Economics, that uh, uh, flew under the radar. Oh, that's yeah, fine. It's, you're prolific enough that at some point I get the order confused, right? So ah, that's that's the curse we deal with. Yeah, no doubt. Fair enough. Ugh. so um, so yeah, we're we're at the very beginning of a um, of a very long haul, but uh, but you know, Matt and Rob are very both very smart people. I thought it would be good to help break down what uh, what very little uh, we know uh, <laughs> we know right now. Uh, so, which I guess to be fair is actually more than we'd normally know, uh, because even though uh, the sure. first polls don't close for a couple hours. Uh, the number of people who'd voted already, even like a couple of days ago, was like approximately as many people as voted total in like 1988, for example, way more people than voted in any previous election. And even about two thirds of the number of people who voted in 2016. And I think, like I said, those numbers are from like what the count was two days ago. I think now we're getting up to something like a hundred million people, uh, you know, voted before election day, uh, even started. And, and I think we have some idea of how those, those votes, uh, votes win. I mean, I, I don't, I don't think that's a complete mystery. No. Um, yeah, I was going to say, um, I remember back in 2016, you know, I was just about to complete my PhD and me and all my liberal and right left friends were basically at my apartment at the time. And, we were all about preparing our op-eds and shit, being like, now that Clinton's in power, you know, blah, 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 here's what we got to do. And let's just say there was a lot more whiskey drank uh, by the end of that night than any doctor would ever advise because we were just looking at it being like, what the fuck is going on? You know, like, am I, you know, drunk? You know, is there some acid flashback, you know, or whatever? Yeah. Um, but, you know, I'm trying uh, to be cautious about excessive optimism right now. Uh, but I do think that there are two reasons why it is that high voter turnout. about wouldn't necessarily favor Trump. Uh, one is a pretty obvious reason that, you know, politically um, high levels of voter turnout in the midst of a second term typically don't favor the incumbent because uh, it usually means that people are unhappy with the status quo. So we can take some optimism from that. Uh, and second is just the more general point, which is that high voter turnout generally, uh, as the president himself pointed out back in March, doesn't tend to favor the Republicans, right? Uh, who are essentially the anti-democratic party now, uh, which is a weird inversion of their history, of course, right? Um, pre-1960s history. So we can also take some optimism from that, right? Um, whether that means, you know, that I can unleash my anti-Biden screeds on the world, uh, you know, starting Wednesday, you know, like blah, 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 well, blah. Now well, that's what needs to be done. Uh, you know, we'll have to see, but I'm a little hopeful. Yeah, uh, I'm extremely, incredibly, guardedly optimistic also. Uh, yeah, it's hard to have any uh, yeah, hopeful feelings at this point. Cause yeah, we all got, uh, burned pretty bad last time. So it's natural. Uh, obviously the pollsters are very proud of, uh, the changes they said they've made to their, uh, sampling techniques. So one hopes, uh, the, uh, uh, likely voter polls won't be quite as off as they were in 2016. Uh, on the other hand though, uh, you know, Biden's had a much steadier lead than Clinton did. And he has obviously a lot less baggage than her, 
uh, political career, even though arguably he should have more baggage. But of course, that's not how the country sees it with a conservative Democrat. Uh, but yeah, I feel like every all of the usual things we rely on are kind of up in the air. Yeah, like I like to see higher turnout too. But does that mean you know more Trump supporters who don't believe the virus is real, mm -hmm. uh, or you know, uh, or not, or what? I guess you know we're all it's so early enough we're all waiting to see what happens on this uh, election doomsday. I mean Tuesday. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, one of the other things that I worry about is uh, if it still takes a little while to kind of record or all these mail-in ballots. It's quite possible, as a lot of people have pointed out, it's hardly the original point, that Trump will declare victory if it looks like certain polls are going in his favor or certain states are going in his favor. Uh, and then there could be a blue wave several days afterwards, but it might come up to the courts or it might come up to the point that where his followers decide that they're gonna militantly react against this. So who the fuck knows, yeah. right? You know, we've yeah. entered uncharted territory in so many uh, ways this year, so. Uh, why not just carry that through? Uh, yeah, through yeah. I mean, I think I think that's entirely possible. That um, I mean, I saw Freddie DeBoer uh, joke on Facebook that uh, uh, that his prediction was that Trump will win the election by six votes to three, and you know that that could, that could totally happen, right? Uh, I don't think. I, I definitely don't think we can rule that out. I mean, there's no way Trump's winning the popular vote. I think we can rule that out more. Yeah. Or less. Um, yeah. But uh, but he could he could win. Um, <laughs> Uh, sorry, I just I just saw a friend of the show, Harvey K, says in the chat, um, we, uh, uh, by the time he goes on at seven, I might be drunk if I start now. Uh, but, um, uh, but um, yeah, I'll, I'll, we'll pace it. Uh, I've already but, said that, actually. I'm really looking forward to like the uh, before or after pictures with you because you really have an uphill marathon for you. And I hope that um, yeah. somebody invested at least in a distillery close to you because I'm sure that they're going to have a... <laughs> A, a prosperous night, uh, you know, with a with your marathon right now. Yeah, yeah. well, I, I'm I'm going to be actually. I haven't started yet. I was uh, I was doing some Zoom office hours just before this. I might get up in a minute and either grab some more coffee or start with the whiskey. But it's uh, but the um, uh, but I think I think tonight uh, drinking uh, Whistle Pig, which is a rye, which uh, which is is good stuff, but it's not from anywhere around any distillery around here. Uh, but yeah, look, I think that, I think that, I mean, obviously we could get, you know, Biden is going to win the popular vote. I think that's, that's, you know, we could be as certain of as anything, but then like that still leaves open the possibility that Trump just outright wins the electoral vote, which is still possible. Mm -hmm. uh, my, my understanding from uh, my um, fun fact, high school classmate Nate Silver uh, on Twitter uh, is, uh, is that, um, Biden's ahead in Pennsylvania, or at least as of over the weekend, you know, um, but not by so much that the polls yeah. would have to be off in some like unprecedented way, right? Like the thing you probably heard people say over and over and over again in the last few days is, oh, for um, for by for Trump to win, this would have to be the greatest polling error ever, right? Like a bigger polling error than than Dewey defeats Truman, and I think that's probably true on the popular vote level, but I don't know if that's true about Pennsylvania. Okay. Uh, I think, I think that Trump might still win there and, and uh, Biden has paths to victory that don't involve Pennsylvania, but they're not, um, it'd be a much less certain thing at that point. So I think that could still happen. And then the other thing that could still happen um, is that uh, if it's a, um, if it is close uh, or whatever, again, if it's close in swing states, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, as Matt kind of indicated, uh, you know Trump could uh, pull a Pete Buttigieg, you know, in Iowa from Iowa, and uh, and declare victory when he hasn't won yet, uh, and and then if that happens, uh, then it's you know I mean we we could like we could grind our way into some sort of awful Bush v Gore two scenario mm -hmm. whereby. Uh, sure, as more mail-in votes are, are counted. Uh, thank you very much for the super chat, Joshua. Um, much appreciated. Um, uh, Cheers, Tom, man. Um, but as more and more votes are counted, uh, then it starts to favor Biden more and more, which would then allow, I mean, this is whatever, I'm sure everybody's heard this before, which would then allow uh, the, uh, the Republicans to frame it as an issue of, uh, of the Democrats trying to, uh, trying to steal the election. Uh, and then, you know, who knows what could happen. Uh, and, and I think I wouldn't, 
I mean, I don't think, like, I don't take seriously any of the apocalyptic stuff about, you know, that you've probably seen people like throw around on Twitter or about, you know, civil wars and coups and things like that. I think that I, I think that uh, I don't think anybody's doing that for for the for the Trump administration. I think I think you could have a. Um, I could just say from Canada's, uh, from a Canadian perspective, uh, if the Democrats decide to call in the Canadian armed forces to uh, <laughs> protect or, you know, to uh, install a President Biden, there might actually be significant support for that uh, north of the border, right? Yeah. yeah. If, if Bolivia got that, we should deserve it, you know. <laughs> yeah, there you go, right? Uh, you know, just get, get Trudeau on side, you know, we'll all march across the border and we'll be like, what's this all about? And, you know, we'll see what goes on. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um... I mean, I, I guess I guess there was a semi-successful Canadian invasion once, but I, th I think the U.S. military has gotten better since then. So I, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if I like your chances now. Uh, but yeah, it's been a long so, time since 1812. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, but but in, in any case, um, I mean, I don't think any of that stuff's happening. I, I basically I don't think that the uh, that any significant like ruling class or establishment actors are going to take risks on that level for the sake mm -hmm. of, of keeping Joe Biden out of office. That, that, yeah, that's never, sure. that never really made sense to me. Uh, but, but that said, I could imagine that if we are in Bush v. Gore territory, the 2020 version of the Brooks brothers riot could be a lot more violent and crazy than, than mm -hmm. what happened in, in 2000. I mean, I, I am doing this from, uh, Northern Michigan, where where famously, uh, very recently there was a uh, there was a, a plot uh, to um, uh, kidnap uh, the uh, the governor uh, Gretchen Whitmer, who's who's a very like uh, milk toast centrist Democrat. Uh, so you know, I mean, I I don't and you know whatever it could there could be a level of there could be some element of entrapment there. I've seen people suggest that, but I don't know how much suggestion you had to make. <laughs> To get some of these people to uh, to do that, I think they were pretty much ready to go. I am wondering how much outrage that would actually spark, though, because I mean, the reality is that uh, since pretty much everyone has established that Biden is going to win the popular vote, uh, if it looks like Trump is going to eke out a victory because of some kind of legal technicality because he's packed the Supreme Court, that would make it the third him the third Republican president uh, to be elected since the two thousands uh, without having won the popular vote, and. You know, Americans put up with a lot, but there's a certain level of democratic illegitimacy that I think would cross this threshold even for a lot of people. And I certainly don't agree that there would be violence about it, but I think there would certainly be a lot more intense pressure from civil society to enact more dramatic reforms uh, if Biden wasn't one, which might actually be beneficial. Uh, and I actually hope that if Biden does win, that they'll push forward something like those kind of reforms anyway. You know, granting statehood to Puerto Rico, granting force statehood to Washington, D.C., all these things would be really difficult, but it would be nice to see, right? Because uh, the reality is that when the system pushes out people like Trump uh, or Bush, uh, in some senses it was designed to do that, right? It was to privilege Southern power. And, you know, this in the New York Review of Books a little while ago, we said everybody's talking about this like a constitutional crisis. Uh, the reality is the constitutional was designed as an elitist document right. that was going to give the South a little bit more power. for Biden if they do. Um, if they do, actually. <laughs> Uh, so, um, uh, so yeah, um, and and then if not, it'll be uh, it'll be a sort of embarrassed uh, cutscene uh, after <laughs> that. But uh, um, but the one I did, the one that's on Jackman right now for me from this morning uh, is uh, is called "Let Everyone Vote," and it's about um, you know some of the some of the features of that uh, that constitutional. Uh, order that you're talking about, uh, at least as it's played out, um, you know, not that a lot of the stuff isn't mandated in the federal constitution, but, um, you know, because it's up to the states, uh, but that by my back of the envelope calculations, there are about um, even putting aside the question of like where you think the voting age should be, uh, there are about 31 million, uh, maybe more, uh, adults who live in the United States uh, who who aren't legally allowed to vote in American elections because there are a couple million prisoners, there are a few million uh, parolees, people who've already served their term, but they live in states where uh, where ex felons aren't allowed to vote. Uh, there are about 13.2 million green card holders. So keep in mind, those are people who've already lived in the United States for at least five years, have been granted legal permanent residency, but they still can't vote 
to help determine the laws that they're expected to follow while they spend the rest of their lives in the United States. Uh, there are, depending on the calculations you believe, between 10.5 million maybe and many more. Um, the high end goes way higher, uh, undocumented immigrants. Um, and uh, and then this doesn't even count like categories like, um, for example, like foreign students. Uh, there are about 1.1 million of those. Mm -hmm. Although it's not clear at all to me, at least, what the principle is by which we're excluding them because – uh, if you grow up in one state and you go out of state, you know, to, to go to college and you're planning to go back the second you're done, uh, you're still allowed to register to vote where you're going to college. And, 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 you know, during those years when you live there and you're expected to follow state and local laws, you're, you're given a democratic right to, to help determine them. So, uh, so to me, at least it's unclear why we should deny this to, um, uh, to foreign nationals who are living in the United States either. But like when you put the numbers together, it's, it, it's shocking. Uh, how just how many people live here and aren't allowed to vote here? Yeah, particularly since the uh, disenfranchisement of prisoners has it's probably most dramatic in a certain sunshine state, right, uh, where there are hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of people who have been disenfranchised by draconian laws passed by the GOP. And you know, Florida has been known to have an impact on the U.S. election every now and then. Uh, you know, so that can actually be pretty significant if you think about it, right? Yeah, it's amazing how many the endless carve outs and delineations on who can vote and who can't like that's kind of yeah, I mean, that is like stunning in itself like that number Ben, like that total number is just completely crackers. What I always think of too is just even for those of us who are enfranchised, you know, the lucky people like voting in this country is I mean, such a pain in the balls. It's just incredibly difficult. And I live on the West Coast where we do everyone gets a mail ballot. And, you know, it comes and you get a voter guide, even like, a, which is incredibly useful. So, you know, something about like the judges and the obscure, you know, uh, state races that don't have a convenient, stupid party affiliation with them. But that's rare. I mean, that's the West Coast states and like Utah and Colorado, I think, are the only ones that do universal uh, mail ballots these days. And of course, we have microscopic rates of uh, voter fraud, incredibly low, nowhere near the numbers that would be involved in swinging the state since everyone's paranoid about that. But even just putting that aside, it's just kind of stunning to me because, of course, what we're basing all of this discussion on and what everyone on TV is looking at is the polling data that we have and how reliable will it be? Will it be like 2016 when it underestimated the Republican in key states or like 2012 when it underestimated Obama across the board, which you know is yeah, also possible. Although it's also, it's also worth worth pointing out i mean I, I guess you alluded to this earlier but um both that okay so the pollsters say they've gotten better since 2016 maybe they have maybe they haven't but also uh but also the polls um certainly on the popular vote level and i think for most of these states the uh, the polls would have to be much more wrong than they were in 2016 oh clearly which is reassuring i think we're all keeping that fact close to our hearts which just the, the the only thing i think of though with, with relying on that poll data and especially again like the democrats like in 2016 are saying we look at these polls we have a data-driven campaign process so we don't need to do a big ground campaign in these states right exactly and they're they sort of are now. It's kind of late arrivals to the game, whereas, of course, the evil campaign has been very excited to tell us how many doors they've been knocking on and how many voters they've been breathing on uh, and so on. But just just for one, uh, since we're talking about the ins and outs of this, I always think of, I mean, just it, you, great, you have the franchise, the polling tells you what people will vote for, but then will you actually vote? And on top of like the long lines and the just decreasing number of poll places, especially since the... Uh, uh, wonderful Supreme Court uh, gutted the most relevant provisions of the Voting Rights Act way before Trump got around to packing it. Uh, it just amazes me because I always want to. I just want to look at the dumb. You know, God bless them, but our dumb Australian friends because they're. It's just interesting. <laughs> our country's just like us. It's a bunch of goofy, in insecure, racist white people gripping guns and thinking that's going to save them from all of our giant social problems. But it's incredible because in Australia, it's like jury duty voting. Like it's a civic obligation. I mean, of course, you get the day off. Lots of countries do that. But if you like can't get to the voting station, they'll send a van to your low income neighborhood and they'll pick you up because you're voting. It's like jury duty. Like you're obliged to participate. I just bring that up because whenever everyone, including us, you know, now, what are we going to do? You look at the polls. Like in Australia, their polling data is, is more reliable to the extent that it captures people who are going to vote. 
because they're going to vote because it's a legal obligation. Whereas here, the polls tell you who people would like to vote for. Will they get to the polls? You know. Well, that's that one thing that I think is a reason for optimism right now because candidly, and I was wrong about this like anyone else was, right? I mean, I wanted Bernie Sanders to be the nominee. Uh, and I think if he was a nominee, uh, then we'd be probably celebrating a democratic socialist in the White House for the first time ever, right? Uh, but there does seem to be more enthusiasm for Biden than I gave him credit for. And one of the reasons for it is this. Um, I think actually the Republicans overestimated um, their capacity to attack him, particularly when it came to things like his intelligence and his capacity. Because if you looked at him in the debate, right, uh, he wasn't great. He's not exactly going to light the world on fire with his charisma. But he's not a competent, technocratic, and grandfatherly. Uh, and putting aside all the problems with his record and stuff, I think that that's spiked a bit of enthusiasm uh, for his candidacy, especially because people hate Trump so much. Um, so, I mean, I agree with you 100%, uh, Rob. You know, Having people participate to like the umpteenth extreme in every election would be great. Uh, I was going to say maybe they can start sending joints, uh, you know, and on the West Coast along with, you know, the little packets and stuff, you know, just to kind of further yeah, incentivize yeah. people. But like, he does seem to have actually created not a movement on his behalf, but certainly a movement on behalf of his candidacy, uh, if only to get rid of the incumbent, right? Or, or they could, or they could pass out, um, like, uh, you know, they, they could pass out, um, uh, I'm trying to think. It would have to be tiny letters. Maybe they could pass out bongs that said, I voted on the Mexican League. The, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. the, the joint yeah. is itself a rolled up piece of campaign literature. That could be. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Uh, that's, that's the smart one. Or, or, or if you, or they'll give you like some voter information as you enter in. And as you leave, the campaign worker will roll a joint with it for you. Um, that's smart. <laughs> yeah, that's I a like really your smart idea, one. Man. That's recyclable also then, right? I mean, you're reusing <laughs> It's reuse, I suppose. Yeah, that's yeah. I do like your point, Rob, about the uh, the the Supreme Court uh, gutting the Voting Rights Act because this is something I've been thinking about a lot, right? Since even if the um, even if the uh, Freddie DeBoer prediction doesn't come to pass and the Supreme Court doesn't steal the election uh, for for Trump, obviously, um, I don't know. I'd be, I have to say, I would be shocked. If Biden actually expanded the Supreme Court uh, as as president, yeah. um, this, I mean, I, I know that he for a while, you know, he and Harris weren't answering the question, which made perfect sense to me because they didn't they don't get anything out of any possible answer, right? If if you say if you say yes, that you spook the suburban moderate Republicans, they're obsessed with courting, and you also create an expectation that you're not going to fulfill because there's no way they actually do it, and then if you say no. Uh, then that really demoralizes the base at the time that you most need them because you're you're admitting that the Supreme Court is is lost for the foreseeable future, and that's usually one of the best ways to get people to go out and vote for the Democrats by talking about the Supreme Court. Uh, but ultimately, what they came up with was uh, they said they were going to create a uh, like a a commission to study it, which I think is the most Democrat thing ever, right? You know that like that's that that's what you know they'll. They'll have a commission, you know. They'll they'll get back to you later, uh, but if if they don't expand it, which it doesn't look like they do, um, you know, then that that institution is lost for the foreseeable future. I mean, short of some sort of Pelican brief scenario, you know, it's hard to say what would uh, what would make that not happen. Nineties uh, kids will get it, uh, but um, <laughs> uh, and I I think there's been a lot of weird thinking about this on the left because like people are are starting to. You know, a lot of people are coming around to like court, like, you know, expanding the court or uh, or doing term limits. You know, I interviewed Shahid Buttara. That's what he that's what he was all for. Right. But like all of this is a little weird anyway. Uh, I think the more basic question is, why is it that we um, tolerate like why is it that we tolerate this institution of democracy in the first place? Right. Like, like, like why is it we, sh we should have that we that we have this like lifetime appointment super legislature that's empowered to overturn democratically passed laws. And, uh, and, and I, and I think that if you, if you're counting on, if your idea is you've got this kind of civics class conception of what the Supreme court does, you say, Oh, well, they, they're, they're there to protect the rights of minorities that are going to be otherwise trampled by democratic majorities. Even putting aside the fact that it's like Samuel Moyne will tell you the, uh, if you, look at like 90% of the history of the Supreme Court, the unpopular minority it's most likely to um, uh, to, to intervene to protect is uh, rich people. Uh, but uh, they- Or racist. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well, but that's the other thing, right? That's Rob's point about the Voting Rights Act, because sure, if we have this this kind of super legislature that can that can overturn things that are passed by the actual legislature, they can use that power to protect rights when the when the real legislature violates them, and sometimes they do that. But they can equally use it to uh, to to remove rights that have been granted by the legislature, which is what they did in the voting rights case. Yeah. I just want to interject uh, here and say that um, one of the commentators co uh, mentioned that they truly wish that Michael Brooks was here to actually uh, appear on the show. And I think we should certainly give a shout out to him since it is a real shame uh, that he's not here. Uh, and I imagine if Biden won, uh, it would really be something to hear him talk about that. So. Yeah, no, it absolutely would be. I, I think uh last night for for whatever um for whatever reason um i don't know maybe just because the election is coming up today um you know i was dwelling on that much more than i have let myself do in weeks um and uh yeah i mean you know because it's obviously you know like everything else right i mean it, it just seems it's just uh you know it just feels so fucking unfair that uh that, that, that he's not around for this, you know, like, like, like everything else, you know, that, that he's not, uh, that he's not around for, which, you know, whatever, I'm uh, a good atheist. I don't think there's any guarantee that it would be fair, but the, uh, this particular unfairness really stings. Um, it's true. It's a big, uh, it's a big track suit to fill. That's what I would say. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. Right. Uh, yeah, well, well said. Uh, but just on your point, you know, um, I think that actually the Moin piece uh, is fantastic. Right. And, there are a lot of scholars who have pointed this out. Ian Shapiro, uh, there's a good Canadian constitutional analyst called Kent Roach who's made exactly the same point, uh, which is that liberals uh, and leftists have this kind of idealized vision of what the Supreme Court is capable of doing, uh, mainly because they think of the heyday of the Warren Court, right? Uh, particularly baby boomers, mm -hmm. right? The Warren Court, uh, this idealized institution, you know, that got rid of capital punishment, uh, you know, you know, got rid of you know segregation and so on. Uh, but you know, Moyn, Roach. And Shapiro point out that for the vast majority of the court's history, it's been a highly reactionary institution, uh, upholding everything from slavery to very strict conceptions of property rights, undermining democracy, you name it. Uh, and so one of the things that they point out is that when liberals cry, while well, the court has changed, uh, it hasn't really changed. You know, it's gone back to exactly what it has been for the vast majority of its history, right? And I think that one is exactly right. That that doesn't mean we should stop trying to agitate uh, to get a more liberal court. Uh, that would obviously be a foolish tactical thing to do. Uh, I mean, we could always try to get more Sotomayors on there, Ginsburgs, you know, for all the problems that she has, right? Um, but the less power has never come from a bunch of typically affluent judicial activists, uh, pioneering laws uh, or interpretations of the law that are will be beneficial to the most marginalized people of the country, right? And I think it's naive to think that it's very likely uh, that we're going to get something like that again. So we should look at other sources to actually try to obtain power uh, and advocate for like long-term legal change. Yeah, and actually, kind of follow up on what Matt's saying there. Um, you know, like, it's yeah, it's not just the Voting Rights Act, as we're all painfully aware. Uh, way before we got to even this current nightmare era of the court, that back in the Obama days, you had the Citizens United case, which really, okay. really threw open the goddamn doors for uh, the money spending on this election. And I have to say, um, obviously, the election is just now uh, concluding, so all the numbers on this are preliminary, but just for fun, uh, right. it might be worth looking at just the economics of these campaigns a little bit. Uh, obviously, it was a really goofy campaign year with a lot less of uh, in-person campaigning, especially for the Democratic uh, presidential campaign uh, compared to the Republican one. And no real conventions were held on anything like their old scale. So it's a weird year. But the fact is, like most of the main trends on money in the races are going strong. So uh, one thing to bear in mind, if, as we all hope, stupid walking corpse Joe Biden beats nightmare clown Donald Trump, we'll all be happy about that. <laughs> until we wake up tomorrow and read the news that Biden's campaign is the first billion dollar uh, White House race. So Joe uh, Billion there, uh, if you t I mean, that's just completely crazy. And most of that is his own campaign that's counting the basic super PACs. And I should say, I'm just pulling these numbers off the great, great uh, Center for Responsive uh, Politics at opensecrets.org, which everyone should have open today as you're sweating out uh, today's uh, results coming in. Like that's the numbers that went into the election system as we wait for the output. So a billion dollars there, um, primarily your larger uh, campaign donations, only about, according to their numbers, 
only about 38% of Biden's uh, donations are under uh, in the, uh, are uh, small donor donations, meaning under 200 bucks. Okay, uh, whereas Trump is much more uh, closer to even with how much of his funding came from small donors and how much came from big donors. It's 54 large to 45 small. Uh, kind of reflecting that Trump was always sort of in a middle position between traditional big ticket fundraisers and the Sanders model, where the average donation was, uh, help me out here, guys. I forget exactly how tiny it was, but it was $27. Yeah, see, that's. Oh, that's, $7. <laughs> oh, that's yep. fantastic. What a superior time that was for us. Really. I, guess I can barely get you, you know, two meals at McDonald's at this point, right? You, know, you, you skip on the Big Mac and, you know, you just get like, you know, yeah. a single pad and you can do it. Uh, that's no, actually, uh, the yeah. Last yeah, the last thing, the last time I did drive through McDonald's, it wasn't that much less than that. Uh, uh, see, uh, so many, so many sacrifices we've made this year. But yeah, <laughs> until uh, until Sanders uh, got finally stopped by the combined powers of all the corporate media pissing on him from a great height at the same time, and Warren staying in the race after Obama got all the shitty centrists who had much better hopes to drop out. I mean, it took everything the establishment had to stop Sanders, but it did just succeed. So none of us likes looking back on super stupid Tuesday. I mean, super Tuesday. But since then, you do see like Trump has kept some of that model up. Like, again, almost half of his donations are under 200 bucks. Like it does speak to his sort of, you know, the devotion of that base. I mean, even here in, you know, I'm in Washington state right now, which is about as blue as it gets by today's standards. And mm. uh, just driving across the state the other day outside of the cities, uh, it's nothing but Trump rallies and very energized Trump supporters uh, you know, so I think, and that you see that in that number there, you know. But again, uh, Trump is behind by a neighborhood of about 150 million relative to the Biden campaign. But remember, that's just straight up money raised and spent. Remember that in 2016, uh, Clinton outraised and spent Trump by similar amounts. But of course, at that time, Trump received the equivalent of an estimated five billion dollars worth of free media time because he was so sensational and cnn right. oh he's terrible let's show all of his speeches and not show exactly work. yeah yeah it's real money so just to say this race looks similar on the money only with bigger dollar amounts for what it's worth so it'll take a couple of days of course to see how that shakes out but at least the numbers there aren't like wildly divergent from the past well i hope it's like bloomberg's little intervention also right you know where he dropped what was it five hundred million dollars to win? You know, uh, some minuscule uh, percentage of actually the Democratic supporters. Yeah. yeah, I think I don't know if Bloomberg or uh, or Jeb Bush is the world record holder for uh, most money per votes ever, <laughs> uh, but sir, it would certainly be between being those two guys. Uh, <laughs> like, which is actually in, in both cases sort of oddly comforting that um, that you can't. You, like obviously you have a huge leg up if, if you have the money to throw around, but like you can't just buy it. Like, you know, like the candidate himself has to be offering something, something. To, to someone. Something. <laughs> like you like it like you you know, if you blanket the airwaves with Bloomberg stuff, uh but uh but um like literally nobody finds Bloomberg appealing, which I mean, if there was a second there where I remember being worried that that someone would yeah. uh, in the Democratic primary, because I was pretty sure nobody would in the general election, because I thought it's like, okay, I mean, I'm from Michigan, um, which is a state that's uh, famously uh, part of the reason Trump is president, you know, is, is because he just barely won Michigan in 2016. Uh, he won by 0.23% uh, of the vote. Um, I believe about 10,000 votes. Uh, and... Um, and a big part of that is that in, in places like Detroit and Flint, you know, where, which have really seen the brunt of this kind of post-industrial decay, uh, that um, there was a lot of um, a lot of people were were very uh, uh, yes, uh, go wings, uh, <laughs> uh, but a lot of people were. Um, <laughs> um, you know, a lot of people left in those in those cities. Uh, you know, traditional Democratic voters. Uh, you know, would like even people who did show up to vote like left the top of their ballots blank. Uh, Malika Jabali uh, uh, reported on the same thing happening in Wisconsin, uh, and uh, you know, a lot of that was because people, you know, not incorrectly associated the with uh, the economic policies that devastated the state over decades. 
And all I could think was, oh, my God, the Democrats are going to run um, this weird billionaire, uh, for, you know, who, who's, who's like big issues are uh, taking away guns and like limiting the, si the sizes of soda that you can sell. You know, like this is going to be such yeah. a catastrophe if they, that's who they run against Trump. And, a you know, Republican billionaire, just to <laughs> mention that he was act, an actual Republican. I remember thinking, I'll, if it came down to Bloomberg and Trump, I was willing to leave the Trump, the top blank. Like that's over the top. Like if you're going to force me to vote, yeah, choose well, between I, two misogynist, I, racist Republican billionaires, that gets tough. I know. I think Nathan Robinson had a piece on this where he said, you know, one of the dilemmas that I find myself in right now is that I have to deal with like a competent uh, auto autocracy or plutocracy or an insane plutocracy uh, slash autocracy. I'm not exactly sure which one of these is better because, you know, insanity can be over the top, but it can also be incompetent. So I'm like, yeah, that's a, that's a tough one, you know? <laughs> yeah, no, no, for sure. I actually did. I actually did write an article uh, during that Bloomberg moment. I did write an article for a Jack Vin saying pretty much what Rob just said uh, that I um, it's called Bloomberg is not the lesser evil. And, uh, mm. and I, um, I argued in there uh, that, that it would actually, um, that basically none of the arguments, which which obviously I do co-sign in the normal case, uh, for um, uh, for for tactically, uh, you know, voting for the lesser evil in swing states. Uh, Mad and I uh, co-wrote an article about this for Ario. Um, that I think that basically none of those arguments uh, would would really apply in Bloomberg's case because. Yeah. Um, I mean, one you'd really want to do, uh, like, like one you'd actually really worry that um, that if we had a second uh, eccentric billionaire who was to take, you know, like detached from party establishments and just kind of picked a party and bought his way in, you know, onto the ballot, uh, then that would really kind of uh, spell the end of uh, the previous era in American politics. Like, like, like we'd just be, it would, it would be like, um, you know, it would be like crossing. You know, be like Caesar marching his troops across the Rubicon. You know, that's like okay. Now from now on, we're just gonna have one crazy general after another. You know, declare himself uh, the, yeah. uh, the uh, dictator of Rome. You know that like now we're just gonna get this succession of weird billionaires uh, coming in to do this, like Trump and Bloomberg had. And then the other part of the argument was that uh, Bloomberg is uh, relatively detached uh, from uh, from the uh, Democratic establishment. That uh, that I mean, he had. Like right up until he ran, like he supported both Democrats and Republicans. It's like the whims, you know, the whims of you know his uh, his feelings took him. Uh, and so there's, I thought that you know, like one of the reasons that one of I think the best reasons to to hope that Biden wins. Um, you know, I know this isn't sexy, but I, and I think it's not talked about nearly enough on the left. But one of the best reasons is like uh, the uh, National Labor Relations Board. Um, <laughs> When, when Republicans are, are in power and, you know, their NLRB seats come open every year, when Republicans are in power, they they always appoint these, like, crazy union busters uh, to the NLRB, uh, and Democrats appoint, like, mediocre Democrats, but, like, in that context of that institution, uh, the, like, the difference is actually really important. Um, like, like, that small example, right, you know, you're both academics, so appreciate this, that uh, I remember from uh, the Bush era is that Bush's NLRB ruled that uh, graduate students uh, weren't eligible for collective bargaining rights because they were primarily students, not primarily employees. Um, so that's, that's the kind of thing that you tend to get from Republican NLRBs. Uh, and there's been a shit ton of that under Trump, like really bad stuff. Yeah. Um, uh, like Trump's NLRB has uh, uh, ruled that uh, that it's not protected speech uh, for for workers to uh, to speak out about um, about the inadequate COVID safety precautions in their workplaces. You can get fired for that. Uh, that that's that's one example out of many, you know, of, of the um, awful, really awful stuff that they've they've done. Um, but like with Bloomberg, I don't know. I mean, maybe he would have appointed Democrats. Maybe he would have appointed Republicans. You know, like like I, I think it's much less predictable because he's not tied to the party machine the same way. Um, so so I I I don't know if I would have stuck to my guns or not if Bloomberg was the nominee. But I'm I'm happy that I didn't have to find out. Yeah, I want to pick up a really important point that you made there, though, because uh, in addition to the vital role that we play in actually preserving 
good working conditions for laborers and actually trying to secure fair wages and so on. They're actually vital parts uh, of any kind of left-wing party political machine that goes forward. Uh, I mean, if you look at like the heyday uh, of the American, uh, and for that matter, the UK labor movement, right, between, you know, around the 1950s to the 1960s, right, uh, they could have an actual impact uh, on the policies of a major party. That's declined since then when really the only major union left in the United States is the teachers union. Uh, they're a little bit more powerful in the UK, but certainly not nearly as significant as they used to be. And I think as leftists, if we want to actually change policy uh, through the avenue uh, of a political party, right, a standard political party, uh, one of the things that we need to do is rebuild the strength of these kinds of institutions, right? And oh, no, qu yeah, no question. That, I don't know. He said that he's going to, right? Uh, but I know that Trump isn't, right? I mean, well, Trump well I don't, I, I guess here's the distinction I would make. I don't believe that Biden is going to do much of anything to arrest the long-term decline of the labor movement. Uh, he, you know, as you say, he says he will. If you go onto the Biden-Harris website, uh, you'll see a promise to uh, institute uh, something called card check, which is basically a reform that would make it much easier to organize unions. Uh, the re one reason I'm very skeptical to actually do that is if you go back and look at the uh, Obama 2008 website, yeah. uh, Obama also said he was going to do it. Uh, and uh, it was given up on so quickly it never even came to a vote. Right. Uh, out, like basically, I think that even if you buy into the idea that uh, that Obama might have meant it, um, he certainly didn't care enough about it uh, to um, to expend any political capital making it happen or burn any bridges with the donor class. And in fact, that very half hearted effort to do it, his point man was Vice President Joe Biden. So um, so I really don't believe that that's going to happen. But yeah. what I do believe. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We just we should remember too in those first two years the Democrats did have the trifecta and in, you know those yeah. conservative Senate Democrats killed off you know the uh, energy cap and trade bill that passed the House and uh, yeah we're eager to talk about how they're going to sink card check and everything else uh, it's it is tough and especially after that Supreme Court decision for Janice of course uh, uh, some of you guys of course will know too being academics as we said uh, you know we work at least in part. Uh, for the states, and it's uh, very difficult to keep your union alive because, unlike with banks or political parties, you have to actively get people to recommit constantly to being part of a uh, collective bargaining unit. Uh, so, even as yeah, the Democrats won't, uh, you know, even as yeah, they're too wimpy to make any steps forward that would help labor. They're happy to let the Supreme Court completely slip out of hand and destroy the Voting Rights Act and pour money into politics and kill yeah. the unions and everything else. Yeah, no, no question. And and by the way, I should shout out uh, that. Um, uh, that uh, Nathan Robinson uh, had a really good article about the Janus ruling, um, where you know where he he pointed out uh, the absurdity of of the you know like the big at least propaganda. You know, it's not the legal argument, although in a way it's the legal argument, but it's the big certainly the big propaganda talking point associated with the legal argument uh, is uh, is that if um, if you have uh, what the pre janus status quo was, which is that uh, you could have public sector uh, unions where because the union is legally required to represent everybody's interests, right? If, if anybody has a problem at work, uh, whether they're a member or not, uh, then, uh, then the union has to go to bat for them, you know, has to file the grievance. Uh, and, um, but then of course uh, that would mean that if uh that if you didn't have to be a member, which which even before this, to be clear, you never had to be a member. But uh, if you um, but if you weren't a member, you had to at least pay this agency fee to 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 fund the union's representation of you when these things happened at, at closed shops, uh, even in the public sector. And um, and the big argument against this was, oh well, uh, this is um, workers at these places, state employees are being forced. Uh, to uh, to to fund you know support this uh, association that you know that they might not want to and that does political things and whatever, uh, but and and of course Nathan's very simple point you know which which was very well made in that article was um, well hold on the only way this counts as force is if you think that if you require somebody to do something as a condition of their employment uh, then you are thereby taking away their freedom and forcing them to do that thing which is not really a premise that you would expect right-wing Republicans to, to support. Like if you think about it for 10 seconds, you know, that would imply, you know, 
something about capitalism in general, uh, frankly, right? You know? Okay, you know, at the same time, of course, you know, I should have a limitless right to spend money to amplify my voice. And if I don't, uh, that's a limitation on my speech, right? Since my capacity to spend money now apparently constitutes speech in some integral, mysterious way to the Supreme Court post Citizens United, right? Yes, that's uh, the best The best form of speech, because then how much of it you have depends on like your wallet, which is a great way to do it, you know? <laughs> it is, yeah. it, It's speech, it's something you have if you have money. That makes sense, I, I understand that. Well, yeah, I mean, my wallet should really, should practically be able to vote for me at this point, I imagine, in the minds of a lot of Republicans and their the well, donor you know, I, I always like, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and, uh, and, and alienate uh, the inevitable tank is in the chat by pointing this out, but in, um, that's part of what the uh, Hong Kong protests were about, that, um, that uh, in Hong Kong, they almost literally have that. They, uh, there, are, there are literally the, the governing uh, legislature, I'm trying to remember what it's called, uh, in Hong Kong, they literally have people who are there who like have seats in the legislature, like representing like business interests. Uh, and, um, uh, and which is something that was set up uh, by, by the, uh, the British, uh, the British colonizers. Uh, but the, um, but you know, the, uh, <laughs> uh, the, 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 the people's Republic has not felt the need to, uh, to change that, you know, since they, yeah. uh, since they took it back. And that is a big part of what those protests were about. That's fantastic. It reminds me of like, if it adjusts, right. Remember, uh, you know, the, Great post postmodern novel by David Foster Wallace released in the 1990s, right? But you know, yeah, yeah, the year of the medicated pad. Yeah, exactly, right? You know, we'll have the year of the dependent adult undergarments and you know, the year, year of the whopper and stuff, right? You know? mm -hmm. It's bizarre. Right? <laughs> Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I'm going to get up for just a second, uh, get some coffee, but uh, you guys carry on without me. That sounds that. good, man. So I was going to say, Rob, you're in Washington State right now, right? Yeah, you got it. Okay, perfect. Uh, around where? Because uh, the college that I teach at, albeit remotely right now, is in Walla Walla. Yeah, I thought I saw you had moved out there. Yeah, in the eastern part of the state. Yeah, uh, usually I'm in Tacoma, which is like Seattle's uh, Oakland, mm -hmm. like a blue collar, less white city right by a big global uh, metropole. Uh, right now I'm up at my folks place up in Port Angeles out in the sticks uh, to write, write out this tumultuous time uh, for all of us, man. That's great. When you're back in the state, we should uh, definitely hang out, man. We should hang out. Oh, absolutely. I'm hoping, um, you know, maybe next year or so. But what, what I wanted to ask you is, like, a lot of people have talked about the kind of weird divisions in Washington State where they kind of, like, you know, are emblematic of uh, a lot of the political divisions that you see in the United States broadly, where the rural areas tend to be a lot more Republican, uh, and then Seattle uh, is just blue as you possibly can get, right? Uh, I can't remember which politician said this, but they was something to the clip of, like, uh, if you go to the top of the Space Needle in Seattle, all the votes that you need uh, to get a Democrat in office, uh, you can see from the Space Needle, right? Why, why do you think that is exactly? Yeah, you know, man, I mean, that's a real, like, that's a question that needs a book. Yeah, why is, why do we have such a urbanization, urbanization trend, you know? And yeah, you know, like earlier, Ben brought up when people make uh, fanciful projections of civil war in this country and stuff. Like, it's difficult to really feature because people look at maps of states and how they do like for the presidential race and they go, okay, so these countries fight these countries like in this, like in the last civil war, which was very regional, but here it's so, as soon as you look at one of those County maps for how the politics breaks out, it's just straight urbanization, you know, like, yeah, big blue States like Washington, you know, or New York state have these huge red regions, but because there's so many human beings living in the cities, it outvotes them. Like, I like how, um, like they've been doing this for years. Like Republicans will always put up those maps, like yeah, behind yeah. Tucker Carlson on his idiotic TV show. Uh, you know, they put, they have a map of the United States showing all the counties that voted. You know, that are red for Trump votes versus blue for Clinton votes. And they yeah, say, see, had, uh, a copy of that actually in his office for a little while, right? Just so that he could jerk off to it whenever he felt that. <laughs> I assume that they look at that, yeah, and, and drink a bunch of uh, you know weird uh, uh, beer, and then uh, yeah, to, to do horrible wrongful things to their person as yeah. we would say but what what it is though of course is these are all pictures though of races where the blue you know the blue candidate like the democrat candidate wins the popular vote by several million so these idiots think they're putting up posters of how conservative america is but all those reds all those huge vast red places have fewer humans in them than these little blue dots where the cities and big you know sprawly city regions are so really these maps are 
are, it, are maps of how America, rural America is dying. Mm -hmm. Like look at all these places that have fewer people than these little blue dots. It shows something very different from, from what they think. But as for why that's the case, so like, you're, you're, uh, uh, like you were saying, like why is it, yeah, looking out from the major cities, you see enough votes to like swing an election one way or another. I mean, that's urbanization, you know? And a couple of years ago, we passed the point where the entire world is majority urban, you know, compared to small towns and rural areas. You know, I, I think some of this, I mean, just comes from economic growth. I mean, after all, that's one of the oldest trends that comes with early capitalism and industrialization is people leaving the rural areas, partially because they were enclosed and you can't make a traditional living on them anymore, but also partially because, you know, as you have capitalism, growth of investment and employment, Firms historically tend to, yeah, want that like centralized, urbanized experience. But again, of course, companies are moving against that now. Like we have a lot of economic literature on why it is that like American manufacturing, which people think is gone, but it's still like a good 10% of GDP. Uh, it, when the companies make new investments, they go to red states and red parts of the states. You know, you, you build your giant Honda plant in some county in the middle of nowhere in Indiana. And mm -hmm. Boeing, you know, big in my state, is sh shutting down assembly of its uh, big commercial jetliner business and moving it to rural South Carolina, places where not just the laws are more favorable, but also where, like, the population is less unionization sympathetic. So like that trend, I, I guess it's just because of that broader capitalist trend for urbanization that we see that pattern. But then, yeah, like we were saying, when people say we'll have a civil war, like, well, I doubt it. I mean, very soon the rural areas will discover that our blue counties are the ones that pay for their cops and stop signs. And likewise, people in the blue states that are willing to laugh at the idea too will discover like, oh yeah, we grow no food here. We don't have a software design. We got software design. That part is good, but the uh, food is difficult. So when people talk about civil conflicts and stuff, I tend to roll my eyes. I think people don't know the real contours. But, but, but I think what you yeah, talked about sure. there testifies to one of the major inherent contradictions within the Republican Party's platform, right? Which is this support for this very nostalgic vision of a rural America that's centered around guns, Jesus, and flag, right? Uh, you know, as against corrupt cities, uh, while also being adamantly pro-capitalist in some way, without recognizing that, of course, uh, the one is the opponent of the other uh, historically and has been for a long time, right? I mean, as we gradually move towards a knowledge economy and we become an increasingly urbanized, globalized society, the kind of socially conservative values that a lot of people want to hold though uh, in these localized communities are going to be more difficult uh, to stabilize, uh, specifically in like what ge uh, like a geopolitical area. And I don't think that the political party has ever actually dealt with this in any sustained way. Uh, and a lot of the efforts of Trumpism seem to me to be just an chance and a really long and very shrill um, attempt to deflect blame uh, from the impact of globalization and the impact of urbanization on social conservative values uh, onto enemies uh, who are a much easier substitute and a much easier locus uh, to blame all your problems on rather than actually dealing with the big structural issues underpinning global capitalism in the 21st century, right? Yeah, well, yeah, I, I, I would definitely agree with that. Yeah, and it is impressive how they're able to do that, you know. It is, like, yeah. I mean, People were saying earlier, and I mean, you guys were referring to this, like one of those reasons that people yeah, in Michigan and Wisconsin in 2016 were leaving their ballot top blank, which is a terrible thing to think of considering what happened. But it's because, I mean, Clinton and Obama himself were just pushing, we're going to have more free trade deals. You're going to shut up and like it. Like Obama was pushing for the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which no one even remembers anymore. But that was you know, a bigger NAFTA for the whole Pacific Rim excluding China, because you got to exclude China. That's, I mean, that's, you could make a sturdy case with these tiny ass margins that Trump won by, as, as Ben was saying, in those Midwestern Great Lakes states. You could make a good case that part of that is because Clinton and Obama, like in 2016, like in the election year, they didn't even have the political savvy to get it wrapped up in the previous year so they could get people to forget about it. But it's, it is crazy because, I mean, these, repu these rural areas are now tilting Republican. The Republicans were the original party that was pushing for you know, more globalized trade and we should knock down your trade unions and your industrial uh, employment base that's been the backbone of your economy. We'll destroy Detroit from all the capital flight that happens from taking the leash off companies and letting them outsource more. It's incredible how much uh, the party's been able to hide from their legacy, from that all the way down to making it easier for companies to then let the kids of these out-of-work factory workers to get horrifyingly addicted to the most addictive substances 
we've been able to create in the world of opioids. Like most of that shit is the Democrats trying to move into the Republican pro-business space. And then, you know, an idiot like Trump can make everyone forget it. It's kind of, it is amazing to me. I don't know how they do that either, man. Yeah. I like, uh, by the way, uh, thank you 3DQW for the uh, super sticker. Miss that was good. Uh, getting coffee. Um, and, um, oh, somebody asked in the chat, um, uh, nationalized LASIK surgery, of course. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, I mean, I wouldn't get it, you know, as the, I, I think that the, um, uh, <coughs> you know, I think that the glasses provide just the right, you know, quiet intellectual touch to offset these rugged good looks. But, uh, I, I can, I can see, you know, if you do want it, we should have an American NHS and it should provide it. Uh, but, um. But yeah, I, I did want to get back to uh, to, to something before we uh, do the change into the guard and bring on Bessner and Griscom uh, for the second uh, hour. Um, I do want to get back to Matt's point that he made earlier, which I think is a really important one about uh, the um, importance of, uh, of of rebuilding a labor movement. You know, again, I, I don't think Biden is going to do much of anything to, to assist that. I think that, it, I mean, I think all it does is just like put off like the worst things that like Republican uh, administrations will do to try to destroy it. But that's, that's just hitting the sleep button on the alarm. Uh, you know, you, you do have to do something organically within it to, you know, change its direction. Uh, I think maybe massive sit down strikes. Uh, but, um, but I think that, uh, but you do need to do that, right. In order to have a successful, um, successful socialist movement. Uh, like, you know, I, I hate to say it, but, you know, we're never going to have a, um, even electorally, never mind substantively successful left in the United States if it's bases people like us. Uh, it's uh, it's going to have to, uh, it's, it's going to have to be a revitalized. Special trio, right? Yeah, yeah, a revitalized and, and more militant uh, labor union at the, uh, at the grassroots, uh, both because I think, you know, certainly historically, there's an abundance of evidence that successful labor and socialist parties tend to be based on that. And also, um, also because even when you do have, um, even when you do have, uh, like elected officials who have some preference, you know, for even, even the kind of like, uh, effective social democratic reforms, you know, that we'd all like, uh, it doesn't matter very much if uh, if they don't have some sort of strategy for overcoming the inevitable resistance to those reforms yeah. uh, from from capital, and and it's very hard to see what that could be uh, without without having you know I guess I'll just put on my commie hat here you know with a, probably a a uh, probably a, a, a fur fur hat with a faded red star on it you know but it's it's very hard to see what that would be if it's not a, uh, an organized working class. I think that's the only thing that could, that really could um, overcome that kind of resistance uh, realistically. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> um, you know, I, I mean, I, it, it's especially like, I think that you can get, I, I guess I'll just say this much. I'd really recommend everybody read. Uh, there's a really good article by, uh, uh, by Matt Carp uh, several months ago, called uh, "Is This the Future?" You know, future that liberals want. Um, where, where he had this phrase, the um, uh, Patagonian road to socialism, where he's kind of making fun of the idea that you could have that these like largely suburbanite like Warren voters could be the effective base uh, for for a revitalized left, and and that's exactly why it's like um, the point that um, uh, the point that. Um, that that Crystal Ball makes when she's talking about Virginia, you know, it's been run by Democrats for a long time, and I think a lot of like these Democratic voters in uh, in like the D.C. suburbs would totally say if you pulled them on on uh, economic issues, they, they'd have a lot of the responses you'd want them to have. Uh, that you know, that sure they'd like a higher minimum wage, whatever, but they're never going to prioritize those issues in any meaningful way. You know, that that's that's never going to be a high priority thing for them. Um, I mean, I, I think that you, in order to achieve that stuff, you have to have an energized, mobilized base of uh, of the people whose whose interests are most directly and urgently served by that. And and I guess the last point about this, and then I'll, you know, I'll turn it over to Matt and Rob for final thoughts before the change in the guard. Is that uh, this isn't a, um, you know, sometimes people, you know, sort of see this fixation, you know, on on labor and say, oh, it's you being like a class reductionist. It's like, no, I'm really not. Um, 
I think that any kind of effective social movement, I think, is going to be served by that. I mean, look at the civil rights movement. Uh, that that's um, you know the 1964 uh, march for jobs and freedom. Uh, you know the the jobs and has been disappeared from our collective memory of that. Uh, the um, uh, as uh, as the great Harvey K has pointed out, you know, like the uh, uh, a lot of like the way that all those people got to Washington DC was that the uh, UAW paid for their buses. I mean, like this, this is just, you, you have to have some kind of, of, uh, of counterweight at the basis of society to the power of the people who don't want you where you want it. You're just not going to get anywhere. That's Absolutely. great, man. Yeah. yeah. I think that's really thoughtful. And I have to say too, like that really does cut to the issue because when you talk to, you know, your, your liberal friends and stuff, the first thing they say when you bring up yeah, Medicare for all or, you know, a new voting rights act, which we need, or let alone the Green New Deal, they say, oh, how are you going to get it through the Senate? I'm smarter than you. They're like, like, oh, yeah, holy shit, you're right. Senators don't like it. I guess that's why we, we don't have Social Security. A bunch of senators <laughs> didn't want that shit. Or the Medicare itself, like existing Medicare, that shit happened because, like, I just love this story because these idiots think they're being sophisticated because they're like, well, look at where the chess pieces are in government. <laughs> so it's impossible that these things happened because there was you know, like a liberal wing of the Democrats pushing for it. But the, the thing that gave it force was you had a mass movement where people are going on uh -huh. general strikes and they're doing the sit down strikes where people just refuse to leave, you know, the factories or these days data centers and hospitals and saying, you know, why don't we just take this over and run it ourselves and have just like straight worker run socialist enterprises. That's the shit that makes even conservative senators poop their pampers and decide that shit, we better give them at least social security or these assholes are going to take over our economy. We'll get socialism like that movement in the streets, just on the boring policy level. Yeah. is totally essential. And then of course you think about what it means for actual standards of living. Like that's how you get, improvements in your workplace and, you know, it raises, and especially in this ridiculous country where your healthcare comes through your in place of employment, which has got to go. I mean, tens of millions of people lost their healthcare during this pandemic. We shouldn't have to make arguments for Medicare for all after that happened, you know, yeah, yeah, uh, but yeah, it's yeah. the labor movement that lets you get all that shit in the first place. So I would just say, you know, I'm on my, uh, I'm on my union's organizing committee and it's hard work to talk to your coworkers, uh, especially if you don't smoke, so you don't have an opportunity just to hang out outside and like talk about why we should get unionized. You still can do it. You can make teams of your funniest and hottest members and send them around to talk to the membership. There's ways you can do it. So people should be thinking, yeah, about what they can do for, with uh, the labor movement where they are. Absolutely. Yeah, actually, I just wanted to add to that as like my kind of final point. Uh, I understand that a lot of people have a lot of trepidation uh, about voting for Joe Biden, right? Uh, and I completely understand that, right? Um, I feel about as enthusiastic about him as I do about eating a bowl of rice, right? Uh, but I think that the important thing uh, about voting for Biden is exactly what Noam Chomsky said uh, and exactly what you were pointing out, Rob, and you, Ben, right? Which is that he'll give us a bit of a stay to try to rebuild the institutions that actually matter when it comes to long-term politics. Because in the 1950s and in the 1960s, when labor unions were strong uh, and other left-wing institutions had genuine force in uh, the community, we were able to get things done. Uh, and since then, we've seen this intense neoliberal pushback uh, against any number of democratic civil society groups, workers groups, you name it. Uh, not just in the United States, but across the globe. Uh, and rebuilding those is gonna be hard. Uh, it's not about four years or even 10 years. I think this will probably take decades, uh, but we need the window uh, to try to start doing that, right? And yeah. all this end with what Chomsky said, right? Uh, real politics doesn't end when you vote, uh, it begins. Uh, and I think that if we get a window of opportunity to try to push forward, some real reform on this uh, basis, then we might actually see more surprising result in the years to come. Yeah, absolutely. Matt, how many uh, how many Canadians lost their health insurance because of the pandemic? Zero. Yeah, well, all right. Something to think about. All right, thanks, guys. Really appreciate it. Yeah, good to see you, man. Peace. Our pleasure, dude. Yeah. Thank you. Whoa. Hey. Hello. Here we go. We are on. Yeah, for hour two, uh, it is uh, the uh, the great um, Daniel Bessner, uh, the uh, um, senior uh, senior foreign policy uh, correspondent uh, for uh, GTAA, 
Uh, and you know, the dog who's who's biting me very intensely throughout all of this. So oh, well, it's nice to see that the dog's doing well after the uh, <laughs> anti-fungal stream yesterday. So it's been a, another whirlwind. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, and of course, uh, David Griskin, who I, needs no introduction here, uh, is here. So uh, I was drink, actually drinking coffee earlier, but as a presentation. <laughs> Uh, like, uh, there we go. Very uh, nice. So I do have scotch in the house right now, but figure I should be drinking American whiskey for the election coverage. <laughs> Standing strong. What's the what separates whiskey from bourbon again? Like bourbon oh, is oh, bur bourbon is a kind of whiskey. Uh, right. Yeah, uh, that's what yeah. It's made yeah. in Kentucky. That's what it is, right? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a distinctive style, but yeah, it's it's also it's also made in Kentucky. It's one of those things like like um, it's like wine, you know, yeah, it's like yeah. champagne's only made in champ. Yeah, and exactly. Yeah. Champagne yeah. region of France. Does it have any like Texas drink? Sorry, does Texas not have a drink, David? Right. Like, there is Texas whiskey. They got they got tequila, and there's Texas uh, whiskey too now. Tequila, uh, yeah. but tequila is definitely tequila and beer, man. Um, but no, Texas actually has some pretty good like whiskey distill distilleries. Uh, Balcones is really good if you ever get your hands on it. I was very skeptical, honestly. I think that I'm a very traditionalist. Actually, I'm not very radical when it comes to spirits. I think like there's some people who've been doing it right for a long time, and let's let them keep doing it. Like we don't need a million people to get startups and you know try to reimagine yeah, booze. Thing, in the last like 10, 15 years, like startup liquor brand. It's like, <laughs> yeah. it's like a thing now. But but Balcones is actually really good. So, I mean, I, just because everyone would expect me to love any kind of Texas whiskey, but it's actually, it's very good. It's worth it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fair enough. So, I guess we're getting close to... Uh, so there's an election. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, my understanding is that there's some sort of election right now. I, I don't really know what for. You I know. thought Jay Flores had such a good tweet. He's like, I'm looking forward to voting tomorrow. <laughs> That's what I tweet I, actually, my favorite um, uh, my favorite uh, troll tweet I've seen a few people do uh, was, uh, okay, I'm going to reassure my liberal friends that I'm finally ready for her. I'm writing in Hillary Clinton. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good tweet. Yeah. I'm still with her. Still with her. Yep. Don't believe her. <laughs> I'm still with her now. <laughs> Absolutely. It's been uh, pretty quiet, though, man. You know, a lot of people were worried about a lot of big disruptions or, you know, that there would be a lot of incidents. I mean, you know, don't want to speak too soon. But right. uh, so far, it seems like, you know, pretty not smooth because our elections are never smooth. But, you know, at least no huge hiccups for people. Um, I've got my Antifa emergency bag ready to go when there's <laughs> in LA. I'll be out here in a second. <laughs> go to Simi Valley. The only, my <laughs> the only thing I was worried about was them trying to throw away all these votes in Harris County, mm -hmm. um, which didn't end up happening, which is good. But it should be noted that they did shut down all of the uh, drive through locations except for one. Uh, as a result of the lawsuit. So it still had an effect, but uh, at least people who voted didn't get their votes thrown out, you know, the day of the election uh, with no way to check. So yeah, it basically seems like Biden's going to win unless there's like pretty extreme voter suppression, right? That seems to be the general take right now. Probably. I mean, does, does anybody uh, like, do we know anything about Pennsylvania right now? Uh, I think that's the big X factor was at least considered as of a couple of days ago to be potentially the big X factor. I haven't seen anything come out of it yet in the sense of, uh, you know, exit polls or anything that would give us a sense of the sway. All I know is that that's going to be a disaster. And it's going to take a really long time for those votes to be counted. And that's going to, I think that's the biggest problem that we're going to see is just like a really slow counting of votes and uh, a lot of nonsense um, from Donald Trump as a result of that. But I haven't seen much coming out of Pennsylvania that, you know, is sort of pointing one way or the other. Yeah. yeah. I guess the uh, Pittsburgh newspaper endorsed Trump. Yeah, yeah. the P Pittsburgh Gazette. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, but yeah, no, I haven't been, I haven't seen much either. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, I actually used to live in uh, in Pittsburgh for uh, whew, about a year and a half. Um, so, uh, so I did. Uh, so Rick Santorum was my senator. Uh, briefly, <laughs> insert whatever kind of joke. Guy, funny guy. <laughs> <laughs> he's he's smiling on CNN right now. Yeah, he has a lot. Of fun. Yeah, I'm glad he's rich. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad he made it. I'm glad um, he made it. Of all the people. <laughs> yeah, is he? Um, is he still a, a Trump guy, or is uh, or or has he been like made three mildly critical comments and been anointed as a hero of the resistance? Oh boy, I can't, I can't. Yeah, that's the one thing that I, I I'm lucky that I don't have to do majority report stuff. Is that I really just don't have to keep up with like what's going on at CNN or MSNBC. <laughs> just, um, but dude, I'm telling you, like we'll see what happens. I don't think uh, that. Texas is going to to flip like a lot of people are really excited about, but it's looking really good there for our, our progressive candidates who are running for Congress. So something I was seeing, I was talking about this earlier on the TMBS stream, uh, 1.8 million new voters are voting for the first time in Texas. That's huge. Who are they? I mean, you know, primarily younger voters, uh, you know, it's just like uh, it's primarily younger voters who just for the most part, you know, weren't voting before because they felt like everything was sort of set in stone. And the exciting thing is that, at least for me, is I feel like we're going to see a huge opportunity, especially in Texas 10 with Mike Siegel, which has been a really exciting race. Um, so I've been trying to boost a lot. Um, I think he might be able to pull it through just because so many people are showing up um, and be able to flip a district, you know, a red district uh, blue, which would be huge. And then hopefully win the state legislature, which would also be massive well winning the state legislature would would be really good the lower house i should be you know clear okay. about by the way because the senate is not really in play okay i was just i was just thinking because um i know that the uh the congressional districts there are like hilariously gerrymandered <laughs> yeah man. no they're nightmarish so i mean like that'd be huge uh the the courts have a big say politically and traditionally in like how those get drawn up and those are pretty right wing um, in general, but uh, basically what would happen there is you would at least have like a significant force that could push back against how, like, I mean, because they're egregious, the the district, especially, you know, the congressional districts in Texas are, honestly, they're hilarious to look at because you have like these little sliver, slivers, like where I'm from in Austin, you can literally like walk across like my congressional district, you know, like that's how small it is. And it's just like a little line through Austin that goes all the way uh, down south for miles and miles and miles. Um but anyways, like those being redrawn, I think would be huge uh, down the line too, uh, and it's looking it's looking pretty pretty good. And uh, you know, the Republicans in that state aren't, state aren't really doing themselves any favors uh, with their just constant idiocy. So I don't know. Like, there's some things to be like because I think we're all probably on the same page about Joe Biden. Love him. <laughs> awesome. Just be happier that he's a candidate and he's a great guy, you know. Another great guy, <laughs> another Pennsylvanian great guy. Yeah, yeah. I need something. I need something to be excited about, and that's the one thing that I've been, you know, sort of trying to pay attention to and get. You know, I'm looking forward to seeing what happens there. Yeah, I'm. um Yeah, no. Like actually, I, I guess I mentioned this before. I really probably should keep this to myself to preserve the magic. But the uh, but I have a but I wrote an article for for Jacobin that um, uh, I, that I'll be fascinated to see if they're able to run or not. Uh, since uh, since it assumes it assumes that Biden won and and it's and it's being called you know uh, tonight. Um, Oh, I guess maybe we could run some version of it if it's if uh, if it takes a week and then it's called for him. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> um, and uh, and did a uh, a video with Kale on the same thing. But you know, but I mean, but the the point of both the article and, and the video are, um, hey, it's uh, it's good, uh, you know, in the future, right? It's good that Trump lost, uh, but. Um, but you, but you can't give Biden like even a minute of honey, yeah. uh, like they like you, like it or not, right? You know the le the left is going to be at war with the Biden administration, whether or not we want to be. Uh, so so let's 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 get in it, right? And and uh, um, and and trying to argue that uh, even though when you look at the Biden Harris website, you you do see lots of good stuff on there, right? In the issue in, in the issues page, but like who cares? It doesn't mean anything. Mm -hmm. No, for sure. Uh, so, do you guys think their plan is to run Kamala in four years? 
Like, what's the plan here? That to me is very interesting because, like, obviously the like the people who had governed the Democratic Party in our childhood span before David was born, like, are coming are, are like coming out of power, right? Like, that's clear. There's like this shift. So this is a rear guard action. So I'm just wondering, like, what do you think the medium term plan is? Because I don't think any of them wanted Biden. So this is like very clear, like the old Simpsons line, we are the mediocre presidents, like they're playing. <laughs> you know, like he's very clearly a mediocre guy in a mediocre world. Um, but I'm just, what's interesting to me is like, historian also is sort of like the, the structural shift. Like I guys think their plan is. I mean, I think they might, I think they might run uh, Kamala in, uh, in, in four years. I, I mean, I am, like, like my view, you know, my view is still nothing really has changed this, that um, that Joe Biden, like, is undergoing some kind of cognitive decline. Or I, you know, I yeah, I mean, I think that um, it wasn't as obvious as it would be because COVID let him, like, hide out for the most part, uh, yeah. you know, only give rare public appearances. So they... Uh, so that uh, we only got to see for the most part his moments of lucidity, but during the primary, I think it was very obvious. Uh, and um, you know, it probably would have been a much bigger issue if he had been running against anybody but Donald Trump. Uh, and um, and so I don't know. I I mean, it's possible. You never know. Uh, they could, ju- you know, like it could be that it's it's 2027 and they're still wheeling him out like Mao in the mm-hmm. last you know, years, you know, to, uh, you know, to look at the crowds, you know, but uh, uh, but I, I think I think there's a real good chance that he, he doesn't have two terms in him and maybe not even one one full term. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I mean, is he, has he backed down from his pledge to, uh, you know, to only be a one term president? I don't yeah. So, no. Yeah. I think he, that he's kept to that. I I think that you know um, Kamala. I mean, like, I think one thing and one point that I've been trying to hammer home with people is that you know the Bernie Sanders strategy for you know the future of even like the Democratic Party and of politics was like to expand the electorate like dramatically, and I've been you know pointing out to folks you know even like you look at a state like New York State, you have to understand that the Democratic Party actually like really likes their managed constituency. They don't really have the intention of like they want to win elections, obviously, by like large margins, but they like the people that they have because they can get away with the kind of politics that they've been doing for a really long time. And I think that I I mean, I I agree, um, Daniel, that I think that like uh, that, like they are going to try to push Kamala in 2024 because she's so perfect for them to maintain the same kind of voter that they've had for a long time while saying like, oh, look, this is a young, new, you know, woke intersectional candidate, uh, you know. Who will present a certain way, but obviously, knowing her history, will you know be doing the complete opposite in power. And I think that they're hoping that she can be a kind of bridge where it's like you know you change the style a little bit um, and the rhetoric, and then you can maintain the same kind of politics. I think that she, they think, is a perfect vehicle. I think I would, if I was like a horrible person and was getting paid by them to give them advice, I would tell them they should look at the fact that you know. Kamala didn't really do that well. <laughs> so popular. This is the whole thing. Is what's yeah, the like, thing. I mean, she's not a very good politician with a very bad record for the things that matter to the Democratic base. It's just so strange. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But, I mean, I there's a reason that Biden, like, despite the cognitive decline, despite all the obvious negatives, that Biden was the nominee and, and Hinton Harris wasn't. Uh, because basically, I mean, and yeah, I remember. Um, I remember Michael called this very early on that it was going to be either Bernie or Biden, mm-hmm. uh, and um, and that's uh, and I think the I think the basic like structural reason for that is because Biden, like other than a few like um, joke candidates like Delaney, like uh, Biden was pretty much the only one of the centrists who wasn't pretending. Like mm-hmm. uh, all all the other candidates, uh, you know, all the other all the other centrists, you know, Harris, Buttigieg, I would include Elizabeth Warren, uh, were all um, were all trying to have it both ways and and to uh, appeal to some extent to uh, to the 2016 Bernie movement or take on some of those promises, 
And what that meant was that they all did these weird flip flops uh, because they were they they were trying to pick a lane, right? You know, it's like, yeah. okay, can I position myself as kind of like Bernie but not as threatening? Okay, that doesn't seem to be working. I better like do a big pivot. So. Uh, and then I have to have some weird explanation of my pivot. Well, I still want Medicare for all. Who want it? Right? See, yeah, <laughs> Medicare for all. Uh, and uh, and of course that like registers as incredibly fake, uh, and uh, and and it's just super unappealing to voters. And whereas like I think Biden just openly saying that he was the same old Biden as ever. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's like, uh, what, you know, what you see is what you get. You know, you'll, uh, I'll just, I'll just run as a centrist, you know, if, if I get it. Um, I think, I think meant, um, I, I mean, he wouldn't have been, he wouldn't have been nominated if not for that like crazy last minute consolidation. But, uh, but I think that it, it was why he was the last one standing to consolidate behind. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think so. A hundred percent. I think that there's like, I mean, it's it's really funny because there is just such a, a difference in like the Democratic Party, like primary voter and like the Hamilton loving like commentariat and like the people who like are really trying to push the Warrens and the Buttigieg's and the Kamala. I mean, I think their hope is that with Kamala that they can use her as a shield to prevent any kind of like, you know, the kind of mainstream uh, not really like class-based or even material analysis of like the problems with the Democratic Party primary that is run by, you know, old white people or specifically, you know, old white men, um, that they can sort of have her become familiar enough face that she can sort of like ease into that role. I think that that definitely is something that's looking likely. But luckily, I mean, the, the lucky thing is, is that there are actually like authentic and unique uh, voices like in the you know, the progressive wing of the Democratic Party, you know, the squad. And obviously, I think this new class of people that it's going to really challenge that. That uh, This is my question. Who will challenge Kamala? Because there, if, if I do think they will run for one term. I think it'll be very weak. Um, I think the government's basically going to run on his appointees, which has happened kind of late Reagan. It's happened mm -hmm. several times in, in American history where it's basically like a decentralized process. And that'll be So who goes up against Kamala? Like AOC is too young. Uh, Ilhan, I don't think that would be a tough sell. Tlaib also. I don't Il Ilhan was born in the United States, right? Wasn't she born in Somalia? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Right. Good point. Uh, AOC, I think, might actually turn thirty-five in four years. So if, I believe she might. Uh, she might be old enough. I'm not a hundred. I wouldn't. I wouldn't recommend that. No, just saying. No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't recommend it either. I'm just saying that she might be old enough, but I, I don't think she'd be. But this is kind of the problem with the question Danny's raising because um, because the bench is super weak right now. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> like uh, like I I like you know I like AOC. I'm a defender of AOC, but like I don't think that she could play the sort of role that Bernie played nationally like effectively like not yet have anything like the approval numbers for it and and i think just in general i think that um i mean this is tricky but i do believe i mean who knows maybe i'm just you know maybe i'm just too much of an old man here but like i do believe that uh part of bernie's appeal was that even though he had all the correct progressive positions on social issues he presented it in a way that appealed to a much broader group of people. Whereas I think AOC speaks a certain kind of like woke intersectional language that's largely for the choir. Mm. That's true, but AOC to me seems like a talented, ambitious person. And I think she will be able to make that switch, basically. Uh, I mean, like, I don't think she's doing all this like Zoom shit. The shit that basically like the, the cool lefties make fun of her for, like basically the normie shit, like that's, I think, smart politically. She's like building a base amongst 20 year olds who are going to love her for 50 years. <laughs> like, really yeah. smart, and they're going to grow with her. It's like what a brand does. Why do we all drink fucking Coke? You know, it's like they, you know, so she's very smart about that. So I think that I agree with, I, if I was, I think, yeah, I think 10, 15 years, she could run for president, I think, in her early 40s. I think with mm -hmm. like half a term as a New York senator or something along those lines. Or maybe Schumer will actually appoint her now if Gillibrand gets, you know, a cabinet position. There's interesting stuff about, does she make the leap now? 
I don't know. Uh, that would be a tough situation. But 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 besides the squad, I literally uh, can't think of anyone who could challenge Kamal. No, I mean, well, I don't know. I mean, I don't want to be a, a doom or anything like that. But I think that we're just going to have to learn. And it's, I honestly, I think it's probably for the best uh, that we might be sitting out a couple Democratic Party presidential races. Like, I mean, that is like the Democratic Socialist left for a little bit of time. And that probably is good because we really should be focusing on that bench, you know, that you're talking about. I mean, so much of this movement has been so fixated on getting Bernie Sanders elected um, that I think that sometimes people miss like where we are at today, which is a much stronger position than we were in 2015 when we were trying to get this obscure Senator from Vermont to run for president. Um, so it's the gold know, analogy, basically like Bernie was our 64. You know, yeah. the 1954, when Goldwater lost, uh, got killed by Johnson. Uh, but this was like, Newt Gingrich, Mitt Romney, like the people who basically did the 90s Republican Revolution um, and set the stage as young people for Reagan uh, were politicized by that. And I think that's probably, that's the closest thing. Um, mm. Pretty grim if we do have like kind of time sensitive crises, <laughs> uh, like inequality and climate, right? That's the difference. Well, but uh, like the point um, I would just say, and I hope this doesn't sound too like hopeful, um, <laughs> but like, you know, the fact is, is that the nature of, of races, congressional races, you know, having the opportunity to run people for house every two years, if you are talking about an immediate problem, that actually mm -hmm. might be the most beneficial strategy going forward because we can win those races. All those races aren't won by that much. If we can continue our momentum fixating on like trying to win the house and like really start to change American politics in the sense that like we start to actually also make the argument that we should start redirecting power and prestige to the most responsive part of our democracy to the house. I mean, I agree, like it's time sensitive. So I'm, you know, I'm thinking strategically on, on my feet on these things. Um, I just think like if we fixate on trying to get, you know, I mean, think about what we were doing in earlier this year. We were trying to figure out what the hell we were going to do when Bernie Sanders became president, right? Um, because it was going to be a nightmare for him to be able to put through his, his, his plans, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, I actually had thoughts uh, like around like, uh, you know, January or February, uh, you know, I, I was working, you know, still working on on my uh, my book, you know, which which uh, which Danny read his blurb on it. Uh, we, and in, uh, of course, it's a it's a book uh, critiquing the left. And there were there were points around there where I thought, what the, hell, what the hell am I doing? Right. Like like mm -hmm. by by the time this book comes out. Uh, there's a good chance that Bernie Sanders is the president. Like, uh, you know, like DSA has like half a million members, you know, like, like that, that and, and, you know, maybe the underlying problems haven't gone anywhere, but this is just going to seem like, why, why is he fixating on this? Like, you know, stupid stuff, you know, that's, yeah. that's like not really relevant right now. And man, I did not need to worry about that. Uh, <laughs> like, um, I, I also read your book. I know you didn't frame it this way, but it's also yeah. a critique of youth culture. Which is actually like this is why I think it's it's it'll be interesting beyond the left because this is I think how I mean as a college professor as you you teach as well I mean young students should just operate in a different sort of moral and ethical universe uh, and I think in some sense you were critiquing like that sort of you know function of hyper surveilled culture that is a natural consequence of growing up in the world that Zoomers did but I think it's like it's pretty interesting beyond the left. I think so. I mean, I think there are important class differences that that do uh, that do uh, intersect with that. You know, as as far as how people process those uh, technological and cultural changes, I, th I think it's most. Um, I think it's a kind of youth culture that's that's most particularly an elite youth culture. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, but yeah, no, I, I think I think that's also right. Uh, by the way, not that it matters because I don't think that if she was eventually a viable candidate. Uh, I don't think it would be in 2024, but uh, just for the hell of it, since there was some speculation on it earlier, I looked it up. AOC turns 35 in on October 13th, uh, 2024. So, so she would be just barely old enough. Wow. Uh, be but, like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I don't. Again, I, I don't think it would happen. I, I, I'd be. I, I'd love to be wrong, but I, I don't think that AOC would win a Democratic presidential primary. And and yeah, like like David says, it's hard to know who would if not like yeah. uh, you know like I guess technically you know 
I guess, uh, I guess like Rashida Tlaib or somebody, but like, I, I think that feels like a stretch to me. I don't, I don't think so. Right. I, I think that, um, I think that it's entirely possible that we are sitting out uh, the 2024 Democratic primary, which by the way, I think it's, it's uh, cause sometimes I hear people bring this up uh, during the uh, election. I guess polls don't close. The first polls don't close for about half an hour, but I'm still, uh, you know, I'm still yeah. referring to the election in the past tense uh, that uh, they'd say, Oh, well, you know, if, uh, if Biden wins, you know, we don't get another shot until 2028. And I kind of think, well, we don't really get a shot until 2028 regardless. <laughs> uh, like yeah. if we, if we had somebody good to run in 2024, we could run them against Kamala Harris. You know, like, I don't, I don't think that's the issue. I think it, it, it's just and, birdie and is such a weird fluke. Right, you know that that you're like you just don't have other politicians who could just immediately step into that. I'm sorry, you're saying, David? Oh no, I mean, I I also would say like I I think like historically the Bernie Sanders campaign, what it's done is really important. I'm not downplaying that, but like if we were to do it all again, honestly, I would trade I would trade um, you know a very viable democratic socialist you know new character who comes up in 2024 and loses closely but change you know shifts the dynamic whatever. I would. I would put that to the side if someone would give us 40, you know, seats, you know, 40 like freshman Congress people who are, you know, at least associated with like democratic socialist politics, um, not even necessarily being like AOC, Rashida or Ilhan uh, type character, or at least people who are like ardent Medicare for all supporters. Like, I just, I don't know. I just like, for me, I, I think that the fixation on the presidency uh, that we've now like become used to with our movement, I think it's not going to be a very healthy thing for us strategizing in the future. Yeah, it was a Hail Mary pass. I mean, yeah. I, I think what, uh, which it, and there would have been a lot of problems and blah, 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 and it'll be interesting to debate historically, but it was absolutely um, a, Hail Mary, uh, a Hail Mary pass. And then, then the question becomes, I think, David, as you're gesturing toward is what do you do? Uh, and so I think you build a bench in Congress and you build institutions. And then the question is what types of institutions and I haven't fully worked that. I mean, in my area, it's easy, right? Foreign policy. There's such an obvious mm -hmm. go, you know, like uh, think tank. You know, the, the, the American state decided to like kind of privatize itself, and mm -hmm. now you're one of those. Uh, and so, but in other realms of politics, I don't know what what you do. You know, it's not like you, back in the day when you had like union organizing workshops for everyone who was associated with the movement or bowling clubs or beer halls and blah, blah, blah. You have that with DSA kind of, but mm. I, really, you know, to get, you know, a little academic about it, how do you build the sociability upon which political movements rest? One of the reasons Trump had this movement is because it was a fun party. Even if right. you, that, you know, like it's fun. Like it's like kind of counterculture in a way. So I was just wondering, like, how do we do that on the left in a in a meaningful way? I think it's kind of important. Yeah. Uh, by by the way, your talk of of Trump uh, uh, being uh, uh, being kind of a fun party. Um, uh, I just saw. I don't know if you guys know uh, Ryan Zickgraf. Um, I think he he used to primarily write things as Ryan Smith, but then I think he, he, he just decided to run with the ethnic last name. So, uh, so, so, uh, which is his actual name, Ryan. Um, and um, he, uh, uh, he has an article that just came out called the bitter irony of Trump's YMCA dance uh, about uh, the fact that, of, you know, of course, Trump has been doing all this, like dancing the YMCA rallies that, uh, Trump's role in New York real estate in the eighties and nineties is a big reason there aren't YMCA's there anymore, uh, which is which is just kind of a uh, you know or hardly any right you know which is uh, which is just kind of a fun note but um, but yeah uh, so so I do I do want to get back to uh, to the issue uh, that uh, the Dan just raised about uh, about alternative institutions uh, and yeah foreign policy think tanks although I mean also um, that's a you know, like that's an obvious thing, but certainly not a thing we've done yet. Uh, mm -hmm. there's, the, there's, there's the Quincy, you know, which is a anti-interventionist thing, but that's like a, that's, that's cer certainly not a socialist, uh, thing. And, um, you know, their socialists are involved in it, but I mean, that's, it's, it's not, you know, but it's a, but they're libertarians, you know, who, who are involved in it. And, uh, I'm not saying that's not a good and necessary thing, but I think if you actually want to think about what a socialist foreign policy 
uh, would, would do. I think it's a thing that goes well beyond that. Uh, but out, outside of that, uh, that larger issue is really important. I mean, I, and I mean, I think, uh, I think it gets down. I think part of the answer gets gets back to the hobby horse uh, that we were on just before we uh, changed shifts uh, mm -hmm. from uh, from Matt and um, uh, Rob uh, about uh, rebuilding the labor movement, which you know I, I suppose on the list of things that are easier said than done, you know, it's got to be somewhere near the top. <sighs> Yeah, I mean, I don't know, like when it comes to like, you know, training and building, you know, new centers of, of thought and, of, and influence think tank wise and having people of influence in D.C., I have some opinions to that. But I think that, you know, Daniel definitely thinks about this and, and writes about this a, a lot more. I would just like I would say we should start looking at what's working. And uh, for people who watch my show, um, uh, you know, we'll know, like, especially the past couple of weeks, I've been doing a lot of, uh, I've been trying to really focus on what's happening in Austin, Texas. Um, because what you're seeing there is actually really encouraging. And uh, not only are there these big races that are coming through there, uh, for Congress, I was talking about earlier, um, you know, it's the first major city to, you know, get a significant defunding of the police. Um, you know, they have a radical, you know, they might not like me calling them a radical, but somebody who I think is very friendly and, and wonderful and good on their city council um, in, in the city. And it's been able to do that through the DSA, but also through a significant um, outgrowth of community organizations, specifically organizations too, um, you know, that are organizing, uh, you know, immigrant labor, uh, you know, undocumented communities in, in, the, in the city, right? Which is really important, um, especially, I mean, across the country, but also especially in a state like Texas. And, you know, I think that looking at those models um, has been, you know, it's something that we can do where it's like you have these moments of convergence, right? Which is like when you get everybody to come together for these political campaigns um, and then also, you know, for things like, you know, defund the police and things like that. Um, but they're also really relying on communities to start to self-organize um, and to basically try to build the platform. So instead of like having to build a new constituency every time an event, you know, something comes up you actually already are having those political communities out there that, okay, I know who to call. I know who, how, how to reach like this community of voters, this community of people. I think, you know, obviously that's not, you know, a perfect blueprint or anything like that, but I think that's the way that we need to start thinking about you know what, politics. You know what I always think about and like, you know, it's election day. So let's just go with this thought. Like, how do you think things like virtual space are going to change this? Because one of the biggest problems of the last 50 years in terms of labor organizing historically is the destruction of the literal workplace, mm -hmm. the place where people form relationships that allow them to put themselves on the line for other people, such as their coworkers. So there, and you see that like the gig economy, the present political economy of the United States, organized around working shifts at jobs where you basically don't have any coworkers, is I think you know part of the reason why it's been so difficult solidarity but virtual spaces even things like twitch and think you know forums like that are really interesting when you're thinking about like the theory of organization so i think like the left out of power especially which we're going to be needs to start thinking creatively about things like that particularly given that it's such a youth movement mm -hmm. no i mean i think that's 100 percent true i mean you know it's, it's a benefit and a curse because it's really great because you can reach a lot of people you can reach people on their own timelines too i think that that's something really important as like for so many people who are working kind of like typical wage jobs the nine to five uh, which was an impressive formulation from the get-go you know for a lot of people almost feels like the ideal you yeah. know in the sense that like you know they're no longer working that anymore people work saturday so you know like they don't have that kind of set schedule so you know virtual organizing is a huge opportunity um but obviously it's, it's uh, you know, there's massive downsides. I think one of the worst ones for the left um, is just how imaginary it is. And I mean, in the sense of like how you can self-style yourself as like Lenin, uh, you know what I mean? Like in a chat room and, yeah. and you, you could just never do something like that. I mean, you, I guess you could, but you'd be laughed out of the room, right? Um, but there's just a lot more space for nonsense, honestly, uh, that I yeah. think can hurt an escapism and you know that's what these form formats are like designed to do is to be escapist you know so it's a, you know it's good and bad um I, i'll tell you like the the union question it's it's honestly it is funny how much we talk about this you read jacobin you watch shows like this that's what everyone talks about we need to rebuild the labor movement but uh 
you know, doing it, it's a lot yeah, harder. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and there are like generations of debates about which strategy and tactic and blah, blah, blah. And that's for a world that no longer even exists. <laughs> yeah. But, shout but out to nobody, my friend, uh, Sean Richmond, uh, who wrote a book for Haymarket called uh, Tell the Bosses That Were Coming. Uh, that at least uh, tries to um, to grapple uh, with some of this stuff, um, you know, in a way. I mean, obviously, I'm not immersed like like he is in in the literature on this that that Daniel was referring to, but um, but you know, certainly tries to grapple more than other things I've read uh, with um, with with what that could look like and how uh, what we sort of see as the way that unions have to work because that's what we're used to because this formula you know, because of these um uh arrangements that go back to the wagner act uh in mm. uh, in the 30s uh how that could potentially be rethought like both in terms of the uh the reforms that we would want if we're actually in position where you write labor law but also the here and now uh how uh how unions could try to interact differently with the existing format of of labor law like um like actually just going for doing things like like minority unionism uh, that uh, that you don't have to um, you know that you can um, you know that you can just say like yeah I'm just here legally representing the actual members uh, of of the union and I don't know I'm certainly not confident what the answers are to those questions but I think that certainly what is clear to me is that if we just keep on uh, doing um, you know, if we just keep on doing what we uh, what we have been doing, and just like there's this, there's a kind of volunteerism that you get uh, in a lot of both within the union movement itself. Uh, I was on the executive board of my um, uh, adjuncts union at Rutgers, you know, for for years, uh, and, and I saw some of this um, in discussions I was privy to there, and certainly on the left, there's this kind of volunteerism that like you just need to like want it bad enough that like you just that like all of it like. That the, like that the reason that everything's in a deep state of decline is that we're just like not putting quite enough effort into organizing. And uh, as a Jew, I find that very far. I think I already did too much. Uh, <laughs> I think it's related to like these deep cultures, which, as an American historian, is interesting. It's different from Europe, right? There's different cultural things that really inform unionization efforts that I just find. Um, very compelling. I mean, I experienced it with my own, you know, difficulties of, with my scholarly association and with my university union, like the union was voted down at UW and the scholarly association probably legally correctly says you can't act as a union. So mm. a lot of like practical issues um, that I just think are interesting and need to be worked I I would just, you know, add to that. I mean, I think what's really been frustrating too, especially I think more in like white collar workplaces. Um, but it has been like, you know, the like the rise of like the task force or like, you know, like the pe you know, the like whatever term you use for, it, right? You know, it's just basically like, you know, an employee group, right? And you just go sit yeah. there and you talk about your issues and you can talk to management, but there's no obviously, you know, radical potential there because it's all just about like, okay, you said your piece great, you know, now uh, we're not giving you raises this year and uh, you know, like that kind of <laughs> situation, which is, you know, which is a huge problem. But like, we have to understand that like capitalism is shifting, you know, one with like recategorization of workers as more, especially like low wage workers are independent contractors. And also the fact that like the way that we're producing in this system in the United States has also changed dramatically where people aren't staying in the workplace, you know, their typical job for like, you know, they don't see those like, okay, this is my place for the rest of my life. Right. They're like, OK, this is a job I have for four to five years. And like that trans, you know, transition is, you know, a big problem. And I, I say this because um, I just want people to start thinking creatively. And like one example that I've been talking about a lot since uh, Bernie dropped out was looking back to the actual existing American populist movement, which was very much, um, you know, a part and, and, you know, a precursor to the growing American union movement. But like, you just have to think about like what, what it was like for these farmers um, who were feeling that they were struggling with the merchants and, you know, the buying class in this country. And what did they do? They created associations and they came up with all these creative ideas that now we think of, right? It's like, oh, of course, that's what you do when you're in a, an association or a proto union or something like that, right? But they created it because they were saying, okay, I'm sitting here. I think there's a problem when I'm buying, you know, machines from the from the merchant. He's overcharging me. Uh, so what if we all got together and pulled our money and started buying our own 
goods for ourselves, right? Like they were able to come up with those solutions because they were one, being very creative, um, and two, we're thinking about like what their direct material needs are. I don't have any answer of like what that would look like today, but I think that that's the way that we need to start thinking is just like the future is just not set. Um, because I don't think it's good for the left to constantly just say like, oh, we have to rebuild the union movement because yes, we do. But it's one of those things that's like you almost just uh, shut your brain off and you just nod. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean? <laughs> and it's also interesting. What's a very interesting thing to me is that one of the ways that at least as I understand it historically is that you know, um, these movements were able to survive is that the United States was composed of like a series of Buffalo, New Yorks or a series of mm -hmm. cities, right? But now the country is basically a series of mega cities. It's kind of like RoboCop or, you know, like, um, what's the other one? Like a demolition man or something. Yeah. Right? The Sun Belt, the Northeast Corridor, the Pacific Northwest, Southern California. And there's like a few you know, through like Austin is probably a note in Texas, right? So, but that that's like a fundamental transformation in how yeah. these are in the world. Like this sort of rise of these massive urban cities that I um, at least don't hear it talked about often on how that would affect like our fundamental political organizing strategy, particularly because it's laid over. Somebody that chat adds Judge Dredd, which is a good addition, but go on, Danny. Yeah, Judge Dredd, that's what it was, Judge Dredd. Mega City One, Mega City <laughs> That was the one I was thinking of. Um, it's That's the original one. Um, but yeah, no, but so I'm just saying like, that's a really interesting political phenomenon, particularly laid over a, a country organized around states that don't reflect that whatsoever. So there's like a lot of issue. We still think in terms of like these atavistic states, like California has 40 million people, but Wisconsin only has 500,000. True. Yeah. So far as it goes, right. But when you're looking about how people actually live, it might be, that's like the out of the box thinking that being out of power allows us to do. It's just mm. different. Yeah, no, absolutely. And and I and I do I do really like David's point, you know, that it's it's a I mean, look, obviously uh we need to rebuild the labor movement is is mm -hmm. just true, right? I mean, there's no there's no path that doesn't involve that. Uh but also <laughs> uh you know, it's it's one of those things it's almost like saying we need to um you know, we need to go beyond capitalism. It's like, <laughs> yeah, we do. <laughs> but you haven't really told me much yet when you say that. Um or, or uh, to go into Daniel's wheelhouse, right? We need to dismantle the empire. Yes, right. But like, <laughs> how, right? Like, what do we, we you know, what does that actually mean? And I think it also connects to uh, David's earlier point about uh, the way that um, online leftism lends itself to uh, to LARPing, right? You know that you can that you can. Uh, it's very easy to be a chat room Lenin, you know that. Um, yeah. Uh, Honestly, it'd be good though if everyone was actually like you know like real dyed in the wool Lenins, but like the point, yeah, the point is the costume. You know? well, well, I would also, I would also suggest that that Lenin, uh, Lenin's own politics were a lot more complicated and nuanced than uh, than you get the impression of from from some of the very online leftists who love the guy. Uh, you know, if if you if you look at his. Um, uh, you know his his relationship for most of his life to uh, to to Kautsky and and the SPD and uh, and and yeah. for that matter, right? Even during the uh, the period when he was he was writing the uh, proletarian revolution and the Radigan Kautsky, right? He was also writing a little pamphlet called uh, "Left Wing Communism and Infantile Disorder" that I think uh, yeah. applies to a lot of the stuff that exactly. we're talking about. Uh, but, um, but the the problem is the problem is broader than like what you think about like Lenin or Kautsky or these other yeah. historical figures, which is that, um, which is that there's this way that a certain kind of radical leftist, uh, a lot of kinds of radical leftists, sort of navigate politics by thinking about which historical figures they like, yeah, and yeah. thinking that we can just like sort of will into existence whatever sort of movement those historical figures spearheaded. <laughs> uh, Rather than doing the much much harder thing, which is thinking about the conditions that you actually exist in and what the possibilities are that are that are created, um, you know, they're created by those those conditions uh, and and what that could possibly mean about how we could, um, you know, we could go forward and build a socialist movement in the United States that could that could um, that could win majority support and and take power and and uh, do all these and you know do all these other yeah. things that, that we that we want to do and actually to, to tie it back into uh, the election as we're getting eight minutes from uh, the first polls closing. Uh, I think that there's even a danger that we are 
like we're doing that same game, right? We sort of pick our favorite historical figure and say, yeah, let's do that again, that we could just end up doing that with the 2002, 16 and 2020 birdie campaigns. Cause it's yeah. the same principle, right? You know, it's like, Oh, Hey, remember back when it seemed like we might have this shortcut. Well, let's just do that again. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a phenomenal point. And I, and I think that like, um, you know, not to, to fixate on it too much, but like, and I, and I, I, I realize I'm literally wearing a Bernie t-shirt. <laughs> Some of this is self-criticism, but go on. You know, there's nothing wrong with like, look, I got a question, um, recently on on tmbs from somebody asking me whether or not i think evo morales is like a socialist right yeah. and i think like the answer to that is obviously like i would say yes right yeah. but like i i was sort of saying like even like don't even think like that like it's right. just so unhelpful to like try to categorize like okay this is like you know what are these movements doing um actually like because what, what i said is like you need to, people need to stop thinking that politics is something that you just proclaim right it's like these tests that people take are so bad i think for our mentality about politics right where it's like oh what do you think about this this that like what sort of environmental policy be blah 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 right don't get me wrong like think 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 all you can about all these issues but this idea that like i'm gonna find this like taxonomy right that like i'm gonna sit and and then i'm gonna walk out in the street and say like i'm an anarcho syndicalist right or something like that and like that means anything um i think is a really unhelpful tendency that a lot of people especially in like like I got into this stuff, like I studied political theory, like don't get me wrong, I'm very interested in all these questions. And I was, when I first decided to be a Marxist, I was very interested in these things too. But like, there is such a fixation with saying like, are you a democratic socialist? Are you a social democrat, blah, blah, blah. And I think that the debates that historically like created those terms are very important. But I think people yeah, constantly trying to apply them to themselves today is very unhelpful. Um, and, you know, just to go back really quickly to the Evo Morales story, it's like, does it matter if Evo Morales is a socialist? What matters is what he's doing with being in power. What matters what is what he's doing with like this political movement, right? Like, you know, these kind of idea that people have like these secret, you know, yeah. political tendencies and like, that's what matters. Like, well, no, what matters is like, are people being fed? Are we fighting capitalism? Are we changing the system of production in that country? Yes. So I would, you know, I would categorize that as being a, a socialist in general, but like, that's what you should be fixating your analysis on instead of trying to be like, okay, you know, you know, what historical character can, you know, take this quiz to find out what historical character I am from the Marxist. Yeah, yeah. Would, would, would you have been, um, would you have been a left SR or a Menshevik or an anarchist in 1917? Yeah. Uh, Facebook will tell you. Uh, yeah, no, no, I, I think, I think that's, I think that's totally right. Um, and, and I think it, it also relate, like, I think there's something that you kind of said in passing and before, before uh, going to, to Daniel, I do, I do want to just kind of underline, which is that, um, Oftentimes people get weirdly fixated on like what some politicians inner thoughts are uh, and, and the, like, it doesn't matter. Right. I mean, what you like at that look, if you're like a private citizen, whatever, sure. You know, your politics, what you think, but like the second you have any kind of like larger role in the world, your politics are what you do. Yeah. You know? Like there's no such thing as private politics. Like it doesn't, it's 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 really irrelevant whether there's some point there's some part of your mind where you like wish that we could do this or that or the other thing. I mean, it's like the thing I remember. You know, we all used to enjoy making fun of during the primary, where like there was like the most annoying kind of online progressive would say, "Well, actually, I'm like well to the left of Bernie Sanders, but uh, I'm pragmatic and I understand we need Pete Buttigieg or whatever. But like really, like I'm actually a anarcho Ho Chi Minist, you know, whatever the fuck, right? It's like, no, you're not, right? You're just a liberal and like you have an act of fancy life. But I'm sorry, you were gonna say, Daniel. Uh, no, just um, what's really interesting to me, um, or raises this issue about both of your guys' comments, and um, particularly building off David's, is that that is in some level though is the sort of language of the age, right? Of self-branding. Yeah. Like, Right? because of the complete alienation caused by capitalism people don't actually have these organic identities so what they do is they like cosplay and harm them uh, online and that's just again you know if we're talking about Gramsci and hegemony how do we make use of that because <laughs> uh, the question is like um, when you have you know I guess not to be a technological determinist but like social media absolutely changes how people interact in the world for yeah people. for sure so then like, and I think one of the functions of that, David, and it reminded me of like early online, like chat room culture, Ben, I don't know if you remember that in AOL, a similar thing, um, but it's just like the latest iteration of that. Uh, and then the question is like, how do you use that 
to one's advantage. And I, I, I guess it's almost funny. I, I see a little bit with Chapo, like people watch Chapo Trap House and then they turn on Chapo Trap House and then they come back to Chapo Trap House. <laughs> 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 which I think is sort of related to how people go through permutations of identity. Yeah, yeah. Sure. yeah like they were all mad when, when, when Chapo had that Daniel Bessner guy on and then they forgot. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, right. Because, because you, because, because like, why do you, care right like it's it's uh you know i mean i mean i'm I'm a chapo fan they're funny and insightful but uh but it's it's also that you're that emotionally invested in what this semi-comedy podcast (laughs) they identify it's like a a team you know it's the same exact thing yeah i I think I think that's a hundred percent it it gets even funnier when people start to do that to other podcasts too that might like have less and less to do with politics, but maybe just yeah. more of a comedy politics, you know, sorry, comedy podcast, like through yeah, and through. Yeah. And I, I'm like, a hometown hey. socialist. Thank you very much. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Your comedy podcast, but people like wanted to at some point identify it with a political. <laughs> very interesting, actually. Like, Oh yeah. It sucks, dude. I mean, like the Pontius thing is one thing. I don't want to go too deep in this rabbit hole, but I think Ben and I have talked about this in the past. Like, like I'm, I'm honestly, I'm just so exhausted uh, with every piece of media, like feeling the need to like proclaim it's like secret politics. Uh, I, I hope I don't piss t- people off too much, but people who know I'm into country music always send me this, you know, these bands or whatever. It's like, look at this political country band. And it just sucks. You know, it'll just be a guy like, you know, with a steel guitar or something, just like shouting <laughs> truisms that like people and like, you know, online left, like believe. And like people are like, this is art. It's like, you know, it's horrible. It's just like a guy just you know, repeating, <laughs> repeating lines. I don't want to hear that. Um, anyways, like, yeah, you know, right, but I think that's a hundred percent, like a very online that, you know, a consequence of, you know, social media. Totally. Um, by, by the way, I, I do want to say uh, before, um, getting ready to, to change the guard in a couple of minutes, but um, that a sign of how bad that stuff is, right? Like, I, I think a question to ask yourself is, okay, would you think this was good music if you did not agree with the slogans <laughs> that they were singing? <laughs> and uh, and a sign of how bad that stuff is, that it's a little easier to see when you disagree with the politics, is that even... Um, somebody who I would really defend uh, as, as a as, as a musician who who I really like, um, I'll, I'll I'll just uh, when they when they do like when they just start singing slogans that that appeal to their political followers, uh, it's unlistenable. Uh, and so, if you want a real treat, this is an election theme treat. Uh, uh, David shared me this with me a while back, and I'm still scarred by it. Uh, check. Oh no! Oh, this is a bad one. Actually, this is a really uh, bad one. <laughs> Um, check out uh, Hank Williams Jr. did a song uh, for the McCain Palin campaign in 2008, and it is exactly as bad as you would think it would be. <laughs> just... he, he redoes he redoes Family Tradition, which is just you know a great song. And if you like country music, like you'll know every concert, like you know as you're waiting for the band to come on, they'll put it on. Everybody knows the words. They sing along. They've added lyrics. It's really fun. Anyways, he redid the song and did uh, McCain Palin tradition, uh, which is instead of family tradition, which is one of the worst songs I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> Have you ever heard Creed Marlins song? Like Creed redid one of their songs for the Florida Marlins. <laughs> That's so bad, man. No, I haven't. <laughs> it's really, really funny. Uh, Marlins will soar, I believe is the name of it. It's definitely worth checking out. That's yeah, yeah. I mean, it's really like, I mean, it's, it's just such a weird, sad like mm-hmm. thing. It's like, uh, like, like just the fact that that the same, you know, that the guy. I mean, I was listening to some of his stuff this morning, right? You know, it's like has songs like uh, "Whiskey Bent" and "Hellbound" is literally singing lyrics in defense of the big banks, you know, that, oh, they didn't want to make those loans. Like, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's just, it's just unbelievable. Um, all right. I get to uh, bring on um, uh, Liza Featherstone, uh, Harvey JK and, uh, and Nathan Robinson for, uh, for shift number three. Uh, thank you so much, boys. Yeah. Have fun. Later, David. Later, Ben.
All right. Uh, hey. Now joined uh, by um, Liza Featherstone, uh, who uh, is, among other things, a co-worker at Jacobin. Uh, a uh, Nathan uh, Nathan J. Robinson, uh, who is the uh, editor of another socialist magazine you may have heard of, uh, and uh, and uh, Harvey J. K., who um, is uh, is is a historian and an author and and somebody who uh, who I'm sure everybody's watching this has seen before. Uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thanks, yeah. Ben. So I believe as of a couple minutes ago, polls closed in Georgia and the first polls closed in Florida, which I believe is actually where you are right now, Nathan. Is that right? Uh, I'm in, I'm actually in new Orleans. Oh, I, you're uh, back. Okay. I was in Florida right. earlier this year, but, and I am from Florida. Um, but, uh, I no longer vote there. So okay. I throw my vote away in uh, Louisiana now. <laughs> Oh, fair enough. Anybody? And I, lived, any, uh... and I lived in Louisiana, which was yeah. back in the seventies before, before you were all born, probably. And um, not before I was born. <laughs> not, well, it, you look like you weren't born. Then. Um, no, I, I I didn't vote in in Louisiana because it was uh, it didn't matter, mm -hmm. basically. And um, and Carter was the Democratic candidate, and he was. As far as I was concerned, always a despicable candidate. So, uh, so I didn't, and I, I, I later, I, I didn't regret my decision, but I, I tell my students that it's that you have to choose one way or the other now, and then I remember my own uh, my own failure to vote. So, yeah, fair enough. Yeah, well, I, I, I feel yeah. the same. Voting in New York, um, I I I actually did vote for the Green Party last time around, which it does. You know, everybody says, "Oh, it doesn't matter because they um, safe state," but I kind of regretted it. Um, not because I feel like my vote in New York, um, you know, for Jill Stein caused Trump to win, because that's obviously not logical um, yeah. on any level. Um, but um, but I, I regret the um, you know I, I regret having to um, defend that by saying well you know it it did no good <laughs> you know like, 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 well, that's not a defense of a political action you know L yeah. like like it, it like but like my defense of that is well the green party was just much too weak to make a difference yeah well that's no defense at all like like why yeah, you hard to get enthusiastic about we that. should always but we should always be aspiring <laughs> they they are they are only and defensible. Good, you know? They're only defensible so long as they are ineffectual. And right. if they started to become effective, then they start to become dangerous, and we'd have to try and not vote for them. And that's just yeah. a dizzyingly untenable political <laughs> formation, right? Like when your defense is, we were just too weak to make a difference. And so I, I when I remember thinking that a few months after the election, and thinking. No, I'm just never doing that again. I can't listen to myself say something that stupid. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I mean, I guess I will say that if if the Green Party actually was like uh, that, so many people started voting for the Green Party that they could turn New York into a swing state, then that would be so wildly more than I would ever expect them to be able to do. Sure. That I would actually start to think, oh, maybe they actually could turn into a major party, and and then sure. maybe you can make a case for them. Yeah, um, that would be fascinating. And right. but but they're not. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I voted socialist in '72 in New Jersey when I had just gotten back from London, and I just figured no matter who the Democrats put up, I wouldn't vote for them. Then in '76, I already told you what I did, and then in '80, I voted for Barry Commoner. And that was actually, him. yeah, I, I thought he was wonderful, but he didn't go anywhere. And even on the rationale that maybe if he got enough votes, they'd get some federal funding in, in elections. And I've never since then voted third party. Yeah, he was cool, though, much cooler than Ralph Nader. Yes. Oh, yeah, for sure. Absolutely. 
Do, do y'all know who the I, when I went to vote this morning? Uh, well, actually, I don't think the Green Party was on the Louisiana ballot. I couldn't even see it. Um, but there were several minuscule socialist parties. Mm. I don't even know who they are. There's okay, one. I might actually be able to help here. I, I know my. I know, oh, we okay, can, so we can pile on. No, 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 but but I, I, I'm just fascinated. <laughs> I'm always fascinated because I'm a socialist and I don't know who's running on the on the socialist party tickets. But we, we vote as socialists. I think we should not beat up. I, I, I do love. I do. I don't mean any disrespect. I always just am fascinated to find out uh, that. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, they, I don't I want to make sure that back in '72, and I, go, I don't want to know that I ended up voting for the National Socialist Party. That's my biggest. Uh, this is, yeah, you've yeah. got to check what words are surrounding the word socialist. Yeah. Yes, um, yes. The National Socialists are the, the <laughs> ones we really want to avoid at all costs, including tonight. Well, I did meet David Duke when I was in the. I, he was in the. He was doing his master's degree in political science upstairs when I was doing my PhD at LSU. Yeah. He said he could smell me when I entered the room since he heard I was a New York Jew. All right. Cool. Uh, <laughs> Actually, I was listening to the, uh, the uh, uh, Know Your Enemy podcast, uh, which, is a, which is a podcast about the um, uh, done by uh, done by some leftists about conservatism. And, uh, and they, they did one where they were talking about um, David Duke and they said that his one of his big political accomplishments. This would never have occurred to me that this would be an accomplishment, but is that he, uh, he brought together the uh, neo-Nazis and the Klan, which uh, apparently had been distinct forces, but right. uh, they were able to do some fascist ecumenicism there. Which I guess makes sense when you start to think about it, because there were like old Klansmen who'd been in the army in World War II and things like that. Uh, yeah, but yeah it, are they it's sectarian a, like we are? I mean, are they like, do they split different that would seem minor to us. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a good question. I, I don't, Very I don't good know. Question. Like, are they um, like, oh, you know, those those Nazis, those are the those we don't have anything to do with. They're really, you know, yeah. crazy. Well you know, well, you know, Richard Spencer has actually uh, actually said that he was voting for Biden. Uh, yes, yeah. because. Um, uh, and he even clarified it's like not for accelerationist reasons or anything. It's 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 just because he thinks it would handle the coronavirus more competently. So uh, there you go. Make of that what you want. <laughs> um, I would imagine one of the uh, one of the socialist parties on your ballot, Nathan, is probably the Party of Socialism and Liberation, as PSL. It's uh, yeah. Leela Riva. Uh, that's 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 one that for whatever reason it's a. Uh, it's a split off from the Workers' World Party, which itself was an ancient split off from the Socialist Workers' Party. And uh, for some reason, they seem to be very good at getting on ballots. I don't know. Maybe I like a, having I, socialists on the ballot. I should say, sure, I yeah. like it. It's very encouraging. When I look down the list and there's uh, you know, multiple socialist parties, it gives me the pleasant illusion that we live in the kind of country that has multiple viable socialist parties. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's a desperate man there. Yeah. yeah, no, it's no, true. It would be I'm, amazing if, if these were actually all like the, this is the, yeah, which the sorts socialist of socialists do you want to oh, power? That's like, the question. I want. You know, are we going to have to vote for the Trotskyists this year to stop the Maoists from getting in or whatever? You know, like that. That would be such a better problem to have. Uh, <laughs> you to hold your nose and vote for Biden, which, which I should say I did. Uh, I'm voting I did in, in Michigan, uh, which, which is. Um, uh, which is very much a, I mean, I guess right now Biden is well ahead in the polls there, but uh, but uh, in 2016, uh, Hillary Clinton lost Michigan by 0.23%. So like the slightest win could have been different uh, and, and she, uh, she would have won, or I mean, she could have campaigned there and she would have won, of course, but... Um, but it's it's uh, but it was, I think she was actually the first Democrat who lost Michigan since Dukakis, possibly. Like it's it's a swing state, but I'd never taken seriously the idea it was a swing state because mm -hmm. all the elections that I was old enough to remember, uh, the Democrats always won. So I was like, okay, it's it's a it's basically a blue state. It's just uh, it's just like on election night, yeah. I was at the uh, Chapo live show in Brooklyn. And um, and it was this kind of famous debacle because they had a whole thing planned out uh, for what they were going to do as the you know as the votes came in and you know and and the the shtick they were going to do 
Uh, and it didn't work, right? Because it was all premised on Hillary winning. Uh, and over the course of the night, as people got increasingly worried, um, you know, like after, you know, people went out to a bar after the show and like, I, I spent all night telling people, no, 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 I grew up in Michigan. I know how this works. The, uh, uh, the, the Republican is always winning uh, f- for most of the night. And then Wayne County comes in and the Democrat wins. So I'm sure that's, I'm sure that's what's going to happen. And then it did not. Yeah, it was, it was, it was so shocking. I mean, it was, it, it, it's, it, it well, it was even shocking when Republicans started to win the governorship of Michigan, which was a process that happened started happening a little earlier. Yeah, I mean, there were, there were yeah, I mean, significantly earlier. There was John Engler was the governor yeah. uh, from the early '90s or maybe even '90. I'm not sure exactly, mm-hmm. uh, but I think he served. I think um, actually, I'm trying to remember now. So I know. Jennifer Granholm, who's who, it switched. So Jennifer Granholm was a Democrat, was elected in 2002, and Ingler had been governor before that since like the early 90s. And Ingler was like a Ingler was this like unspeakable like Dickensian villain who yeah. uh, who did things like uh, famously uh, shut down mental institutions as a budget cut, like literally in the middle of the night. You know that uh, uh, so so there wouldn't be as many cameras on it. Uh, and um, and he like I remember how he once uh, had this quote in the press about how he's bragging that um, handicapped people under his administration had become more independent. Uh, so uh, that that was that was Ingler, uh, and then Jennifer Granholm, who was like a pretty bad centrist Democrat, came in in two thousand and two, and then uh, Rick Snyder, uh, who was a. Um, uh, who campaigned, who was a Republican, but he campaigned as this like almost a political technocrat. Um, he came in in, what was that, like 2012, maybe something like that. And he, uh, I might be getting, I might be off by a couple of years, uh, but he, he, he was there. And then basically he turned out to be this like Tea Party monstrosity who mm-hmm. pushed through all of these things to um, to strip away employees their collective bargaining rights and 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 he um, uh, and he took away self government from a bunch of cities in Michigan uh, with the emergency manager law uh, and of course famously uh, he uh, he poisoned the water in uh, in Flint uh, and and knew about it you know this is all very well documented that he knew about it for a long time before it. Um, uh, before it was public, and and he didn't do anything to stop it. In fact, not only did not do anything to stop it, anybody who's seen uh, the uh, most recent Michael Moore movie knows that he uh, that uh, General Motors was complaining that the bad water uh, with all the lead in it was bad for the production process, and so they were given special permission. They routed some better water to the GM factory at the same time as the drinking water uh, continued to have the lead contamination. So that was Rick Snyder. And then he was uh, he was replaced by uh, Gretchen Whitmer, who was almost kidnapped by uh, some uh, uh, fascists in the hills of uh, of northern Michigan. Uh, but she's like an okay centrist Democrat. Like she was supported by Blue Cross Blue Shield. She was running against a very good uh, uh, Bernie Crat uh, Abdul Al Said, uh, who um, who act yeah who yeah we were um, and um, and but but. As centrists go, Whitmer is like okay, um, like like she has done some of the right things uh, during uh, during the uh, during the pandemic. So Michigan yeah, keeps going. Back. I should say, about- incurring the ire of John Wilkes Booth and you know, <laughs> kidnapping team. <laughs> yeah, um, which uh, which which by the way, I I, I, rec- I very recently found out that that Liza and I have something in common. I wouldn't have uh, I wouldn't have imagined, uh, which is that I grew up in, in East Lansing, where she uh, very briefly lived at one point, like for a couple of months. I only I very briefly lived there. My whole family did live there, and my sisters grew grew up there, and they went to your elementary school and high school and um, everything. I was yeah. uh, I'm older than all of those people, so I was um. I, I basically wasn't around, um, but um, but but yeah, I, I I did spend I did spend a few months here and there living in East Lansing. 
Yeah, I uh, I think one of your sisters is a few years older than me, and one's a few years younger, so I miss exactly. both of them. Uh, uh, although I did, uh, funny fact about East Lansing in high school, I, I did go to high school with uh, with Nate Silver, and um, we were actually overlapped on the East Lansing high school debate team one year. So uh, I have not it been. Was he time. like that? No, even that then? Is true. No, no. He, I mean, I remember him being like a very pleasant, quiet kid. You know, like I, I didn't I didn't know him that well, but I was over at his house like once. To work on something for the for the debate team, um, but uh, but but no, this is all this is all new, and I certainly haven't uh, I certainly haven't had any contact with them since the 1990s. And after what I wrote about him in my book, I imagine I probably never will. <laughs> he probably started out as a harmless nerd, like they all do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, let's see. Well, you guys, uh, what do we think about what do you what do we what do we think about these events were on the precipice. Of. What <laughs> events are we on the precipice of? Right? See, this is the thing. I, I haven't even written uh, anything uh, today or yesterday, and I we Kurt and Fred deliberately avoided doing any kind of election live stream because I, I just, you know, I, all, all we could really do is sort of wait and see which of these two vastly different, both terrifying, uh, strange futures we are about to fork into. And yeah. uh, I don't yeah, even. I, <laughs> yeah, I actually, you know, I, I, I guess the size, but I, 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 this is not a critique of of your position necessarily. But I don't think they're too strange. I, I actually don't think okay strange possibilities. I, I actually, I mean, I, I'm not, not look. I'm not naive about Biden. Let me make one thing clear about Biden. The one time I liked him was when he was when he was rightly accused of plagiarism. Because at least he was plagiarizing Neil Kinnock, the head of the yes. movie. Okay. Yeah. But having said that, I, I I actually have a I actually have a fairly hopeful view of the near future. Okay. The, if, assuming the pandemic oh, doesn't bring it on, man. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, I, think this. I think we should underestimate Bernie's role in a Democratic Senate. Mm -hmm. And I he's gonna chair significant health committees, as I understand it. Mm -hmm. he, he, I, always, I go back to the 30s and I think about the fact that the New Deal didn't just require FDR, it required leaders in the Senate to make things happen. Yeah. And so you had, you had Wagner of New York, you had LaFala Jr. of Wisconsin, and Norris of Nebraska, two out of three of them, by the way, having been progressive Republicans. And there were other senators, obviously. Mm -hmm. But I keep thinking that we all, you know, we all for months we've talked about well, push Biden left, and I, and I actually think the idea is to push Bernie forward, mm -hmm. and and I I'm I won't deny that this is somewhat fantastic, but I actually think about Bernie, Warren, and Markey as a possible threesome in the Senate, yeah, advancing legislation that would actually pull Biden. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I, so I, I think there are real possibilities, and I actually want to say, and I'm willing to antagonize my comrades on the left, that the left would be sorely mistaken to immediately go into anti-Biden mode, but okay, rather this, go into pro-Bernie mode. Mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. this, so, so, so this is a um, this is a disagreement. I would, I would I should probably not admit this, but I've already admitted it early on the stream, so I'll, I'll go ahead and repeat it, which is that. Uh, I wrote something for Jacobin that might be published in a few hours, uh, or if there, are, uh, or if we don't know the results tonight, maybe in a couple of weeks. And if Trump wins, never. Uh, which uh, <laughs> is the uh, the first the first sentence is uh, Trump lost. Uh, so uh, so so it, it might be a uh, embarrassing, you know, uh, deleted scene in the uh, in the DVD. Uh, oh, yeah, but so your piece will just be triggered by that <laughs> event. Like, yeah, like, no, no, like, like, apparently, apparently it's all ready to go, right? Yeah. Like, if, if he does, right? And, um, and the uh, and so, and so this is good. So, we, we have something interesting to disagree about here because the uh, the title of the piece is uh, No Honeymoon. Uh, and uh, and and I think that I, I do think it's important that the um, that that the left uh, shift uh, into uh, into anti anti Biden mode. And I think part of my disagreement with Harvey here. Uh, is just about the balance of forces because, yes, Bernie Sanders, you know, even if he's like chairing a powerful committee, like, a, and that's all great, right? You know, but um, there is one of him, 
right? Like like the Senate, uh, you know, we we don't know um, there are a bunch, you know, like we don't know what the composition of the Senate is going to be. But one thing we do know is that there's going to be exactly one Democratic Socialist in it. Uh, we uh, we also um, is as you point out, Ed Markey, and I think the Markey thing is interesting because we all got very excited about Markey fending off uh, the uh, Kennedy challenge for good reasons because because uh, because you know Kennedy the third is like the um, is like uh, this unspeakably horrible uh, um, kind of entitled dynastic uh, twit, uh, and and yeah. he was he was challenging him that for the right. <laughs> You know, because because of our role in co-sponsoring the Green New Deal, but it's also a sign of how bad things are that we were excited about Ed Markey winning because Ed Markey pre Green New Deal, uh, he's a he's not that different. Like like his record is not that different from um, from from Joe Kennedy the third even like on a lot of issues. Markey voted for the Iraq War. You know, he's he's pretty centrist, and so I think the fact that we kind of have to reach for him as the second or third, if you count Warren, yeah. I think is a sign of how bad things are. I, I know exactly where you're going on that one. And I'm not, I won't argue that, but this is then, and that was now. And he's already, he placed, he literally went on the line on the Green New Deal thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I, and I, and that's all I'm asking of him. Yeah. I think that um, I I agree with Harvey, um, and I mean uh, yes, Ben. Of course, um, he's he 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 has he has a, a career a career of demonstrating being a mediocre centrist. Um, but what's really interesting was I think um, I think that we saw I think the the left um, flexed a little bit with that re-election, with Markey's re-election, because, um, you know, I think, um, you know, all these young people who wouldn't care about a centrist running for re-election in Massachusetts got out there and canvassed for him because he was um, AOC's partner on the Green New Deal. And, um, and I think he got to, you know, he and his colleagues got to see that he was mm -hmm. rewarded for moving left on basically the one of the most existential issues that the planet is facing. <laughs> and so I think that was a really good bit of exercising what little power we have. You know, and um, you know, and if he if he um if he does if he didn't come through on it or there was some sort of major backsliding, I think um, he'd certainly see if he lives to the next election, he's not very young. Um, he'd, but he'd see, he'd certainly see that support and, and those grassroots forces go away. Nathan, what do you think? Yeah, wait, Harvey, can I ask, ask you, there was a uh, report uh, the other day about, uh, that suggested, you know, who knows, but it's in Politico, uh, who knows who suggested it, suggested that uh, Bernie was seeking to, uh, be on the short list for Biden's labor secretary. My my first reaction was that was a horrible idea, and that like the main thing we need is him as an independent voice. Uh, I I take it you you senator. probably would feel the same way about that. Yeah, no. As a matter of fact, I did I did a I did a gee, it might be a thirty minute uh, non show uh, YouTube thing with uh, Nomaki Konst, and um, because. My position, I was shocked that he actually was, that he was seeking it was the argument they were making. I can't believe it. No. Mm. I mean, I just don't believe it. I mean, the fact is that, you know, we've got the experience. Look, Biden is not FDR and therefore Bernie would not be Francis Perkins. Exactly. Right? Exactly. That's the start. At yeah. the same time, I, I was never a fan of Robert Reich until he turned on Clinton, who had literally, as he oh, yeah. claimed, locked him in the cabinet. Right. Okay, So my thinking is that it's too easy for the Bidenettes to lock Bernie in the cabinet. So yeah. I absolutely oppose the idea of yeah. Bernie going into the cabinet. Yeah, um, yeah. I, mean, yeah, yeah. I, I, I would also say we probably don't have to worry about it. Uh, yeah, yeah. Probably not. Is no dodo, unlike all the people who are suggesting. This. Yeah, my fantasy <laughs> scenario and all that is I, Trump I just gets think... Secretary of Labor, Sarah Nelson becomes president of the AFL CIO, and Bernie leads the charge for workers' rights in the Senate. That's my 
Yeah, but I mean, but I mean, I also think that Biden's just not going to do that. I mean, maybe he would, uh, be, like, if he were smarter, because that would be, you know, that'd be a way to neuter him. But, uh, but I mean, like, the actual like people I've seen that the Biden transition team is vetting. Uh, I mean, is, he's not going in that direction at all. Right. He's, they're they're vetting uh, Republicans to show off their bipartisanship. Uh, including people like uh, like John Kasich, who uh, I mean, I, I mean, I hope he's not being concerned for labor secretary, but yeah, you um, just scared me. I didn't, I hadn't heard that one. So, uh, but but no, Kasich is is like he's he oh, was on the list of names that's been vetted by the Biden transition team. I don't know for what position, but Kasich is now mostly known for being this moderate Republican who doesn't like Trump, but he was a notorious union buster as governor of Ohio. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. They'll they'll put him in commerce or transportation. That's what they did with Tommy Thompson out of Wisconsin. They made, you know, in the was it Bush administration, they made him transportation, I think it was. Am I wrong? Or was it HUD? Uh, I think you're right. I don't remember. Oh, okay. uh, by the way, for whatever it's worth, um, uh, Georgia uh, Biden is uh, at 54.8% right now, but it's only 4% reporting. So take that with a grain of salt. Okay. And, um, in Florida, which is 57% reporting, uh, Biden is 50.5 and Trump is 48.8. So not like, oh, okay. not so anyway, I, 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 I've been arguing the last 24 hours. I, well, actually, yeah, 24 hours. Last night on David Feldman's show, I actually said that I want Biden to come out at 10 o'clock Eastern time and claim he's the winner. Mm. I, I, even if he does it as a joke, I we desperately need... <laughs> A change in the script that Trump has written for tonight. Yeah, because if he right. doesn't, Trump will. Yeah. So, did you guys see? Um, I mean, I don't want to get too optimistic here, but did you see the clip of Trump um, when he or he was asked earlier today whether he was going to, you know, whether whether he would declare victory even if all the votes were in, and um, he seemed really depressed. <laughs> he did. We couldn't tell if he was just <laughs> very tired from all the like rallies and stuff, but he sounded very different to how he usually sounds. No, yeah, he sounded like, bad. It was weird. Yeah, he, I mean, look, he knows. It, he, I think, yeah, it, it, I know. I, it made me the more the level of depression that he radiated made me more optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> no, in fact, I'm so glad you brought that up because I didn't see that one, but I'll tell you what made me optimistic. In the course of five days, I think the entire Trump family came to Wisconsin four times. Wow, that's okay. Again. And he went to every part of the state. Mm -hmm. And that told me that they were desperately seeking at least to make sure their base turned out. Okay. Right. And or, or they really were serious in killing off everyone by having them turn out because we're a very hot state right now. I, I've tried to be really careful because I, I, you know, 2016 was a lesson in not counting chickens before they hatch, and so I, I tried to avoid any kind of optimism and to plan for the worst case scenarios completely. I did say, but there are signs that make me make me happy. And uh, this morning, when Trump posted the video of him uh, uh, dancing horribly to the YMCA um, on on Twitter. Um, as his like closing message to voters, like vote, and it was two minutes of the YMCA play. And I thought this is very, very bizarre. And it reminded me that Trump has been has not really come up with a message for this campaign. He's tried to like it's sort of been like Joe Biden's a radical socialist, which is completely implausible. Like Trump's criticisms of Hillary Clinton really landed; they were like often true, um, yeah. but <laughs> but his stuff about Biden has just been so deranged and detached that it's it's not it doesn't feel like it has the same power. And he's felt like he's really kind of scrambling to find yeah, something well, to say. It's, it's, a, it's a weird reversal too, because like the the final message to uh, voters from the Trump 2016 campaign. Uh, was an ad that was all about uh, Hillary Clinton's connections to Goldman Sachs. Uh, like, like right. he was he was hitting the um, you know populist rhetoric really hard then, and now it's it's almost the opposite. Uh, like, I, yeah. I, I I read uh, Thomas Frank's book, uh, The People Know, um, which which I'd really recommend. And in there, he um, he talks a lot about the 1896 election uh, with um, uh, the. William Jennings Bryan is the Democrat, but like endorsed by the by the People's Party, you know, the original populists. And then um, 
and then uh, McKinley as the Republican. And, and it kept hitting me, right? You know, because it's like we, we, at this point, it would almost be like a free association test for anybody who consumes a lot of media it would be like populist Trump. But uh, not only does the Trump 2020 campaign sound nothing like the, the Brian campaign, mm -hmm. it sounds a lot like the McKinley campaign right down to the constant fear mongering about anarchists. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, 2016 was very strange for me, Nathan. I'm with you about the that was a, that was a dev it was devastating. But but actually, in another way, it was it confirmed my suspicions. I'll tell you what happened. So I spent a lot of 2016 after Bernie was out, um, basically reassuring other people that Trump couldn't win when I didn't really believe it. Mm -hmm. But since I'm the professor mm -hmm. in a group of of friends, they all looked to me for insight, right? Oh, that's a mistake. But then I, but a couple of things happened, and I, I, I didn't talk about it a lot at the time because I wasn't supposed to, but a very, very dear friend of mine was one of the, the principal founders of Ready for Hillary. And we mm -hmm. suspended our friendship during that, during the entire primary season. Mm -hmm. And then we reunited because I, had do I have daughters and I had no intention of not voting for Hillary. And Greens were out of the question, as far as I was concerned. It had to, it had to be the case. So anyhow, um, she called me in September or October and said, I'm going to be in Wisconsin. Let's get lunch. And I said, well, when do you want to do it? And she said the time. I said, no, I'm teaching that day. How about it? How about when you come back to Wisconsin? Because I knew she had to be. The, she was in the advanced team for Hillary. I knew that. I mean, that, you're very close to Hillary. And she said, oh, we're not we're not coming to Wisconsin. That's the moment. Like, that was the moment. And the second moment was, even, <laughs> it was like, I, I just thought, oh my God. So then yeah. hmm. a few weeks later, but a good week in the week leading up to the election, I believe was Trump made one of his return visits to Wisconsin. He came to Green Bay again. I think it was the second time, in fact. And I had forgotten the fact that he was coming and I was driving through downtown to go out to the West side to a friend's house for dinner. And there was a lot of traffic. So I got stopped at every traffic light and we're not a big city. It's only a hundred thousand people. But when I got down to the convention center, I, all I saw were lots and lots of women going into the convention center. And I thought, what the hell is going on? So I turned on the local thing and turned out that Trump was in town. And I saw that women were flooding in to hear Trump. Oh no! And then, I, then I actually knew that uh, I don't remember the actual election night coming to me as a surprise because of what I had first heard mm -hmm. and then witnessed. I, I and I don't mm -hmm. think people. I don't think you know. Look, she was a, an awful candidate. Um, it really was the case that Wisconsinites look were close to Michigan, were utterly different and very similar, the mm -hmm. two states. And frankly, people would. They may not remember the details of the Clinton presidency, but they sure as hell knew it wasn't good yeah. for them, the working people of Wisconsin, whether it had to do with NAFTA, which was primary, okay, or it had to do with uh, and, and to, aid to families with dependent children was devastating, mm. utterly devastating. And then, of course, you know Hillary's embrace of TPP, which she tried to backtrack on. I mean, you know, they they, they despised yeah. her working people in Wisconsin. So, yeah, the trade stuff was big. You know, anyhow. Yeah. And Trump yeah, was good about good at talking about that. Right. That's exactly. He knew he knew far, exactly what he knew what states yeah. he wanted to win. Yeah. We, the thing when we were writing in, in current affairs that year about uh, you know the the reasons that Trump was being underestimated, one of the the major points was that you know, Trump had arguments against Hillary that were good arguments. Yes, that, you know the points that he was making against her were very difficult to defend against because they were in many cases true, right? I mean, as a as a as a as a Democrat, as a sort of left progressive Democrat, you couldn't really say anything when you bring them up. You go, well, yeah, that's that's yes, exactly. The Colton the Sachs thing, uh, Iraq, yes, oh yes, the Clinton presidency that was awful too. Oh yes, NAFTA was very bad, right? Um, and that has been quite different this year um, because the the stuff, as I say, the stuff about Joe Biden just doesn't make any sense. Um, he's not even running a and and it's he's like half the time it's like Joe Biden is a corrupt 
uh, establishment creature, uh, you know, Biden uh, stuff. And then half the time it's, uh, oh, Joe Biden is Antifa. He's the, he's a socialist. He's a radical. And, you, you know, you're just left going like, what is, what is the message here? Yeah. I love the idea that it's Joe Biden supporters <laughs> who are rioting and looting. <laughs> like, like, every time I say that, they, like, I laugh and try to imagine the most enthusiastic Biden supporters I know well, part of these situations. Yeah, He's fallen into what I call the I wish school of Republican criticism, which is every time they say like Barack Obama is a radical black nationalist socialist and you're like, Jesus, I God, that would be amazing. I know, I'm afraid it's not true. Yeah. You want to yeah. live in the world. Uh, yeah. yeah. I, 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 I want to live in the Republican <laughs> fantasy of what the Democratic Party is. You want to live in it. You want to live in it. <laughs> I think criticisms don't necessarily have to be coherent to be effective, but they can't right. be they can't be incoherent if you're not like feeding into narratives that are that have already taken. If if you're trying yeah. to get people to believe right. a new thing then you can't really try to get them to believe two obviously incompatible new things at the same time, which well, is what we will see. <laughs> well, maybe yeah, we say right. we assume I you can't do this. I mean, we will see whether some of these completely preposterous <laughs> preposterous narratives have landed. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, but like it's like part of like the corruption stuff about Biden is is largely true, but the problem is that. Um, that that's not something that's like a well-established narrative like it was with, with Bill and Hillary Clinton, that, uh, right. that people don't, um, you know, like people who only sort of pay attention to politics don't necessarily have that association, mm -hmm. which is why, and then plus, and maybe I think in a normal election year when, when there was like the big dramatic Hunter Biden stuff that, that would have done something. Mm -hmm. But I, I think that when like the, the corpses are full to bursting with, with COVID victims, uh, in the morgues, you know, then, then I think the idea that you should care about any of this, I think it has a much harder time registering, right. That's like, okay. Yeah. You know, especially frankly, I think that because um, uh, I think because I, th I think also because the opioid epidemic, because even though the corruption stuff is the part that's actually significant and newsworthy, the stuff that's really attention grabbing is like, Hunter Biden with his crack pipe and stuff like that. But I think that uh, too many voters, especially in, in, um, in the States that the Trump needs have somebody in their family who, who has a drug problem, I, I think. For, for that really that. About making that connection. I think people feel some empathy for him and Hunter mm. and for Hunter Biden on that, because it's such a, it's such a widespread problem. And actually before this, before this election, before the pandemic happened and all of this crazy stuff that will in the future be just known as 2020, um, I, I thought the opioid epidemic was going to be the election issue. I thought whoever talks, speaks well and convincingly about the opioid epidemic, epidemic and how you're going to fix all of the suffering, I, I, th I thought whoever does whoever talks about that will win and it wasn't true in the primary and it wasn't and, yeah, and it yeah. hasn't been that yeah. big of an issue but i think yeah. just biden even bringing up his son's struggles at all i mean i think that has i think it probably has helped him well go back to the beginning i think it was that well, you know the two campaigns can too readily run together go back to the beginning of the two of the 20 well back to 2019 wasn't that one of Bernie's major early events? It was, yeah. It was around the yeah. basically the you know the opioid. Yeah, epidemic. yeah. No, well, and that's it was why I, West Virginia, right? Well, that's why I said it, I turned out to be wrong because Bernie did, in fact, um, campaign very well on the opioid, yeah. epidemic, even exactly. though he didn't get a lot of attention for it, but he didn't win. Yeah. I, I keep having my Bernie fantasy campaign popping up in my head, going, God, I just wish. We could have this moment, this 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 whole current crisis was one that he would have been. Ugh, I can't even think about how differently this could have gone. And now we're trying to push Joe yeah. Biden's corpse over well, the line. I mean, it, it, it's it's almost like um, I, I know this is like a very deep cut. I think there are like five people maybe watching this who will remember this book. But Al Franken, many years before he actually ran for office, um, wrote a uh, a satirical book called "Why Not Me." Uh, where which was this like weird fantasy about 
him running for president. Uh, and in um, and in that book, uh, the joke was that his big issue was being against ATM fees. And so he was a joke candidate until there was some, I don't even remember what the plot development was, but there was some uh, ridiculous uh, plot development. There was some ridiculous catastrophe that happened with all the ATM machines around the country. And since he was the only one who was talking about it, uh, he's actually swept into office. Uh, and, and in a way it's kind of the same thing, right? I mean, like what, what's Bernie, what's Bernie Sanders talked about more than anything else is uh, Medicare for all and having, um, you know, yes, so many millions of people losing their health insurance suddenly mm -hmm. and, and having this unprecedented public health crisis. I mean, I, I can just imagine what the campaign could have been if the big issue in debate was, uh, was whether, was whether we should have Medicare for all. Yeah. Let me land a cliche. Let me land a cliche. Timing is everything. Yeah. 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 Well, it does put um, it does put Bernie in a good position to you know be part part of the um, part of the op the internal opposition, the internal Democratic opposition. You know, I, I saw him in an interview. I think it was two weeks ago, and he said something interesting because he's going to be heading this committee on health care. And he, I swear I heard him say that he was going to propose something that, that, I, that I'm not the only one mentioning, but I've been mentioning, that if the Democrats are so afraid of the big picture Medicare for all, how about Medicare for all kids? Mm -hmm. It's a guaranteed winner. And I, in fact, even now I can't figure mm -hmm. out why, why Bernie didn't tell Biden, just come out for Medicare for, for all kids. Okay. Well, my understanding yeah. is that there are there are officials from the Johnson administration who said that uh, after they did Medicare, uh, the plan was that the next thing they were going to roll out was was exactly that, right? It was was uh, was with Medicare for people under eighteen, and basically the uh, you know deepening U.S. involvement in Vietnam was taking up too much money and too much public attention for them to do that. But that had at one point something something that was discussed in the administration. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I I think that um, I mean, as as depressing as it is to think about um, the um, centrist Democrats, um, it it there there is a lot more room to maneuver for the for the left. I think if mm -hmm. Biden wins. Oh, look! I mean, if nothing else, I think that it's I think that it's it's just a, a debate that we that we do better in, right? You know, like like yeah. the, if um, because if you have, I mean, first of all, if you have some like ostentatiously horrible uh, Republican president, like there's this narrative that some people on the left have that uh, that that's actually good for us because that means that everybody will be mad, they'll be in the streets, you know, and that. <laughs> Uh, that, that that won't happen if there's a Democrat in office, which always strikes me as really funny when people make that argument now. Because, uh, dude, do you, do you remember when it, when Obama was president? I do, because uh, when Obama was president, let's just review. That's when Black Lives Matter started. Uh, that's when the Occupy movement happened. That's when Bernie Sanders won 22 states. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that I think that was actually much better uh, terrain for the for the left in some ways. Mm -hmm. um, that and I think there's a there's a structural reason maybe for that, which is that. Um, which is that uh, when a ostentatiously horrible clownish right winger is in office, oppositional energy tends to focus on that person as an individual. If mm -hmm. we just got rid of him, then we'd be fine. Yeah. Uh, and you ended up getting things like lots of progressives going to Washington, D.C., not to protest against the wars or for Medicare for all, but for that god awful John Stewart rally to restore sanity. Uh, <laughs> and uh, whereas when some uh, competent seeming centrist Democrat is in office, yeah. uh, oppositional energy, I think, tends to get focused on these more systemic issues like police brutality, uh, you know, like like economic inequality with Occupy. Uh, and, and I think there is some hope that and, and I think in general also uh, just on the on the left. I mean, why did Biden win the primary? OK, some of it uh, we could talk about some of the proximate reasons why he won at the moment that he did because the centrist consolidated in this weird, unprecedented way. But why was he even like a viable candidate at that point to, to do that? And a lot of the answer is that uh, after four years of Trump, Democratic primary voters were desperate to just go back to normal. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think that if Trump does somehow win tonight, uh, by 2024, that, that longing to go back to normal by Democratic voters is going to be off the charts. 
Uh, whereas if, if there's a Democrat in office and, and that clearly is not going to solve everything, I think there's more of an opening for the left to present yeah. itself as an alternative in that situation. I, but I, I actually think, I actually think you're right in many ways. I'm not going to argue with that. But I, but I actually think that that scenario should be in the minds of the Democrats, that the only way they're going to save their party is going to be if they empower Bernie. Because I, I have worked, look, I, I'm not convinced the Democrats will make it through four years if they just go the Biden route. If they just take the, if, if they go back to neoliberalism, the party will split. Wait, Harvey, what, by what we're, we're, of okay, not making it? Okay, sorry, I, I, miss it, but I, 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 am, I thought I was hearing Ben say that if Trump is reelected, that uh, the des the desperation for normalcy will will go off the charts, but I think yeah. I think listen, Matt, but I'm I see that in the course of these four years before that would even happen, the party will literally shatter. Hmm. I, no, look, I, I mean, I, mean I, I sort of wish I could read that. How could people like how could Bernie? I'm I'm so look. I'm, I was never a big fan of Warren's, but Bernie Warren. How could those folks and AOC and others in in the House? literally stand by and watch a neoliberal administration unfold. It, it's just, it's inconceivable. Mm. Mm. I, I hope so, but I'm not, I'm not convinced. Uh, I, I mean, I, I think that the two, I mean, I, I don't know. I think the democratic party, unfortunately is incredibly resilient. Like, like I wish it would shatter because I think that's the only possible way we could get a new major party, you know, the same way that the, uh, uh, Republican Party, you know, kind of emerged out of the corpse of the Whigs, but um, but I don't know. I mean, remember that the material you're talking about for this new party is 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 unfortunately right now it's still tiny. There, even with Cory Bush, the number of Democratic Socialists uh, in um, in Congress is still going to be able to be counted on one hand out of out of out of hundreds of Democrats. But there will be. But you're you're narrowing it to Democratic Socialists, and I I think actually the number of progressives in the House is going to increase. Not, not, not yeah, and, yes. and I look. That's I, 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 look, I, I, I've paid my dues to DSA for years, but I can't argue a DSA argument because it's politically untenable. Okay, uh, quite frankly, and the and the the what, way what's the DSA argument. No, no. In other words, the idea of democratic socialists as the as you know, in some way, is the wave of any future party. It's, I just don't see oh. that. Oh, I don't think that that is the DSA argument. No, no. Sorry, I, I'm responding to. He said democratic socialists and- Oh, 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 oh sorry. sorry. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I think mean, that's like a really complicated thing where, um, I mean, some DSA people see it as kind of a pre-party formation and some people don't and it's not a- Right, right. I, what I was saying is that, what, what I'm getting at is it is, it. I think that time is running out for Pelosi, for Schumer and, and for Biden in a, Real sense, okay. I mean, look, I'm 71 now, and I I know there's only so much ahead of me, and I think and Biden's not a fool. I mean, he's look look how many years he survived, you might say, right, and 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 that's why I think um, now to back off from from the dark scenario that I just presented, I actually do think that that those not Pelosi, I, I have <laughs> the sooner they get rid of her, the, the happier. I am, okay? <laughs> Schumer as well. I mean, it's just awful what goes on in Congress. It, it's just awful. And and frankly, if they don't act, and Biden saw it, Biden saw it with Obama. If they don't act, twenty twenty two, they won't yeah. go to twenty twenty four. Yeah, it happen yeah. in twenty twenty two. Yeah, yeah. They Biden will get to, real unpopular real fast. They're haunted by the hundred days image. They're gonna they're gonna have to go big. So, so Harvey, what do you think they have to do? Like, what are the top things that they have to do to, um, you, you know, to appease? Well, obviously, 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 I think, that, you know, I think that I think the idea of Medicare for all kids is is this, is a starter in light of the, of the pandemic, even if kids are not the ones who've had, who who they who they've worried about. Mm -hmm. I mean, when they talk about lowering Medicare from you know sixty five to fifty five, it's all very nice, but you know what the hell. Yeah. Um, but but I, okay, I mean, that so, would benefit me, but I roll my eyes at it. It's yeah, like, okay. 
little. But I, do, but I, but I do think, I do think that there are things that w that will be significant. So, for example, they're going to have to address the question of the min. There's going to have to be a minimum wage question. Mm -hmm. Okay, but but even bigger than that, I think the big thing is going to be a massive public works program. Mm -hmm. So, and by the way, by the way, I'm actually making a pitch for this. The massive public works program is not only important in terms of the need for jobs in the face of the, the depression that's yeah. rising. It's also the case that I, I always go back to the 30s. The fact is that in the 30s, for all of its faults and failings regarding race and race in particular, it is it is definitely the case that Americans discovered they were Americans in the course of the New Deal. Yeah. And the sooner that we can create massive jobs programs, which bring together people who may well have voted for Trump and would have been happy to see Bernie, the sooner we're going to be able to transcend the divide that currently mm -hmm. exists generally. Mm -hmm. So my thinking is going big is gonna involve massive public works, federal contracts will demand a $15 minimum wage and collective bargaining rights. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it'll all be one big package that Bernie, and and Warren will will push, mm -hmm. and and there's no way Schumer would stand in the way. No way. Well, I really <laughs> hope you're right about that. I have to say, I don't believe it. You were going to say what? <laughs> well, in terms of what, in, in six months when we get back to, well, I'll see you before then, I'm sure. But in six months, if I'm right, then you're going to say, "My God, you were prophetic." I'd love and, to. You know. I hope yeah, so. No, I would, I would I, say that was pretty I love being. This is why I'm also being more pessimistic this time, is because uh, uh, it, it makes it so you win either either way. Because either you get to be right or you get to get the really the happiest kind of being wrong, uh, which is yeah. being better than. All you. I know is, for, uh, given my age, I'm supposed to be the one who's not optimistic. You guys, are <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, not optimistic. No, I, don't ever be optimistic. You got so, a terrible word. Possible. So, so I know uh, Liza was going to say something, but I, I did just want to say real quick, for what it's worth, um, Florida's up to 80% reporting, and it's it's narrower than it was, but Biden is still winning. It's 49.9 uh, yeah. to 49.3. Uh, New York Times needle has swung way to Trump on the on Florida, though. Uh, they've got, they say, 95% uh, chance of winning now. Greater oh, than ninety five percent chance of Trump winning Florida. Now they say um, there has been uh, a oh, massive increase yeah. in the uh, percentage since twenty sixteen of uh, Hispanic and Cuban voters who are eleven points higher uh, Trump voting than in twenty sixteen. So yeah, that's a strange that that has been a strange phenomenon. On the other hand. Um, the, I mean, uh, your your story about the women flooding in to see Trump, um, Harvey, reminded me of this. Um, the um, the gender gap has really um, increased on yeah. well, women really turning away from Trump and um, and going for the Democrats. So yeah. even white women, even my benighted people who voted for <laughs> Trump last time around, <laughs> are. Um, doing doing a lot better so so that's interesting and it's a global phenomenon that women seem to be moving away from the right yeah um it's it's funny actually uh i was voting in florida in um 2012 uh, in fact i stood in line for hours uh to do uh, early voting and and i hold on no sorry 2008, 2008, I stood in line for hours to early vote in, in Florida. And, uh, and you could tell, you know, Obama won the state that year and you could tell at least who was winning there uh, or had a much better organized campaign because as we were standing in line for hours, the Obama campaign not only had people go around with, uh, with bottles of water to pass around to keep people in line, but they had these like uh, minor celebrities who were, who were, um, uh, who were there on behalf of the Obama campaign? Uh, so there was there was um, uh, there was uh, Jeffrey Wright. I remember was there. Who was um, Colin Powell in the Oliver Stone W movie? If anybody remembers that, and uh, I believe also Felix Leiter in the uh, in the James Bond movies. And um, and there was uh, Cynthia Nixon. Actually, uh, was uh, was was there. I took a picture yeah. of her with my friend while I was standing there. Uh, and then the McCain campaign was was re represented by like three people with hand drawn. <laughs> 
uh, signs with like a picture of the outline of Cuba. And it said, Cuba got change in 1959 uh, to uh, scare uh, about the Obama campaign. Now, that I was fairly sure that McCain was going to lose the state. <laughs> I'm getting all these texts from my former students. How am I feeling? They want to know. How am I feeling? And I was, and if it was five minutes ago, I would have said pretty good. And then this Florida thing came in. Yeah, that is, that is that is scary. Oh, but it's it's but, like, I, but, I, but not 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 over. Yeah, yeah. Florida is not over, but also the whole election is not over. Yeah, it's true. It's true. Yeah. Be nice. Yeah, yeah. Right now, so I switched over to the New York Times because that's what Nathan mentioned, and right now it is dead even uh, in Florida, forty nine point five to forty nine point five, uh, with uh, Joe Jorgensen getting point six, and presumably some other candidate. Oh nope, Donald Trump just went to forty nine point six. There you go. To Biden's forty nine point four just happened. Um, saying that sentence. The nice thing is, uh, uh, it seems like Laura Loomer has lost her congressional bid, which uh, nice, uh, it's a bright spot. <laughs> we're not gonna have another QAnon congressperson for a while, maybe. Uh, hopefully, Jesus. yeah. Uh, all right, well, gonna uh, switch over to uh, the uh, eight o'clock shift. Uh, Listen, I, I want to say thank you, Ben, and especially because I, I, I hadn't met. I I don't like lies, nor Nathan, who I've been hoping to meet for some time. Actually. Yeah, it's great to finally meet you. It's really yeah. nice to meet you, Harvey, and it's nice okay. to see you, Nathan. It's been a little yeah, while. Yeah, nice to see you, Liza. Yeah, this is a great group to get together, Ben. You've got such good people on, on your uh, streams all the time. So uh, Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Really yeah, Ben, always a pleasure. Some of my favorite people in the world. Okay, let's hope let's, let's that by midnight we can... Open a bottle of champagne or something. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. That would be nice. Um, so how – actually, real quick, before you guys go, I mean, does anybody have a sense of uh, of how big a problem it is if, uh, if if Trump does win Florida like it looks like he will right now? Like like how um, how how central is that to the most possible paths for Biden? I, I don't think it's I don't I'll be I'll be silly and say we'll give him Florida we'll take Texas how's that uh, <laughs> but Texas is still like Texas is a really hopeful thing but it is a long shot right right uh, yeah. I mean that, like it's very exciting how close it is um, yeah. because that shows a really long term change in potential in the, in this country's politics right. um, but it it might not happen tonight. Yeah. Yeah, right. I, my my sense is that it probably won't happen today. I mean, it might, uh, but it is it is close enough right now that that in the next couple of cycles, you know, who knows? I mean, even um, I mean, look, the fact that Beto O'Rourke, who turned out to be a complete loser, uh, came as close as he did in Texas, uh, I know. <laughs> definitely I know. says something. Everyone and their mom wasted money on sending <laughs> sending it to him, but yeah. <laughs> Exactly. All right. Uh, thank All you. Right. I'll see you, Ben. Thank Thanks you, for having us on. Oh, thank yeah. you, Harvey. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Hi, Jane. Uh, you are muted right now. I'm unmuted now. How's it going, Ben? Oh, it is going okay. Let me uh, let me see where Doug is. All right. Might have to wait a uh, few minutes on Doug, uh, but um, how? Uh, so let's see. So um, so just before we uh, we came on, um, it's uh, there. We were talking about Florida, which uh, just literally like two minutes ago on the New York Times flipped over to Trump, although that has been what they're projecting. Um, and uh, what people are saying in chat, at least, is that it doesn't really seem like, um, you know, I don't know, at least several people in chat seems to think that it's not really a must win for Biden. It was a must win for Trump, that if that if uh, that if Biden had won uh, Florida, then that would have been cause for early celebration because because that would have shown that it was pretty much over. Uh, but uh, but that uh, but that it's more that Trump needed it than Biden needed it. So I hope that's true. We will see. 
I mean, I've never really had much faith in Florida. I have family uh, in-laws down in the Panhandle in Matt Gates' uh, district in Pensacola. And uh, it's a pretty Republican state. And I think the uh, Hispanic population is very particular. And, you know, a lot of people were projecting Florida, but I just, you know, I just can't believe it. You know, after 2018, when the, the gubernatorial election, when Andrew Gillum lost, at that point, I was like, I don't think Florida is uh, is flipping anytime soon. I mean, I've off, been off the opinion, this is going to be a very close race. And I think Biden is going to get a bigger popular vote margin than Hillary did. But I think the way the Electoral College mathematics works means that the Republicans have a shot and a pretty good shot at you know winning by perhaps just two electoral college votes or or something like that. I have I don't know. I guess I've been uh, very pessimistic about uh, about the chances of Democrats winning simply because of the way that the country's uh, electoral mathematics works. Yeah. So um, hold on. Yeah, uh, no, I think that's I think that's probably well, whatever. I mean, as we see, uh, it turns out that you were uh, that you that that it looks like you were right. I suppose based on the actual count, it's not entirely impossible that it could flip again, uh, but uh, but it does look. Um, but I believe it's not it's not projected to. I, I think um, I think that uh, I think that Trump's got it. Uh, hey, Doug, what are you drinking? I'm drinking some bullet whiskey. Uh, okay, now I know my bullet. Is that the uh, bullet bourbon or the bullet rye? Bourbon. Okay, very good. That's 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 a that's a nice solid, uh, you know, thing to drink for uh, an American election coverage. Yeah, I'm um, unaware of what's going on. I've been on live streams uh, talking as a pundit about something <laughs> I knew nothing about. So, what's going on? Is uh, who's favored in Florida? What's going on um, in Georgia? Who's winning okay. in Pennsylvania? What does Nate <laughs> Silver have to say? Oh my God! Go ahead. Well, I don't know. Uh, I don't know about Nate. Um, was uh, uh, earlier the, earlier in the stream? I was I was reminiscing about my um, uh, brief acquaintance with him in in the, in the uh, mid nineties. Uh, um, you know when we both uh, went to East Lansing High School and, I, and overlapped on the East Lansing High School debate team for a year, but uh, mm -hmm. in uh, but I have not been following his uh, his, his projections uh, tonight. Um, so, um, as like just a few minutes ago, Florida flipped over to Trump. Uh, Biden had been winning, but very narrowly, mm. and now it's like eighty percent or something in, and uh, and Trump is winning now. And apparently, that's not projected to change. It looks like it looks like Trump won Florida. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, the discussion uh, we were. You know, we were having a couple minutes ago with about how big a problem that is, uh, and and I'm not was, worried. Oh, I you're mean, not worried? No, I think Pennsylvania is where it's going to matter. I oh, I kind of always thought Trump was going to win Florida, um, but Pennsylvania. If if Trump wins Pennsylvania, then start shaking in your boots, as is, is what I uh, would say. But you know, on the other hand, I, I am um, a Kanye voter in, in my heart. So <laughs> I'm not that vested. A, uh, um, a, a Biden voter on the actual uh, on the actual ballot, but a Conway voter in your heart. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Uh, well, I'm a non voter, so. Oh, there you go. I don't, uh, well, I didn't get the right for that. Get, so, but, I get to pay all the taxes and have none of the uh, none of the uh, pleasure of voting. None yeah, of the representation. Which, yeah. Which is, Ta which that's is, taxation without you should you know what I've heard of this uh, point in history where that caused a revolution when there was yeah. taxation without representation. I wouldn't stand for that shit. Um, so yeah, but what do you feel? Do you are you are you worried at this point, Gene? I mean, I'm I've been I've been predicting a Trump squeaker through the electoral college. Uh, that's been my thought, but I live in the middle of Missouri. So like, this is Trump country. Mm -hmm. um, people really like Trump here. 
And then there's a whole bunch of people who are in kind of independents, but kind of in the bag for Trump. They worry about cancel culture, you know. They, well, you know, I'm that that stuff that, kind I of worry about that stuff every day. I wake up every morning. Quaking like, oh, have I been canceled yet? And then always disappointed that it hasn't happened. Yeah. Um, well, uh, certainly take the taxation without representation point. Actually, I have a uh, article uh, in uh, Jacobin that came out this morning uh, called "Let Everyone Vote," uh, where where I do a little bit of back the envelope math. I saw that. I was very a, uh, a figure of well over thirty million people uh, who of voting age who live in the United States who aren't legally allowed to vote in American elections for one reason or another, uh, prisoners, green card holders, ex felons, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, undocumented immigrants, you know, mm -hmm. so, um, which, um, is, is an interesting, um, is an interesting question because of course, if you're just willing to be like bluntly illiberal about it and just say like, uh, you know, polities get to determine, you know, who gets the special privilege, of, uh, of of participation, then I guess you're fine with it. Uh, but almost nobody would actually come out and openly say that. You know, I mean, some some neo reactionary weirdos on the internet, but that's about it, right? Every, everybody else, in principle, would say that they believe in the you know moral equality of all human beings, and and everybody has basic right to democratic self government. But then somehow, we're cool with uh, with 30 million plus people uh, not being able to legally vote, right? Like so, for example, people in Gene's position. Um, uh, you know, green card holders, we're talking about people who uh, have been in the United States for at least five years. You know, you have to be before you can even apply uh, for, le for legal permanent residence. People who've been living in the United States for at least five years have made that application. Their application has been granted. Uh, they legally have a right to keep living here for, for the, you know, foreseeable future. Uh, but they're not allowed to uh, vote to uh, elect the representatives who make the laws they're expected to follow. Uh, and 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 it's it's a, it's just a bizarre thing that we just all accept as if this were completely normal. Uh, and uh, people rarely bother to make arguments to defend it. In fact, when they do, you can really tell that they're out of practice. You know that like that they they have no idea how to go about it because it just sort of seems like oh that's that's the way things are. Surely that's okay. Um, but uh, but yeah, I mean I, I think it's certainly an issue we should make a bigger deal of. I the uh, the electoral electoral college and the senate and things like that. Those are kind of the gateway drugs to sort of getting people to believe that not all votes are equal. Because you know you you, you know when you get down to argue with people about well the electoral college is pretty bad or the senate is pretty bad. None of the arguments that come out really make that much sense in in, in a democratic sense. Right? There's a whole bunch of. Uh, reasons to do with i don't know some people you know iowa produces corn so therefore they should their vote should count more well i think it has to do with trying to wait to to um count every collective as a, as a some sort of unit rather than all the individuals in it maybe like mm -hmm. like the communities uh need to be balanced out rather than every individual standing atomized on their own is that the best argument for the electoral college that there are All different right. blocks of interest in different parts of the country. Yeah, you, guys, you, guys, you guys pursue this. I'm gonna have to. Uh, I'm, I can still hear you. I have to get off uh, for uh, for a minute. There's a uh, there's a pizza ordering issue. I need to sort out oh, with my wife. All right, right. it's election but, night. But, uh, pizza yes. ordering. So uh, so I will be back. You guys continue. I mean, would, I, I, I wouldn't agree. that be the the uh, the the argument for it? Yeah, I mean, the argument comes down to. All these states are different, therefore they need to be balanced out within the system and and, and so on and so forth. But then mm -hmm. the question comes like, how much balancing out do you need to do? They have a preponderance in the Senate, they have a preponderance in the Electoral College, and the original function when you really did have vast differences between uh, states, I think, you know, made some sense, but now given the disparity in size between states and the relatively homogeneous national culture that exists in America. Everybody has a McDonald's and a, you know, they watch the same TV and things like that. I think that argument is a lot weaker than it perhaps would have been years ago. But yeah, you know, I mean, it, I guess it's a matter of um, not just cultural difference, but also maybe blocks of economic interests. And those may be less pronounced than they were. They certainly probably are. Um, but yeah, I'm not really for the electoral college. I was just trying to play devil's advocate as to 
what yeah, no, I think I mean people have arguments for it, but a lot of the time there's a kind of pseudo democratic argument being made where it's like, well, this is more representative of the American people when in fact it's not more representative of the American people. Not oh, certainly not if you just take the American people as, as a, a population, as a, you know, of, of individuals. Ab absolutely not, right? I mean and, and if we're gonna privilege voters, why privilege those living in small states? Why not privilege African Americans, for example, or let's privilege women, or you know, there's any other way you could gerrymander the American population and make a case that well, perhaps there should be special representation for a particular community. So well, I what... disagree there about about saying that the gender of a person is more puts them into a more coherent community of interest, or the race of a person puts them into a coherent. Uh, uh, you know, community of interest than their geographical location and and the industry that dominates that area. I mean, I don't think the black people in in the South have the same economic uh, or even cultural interests as black people in New York City. Uh, no, but e even within states, you have vast differentials between the economic interests of certain groups. Like in, in Missouri, you know, you have highly industrialized you know former industrial cities like st louis you have like financial centers like kansas city uh and then you have large agriculture so you have these like vastly different um economic groups i mean but it is what it is that's the system and people yeah, have yeah. To play by the no, i think it should be revised but i don't think it should be revised along the lines of Oh, no, I'm, racial I'm votes, <laughs> you know. If I, if I was uh, if I was picking an electoral system for the president, it would be a popular vote where you have to have a runoff and, and somebody has to get fifty percent. No, that, that would makes, be that makes sense. That would make sense, and they do that in several states. I think they do that in uh, in uh, Louisiana for the governor. I, I don't know where else they do it. But they Ultimately, do. though, I don't think um, a formal change in the voting. Um, it would really undo the problems that are producing people like Trump. Like, no, uh, probably not. Probably not. I mean, we're uh, the American system is. I mean, America suffers from the high equilibrium trap, right? You know, th there's been so much success in the past. There is an inertia to do any kind of reform that includes reform to the political system, but also reform to the economic system. You have, you know, if you had a bunch of smart elites in charge now, they would be adopting some kind of social democratic program in order to take some of the air out the tires of the pressure that's coming in the in the country. But what we're having is just elites becoming greedier and greedier. And um, do you think the conditions have changed to make uh -huh. um, social democratic policies feasible from the standpoint of capital, the better, the better approach to managing capital rather than um, a demand that the working class should make out of their own self-interest. I mean, I, I mean, my personal opinion. I mean, I don't know what you think, Doug, but I think because well, no I think so, that no, I, I think yeah, because there's no <laughs> Soviet <laughs> Union, and there's no, and you know, history is apparently ended. There's nothing, you know, there's nothing that capital feels it needs to compete with in the same way that it had to in the 1930s, 40s, 50s. And, and, and things like that. So I think the international conditions are particularly unfavorable because what's the alternative to to the United States? If people look at China, which you know, you China. Look at China, but it's, uh, sure. it's superficially it looks like a very capitalistic society. Well, I think deeply it is, and and I I think that uh, you don't think it's a deformed worker state. No, not at all. <laughs> no, I don't even know what that means. Uh, yeah. Uh, so so. I mean, I, I get the idea that there is a there's a limit at at which the expansion of social democracy becomes more than the system can can take. I think that like maybe arguably, like Sweden in the seventies, uh, you know, was 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 approaching that. You know, that that's part of why uh, some of that was uh, was was rolled back. That uh, that actually the the bargaining power of workers got got so. Um, got so good, you know, because because of the welfare state and militant unionism. Uh, that, that just for the sake of, of rates of profit, you know, they, they had to really push it back. Uh, but, um, you know, the, the United States, um, you know, we, we have to go a long, 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 long way 
to to approach the limits uh, of, of what capitalism could take i don't know i mean i think the neoliberal turn was about the limits of what could profitable profitably be taken and the deregulation of of uh, the united states and the, the stripping away of the welfare state was a response so, so you, to so the you, economic limits so you, so you think that like the united states in the 70s was running up against those limits yeah that the recession of the 70s made it necessary to change the approach that the boom was over after world war ii and it, it became necessary to strip away the advances that were made you know in concession to a you know a socialist movement to try to squelch a, a socialist movement the concessions were made that were possible to make during the post-war boom that uh, just became less and less feasible uh, when the recession took hold. And I don't think we've seen a return to the substantial kind of boom that we saw after so, World War II so, since. So one problem with that narrative is that now you have to explain uh, what's what's different uh, about about all these these countries that uh, that have um, that that still have to this day, right? You know, uh, vastly more uh, social democracy. Than the than the U.S. has right now, or that the well, US I mean, what's has, different right? is the the role like in Canada, the world. For example, I mean, the, the the what's different between like let's say Sweden in the United States or even the U.K. Or, or, or just States. Canada in the United States or Canada in the United France States. In the United States, sure, is um the amount of military spending and the role that the United States plays in the world stage. I think is would be a big part of what would be different. Um, and you know, on the one hand. Uh, the United States benefits greatly from that. On the other hand, so do uh, the allied states that don't have to to to, to do that military spending. Um, so uh, I, I think that that you know I I do think that the United States military role on in the world has an economic function that stabilizes the system, um, and that if you strip that away. You would find that you know it. There may be something else that arises, another world power that arises to play a similar role, but um, that that would probably mean that a lot of some of the social democratic um, uh, spending that's done in in Europe would no longer be possible, or wouldn't be as possible in in China. That there are some limits to what you can do. Yeah, maybe. I, I, I'm I'm just very skeptical about uh, about reverse engineering what the limits are. Just from what's uh, what, what's achieved, and assuming that we're that um, assuming that we are or were uh, at those limits, uh, I, I think that that just kind of takes um, uh, takes class struggle out of the equation. Uh, in, 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 it just in way, changes in way, class struggle from it, being it, uh, it, uh, aimed at. It's, it's, it's just analytically wrong, right? If we had an incredibly powerful uh, organized working class. And you know, then I would believe that uh, that that you know that what existed was a good indication of the limits of what the system could bear. But uh, but but we don't, right? I mean, like the actual the actual incentive to bump up against those limits is like non-existent right now. But also, and also, I would say the uh, I mean, the United States' military spending I don't think precludes the creation of some kind of social democratic state in the United States. You know, yes, the Amer United States has. Uh, you know, has this extra cost of underwriting the global system with its military power and subsidizing you know, international trade by protecting sea lanes and so on and so forth. But at the same time, the United States enjoys a uh, dominance as you know, possessing the world's currency. So I think I think there's definitely, you know, uh, theoretically there's some limits we could reach. But I think the primary obstacle to any kind of social democratic reforms in the United States come down to the political superstructure and the peculiar setup of the American system, which ha which more closely resembles an authoritarian democracy like Turkey or even Iran to a certain extent, in, in that it places very strict limits on how uh, how politics can be played out. The, you know, when you talk about a two party system, this wasn't something I appreciated until I moved to the United States. Political parties in the United States aren't like political parties in Europe. They're more like uh, wings of the state, which are gatekeepers to political power. In Britain, you know, political parties, uh, you know, they have institutional influence, but uh, but you know, ultimately, their strength comes to uh, comes from 
having you know a con a geographical concentration. So parties like the Scottish Nationalists, the Welsh Nationalists, because they have a geographical concentration, could overwhelm the system and enter the political system. But the United States' mm -hmm. political system is particularly backwards. It's you know to use the to use an analogy, it's a combined uneven development, a very kind of like advanced system for the late 18th century. But it's a system that has been, you know, uh, that has become increasingly fallen behind. You know, when the United States and Britain rewrote the German Constitution after the Second World War, they didn't import the American Constitution because it's so backwards. And now, uh, you know, the Constitution has. What do you, what what aspects of the American Constitution are particularly backward? I mean, I think the Senate is particularly backward, and that has an enormous influence on on what can get passed. And I think, you know, the nature of American federalism, it, you know, is particularly backwards in that, you know, it, it creates, the, you know, there are good aspects to federalism, but um, I think it creates a, a kind of inertia that makes reform difficult in the United States. So, I mean, I think the Senate, the judiciary, there's a whole bunch of things in the United States, which I think act as important limits on, on democratic reform and move towards so, the social democracy. And it's, I think it's, there's a blockage because the ability to change that constitution requires, you know, elements that benefit the most from. But, but wouldn't you say that, as far as political organizing goes, what is limiting the the masses uh, from organizing an alternative um, is is structural and not like like it's it's not as though like if you mm -hmm. compare like we have the right to assemble, we have the right to free speech, we have the right to form political parties. Those don't exist in 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 the same way in the countries that you mentioned. I don't think that and uh, or they haven't always. Um, so I feel like we have a, some liberties to to rectify the institute the structural problems that are taking place at the political level. Well, so, um, so I, I think I think probably the distinction is that the U.S. Uh, is pretty decent on uh, on. Uh, liberal rights, right? You know, things, things like uh, things like the rights that you're talking about, but we're we're probably pretty bad at the uh, democracy half. Like, like that's the uh, well, right? The structure of our democracy, especially, in, you know, you can see it with the presidential election, and you mentioned the Senate, and you know, is such that it puts real constraints on on what can easily be done. It's like the card check with unions, right? You know, right. like we we can we can unionize. We don't have we have the right. We have labor laws that give us rights, but then uh, the process itself is set up to make it extremely difficult to actually accomplish. And um, and so, you know, one of the things that the union movement has to do is overcome politically those restrictions. And so uh, it, in the case of getting rid of the Senate or even just dismantling the Electoral College, it seems like you have a... Uh, a, uh, almost a catch twenty-two. You're not going to be able to get the political power together to get rid of the Senate or right. the, or the electoral right, right. college. Yeah, so getting rid of that's them. That's precisely that's precisely the point. Where in other countries, there are you know mechanisms to change the constitution that are perhaps a little bit more manageable. The American system is so di it's so difficult. And in addition to that, the American Constitution has an almost cult-like existence today, which is not historically necessarily the case you know it has become and I, i've said this to, to to bed before it's become like a sharia law right you know sharia law is can be interpreted that's just so out, outside the bounds of what i uh, you know it's so counterintuitive but like, why, why do i say that it, in a discursive sense when someone when somebody in the middle east says sharia law it's not like something concrete very often that they're asking for. It's an appeal to a just legal order, a fair legal order. You know, when, uh, you know, after the Iranian revolution, they had a referendum like, do you want an Islamic Republic, which is, you know, within the discourse of, uh, of Iran at the time, that's like, do you want a constitutional republic? The, the question is, what does Sharia law look like? The question is, what does the constitution look like? So people appeal to the constitution, not because of any specific rights, but because it becomes like an emotional thing. And so any move to change it is seen as like some kind of fundamental attack on identity. It becomes like an identity issue rather than a pragmatic political concern. You look at liberals, you know, liberals are getting absolutely hammered, but they still appeal to the constitution for legitimacy, right? It's like, you know, the, the Supreme Court, although, I mean, you know, 
They don't want to change the Supreme Court. They don't want to upset the system because, you know, the Constitution is such a foundational ideology. It's become such so ossified in a kind of sense, in, in a sense. People don't look at it as a practical yeah. Well, well, and, and even the and even things that aren't in the Constitution, but uh, well, many people assume are in the Constitution. Or yeah, I mean, packing the courts wouldn't be unconstitutional. No, packing the courts wouldn't be unconstitutional. In fact, um, just uh, just declaring uh, that the Supreme Court doesn't have the power of judicial review wouldn't be unconstitutional. It's nowhere that power is nowhere hinted at in the Constitution. The court seized it for itself with Marbury versus Madison. Um, and, uh, and, and so you could just, just not have the Supreme court as this weird super legislature, uh, you know, I often think of it as to, you know, same style of analogy that Jane was just appealing to is something like the, um, uh, American capitalism guardianship council. Uh, and, uh, you know, like, like you could just not have it in that role and that would be, you know, that would be consistent with the constitution. It's almost like this is one of the you know, like uh, Quranic surahs or something that, you know, that, that like we just, we just have this tradition uh, that the, uh, that the Supreme Court plays this role that we, that we associate uh, with, with the constitution. Uh, and, and it's very unfortunate, I think also too, because we tend to, um, I think we tend to popularly associate the constitution with, uh, with a few good parts. Uh, like uh, there are good things in the constitution. I certainly, uh, you know, what no, it, no, there, there, there are, but the problem is that we like we really that like so much discourse about the Constitution is just about those things, as if that were the main point, right? Like, like it's it's in fact so much of it is about the amendments to the Constitution. Uh, never mind that you wouldn't need these amendments in the first place uh, if uh, mm -hmm. if any of that stuff were in the the main document, right? It's 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 non coincidentally. Uh, not right. The the uh, the the purpose of the Constitution was to create a relatively stable uh, central power uh, with enough federalism that it'd be really hard to change anything. So CNN has not called Florida for Trump yet uh, on their main page. Where are you guys getting the Florida has gone to? Uh, New York Times. So okay. uh, it just updated. It's still relatively narrow. It says uh, Trump fifty point five. And Biden forty eight point five. Uh, I'm not sure what percent we're at reporting, uh, but it does for whatever it's you know for whatever it's worth. The um, the new the needle on the website uh, says um, gives Trump more than a ninety five percent chance of of winning Florida at this point. Um, it was it was eighty percent. Oh wow, ninety percent reporting. So. It's not impossible, but I think it's yeah. uh, it's it's very unlikely that he would win Florida. Um, let's see. Uh, so uh, Pennsylvania um, right now is eighty four point one percent Biden, but it's also three percent reported, so I wouldn't take that very seriously. Um, so I just want to say, if, if Florida uh, in for Trump, his chances according to Nate Silver and the little interactive map of winning yeah. the election has jumped from 10% to 33%. Oh. And then if you go and you add, did I see Kentucky has already gone to him? Let me go to CNN. Yeah, Kentucky went to, was called. Yeah, so S Kentucky, Tennessee, is that for him now too? I'm just, I love playing like I'm on, on TV, you know, like I'm a pundit or something here. Let's see, uh, yeah, Tennessee and Indiana. So, uh but those called and anything for for Biden called? Oh. Yeah, you got um, a couple for Biden. You've got uh, Vermont and Massachusetts for Biden. Yeah, right. And uh, anything else? See. Oh, yeah, there's uh, Maryland, I think. Right. Um, so with that, it looks like, according to Nate Silver, still 33 percent chance for Trump winning the election. Yeah, which of course that was uh, that was where Nate had it uh, just before the election started in, in 2016 uh, was was 33 percent for um, uh, for Trump, uh, which is uh, lots of people were were upset at him after that because uh, his probability is counterintuitive to most people. Uh, there are lots of good reasons to to dislike. Um, 
uh, Nate Silver uh, in terms of his like annoying centrist uh, horse right commentary bleeding into just regular uh, political commentary. Uh, but uh, but even in retrospect, that seems about right to me that it was that Trump had about a one in three chance of winning the 2016 election. Um, and sometimes unlikely things happen. That's how probability works. I mean, I remember um, driving to uh, from New Jersey into Brooklyn to go to the Chapo live show on election night and on the radio. Um, they were saying, oh, well, for Trump to win, he would have to win uh, Michigan and Wisconsin and Pennsylvania. And, you know, what are the chances of that? So um, and the chances are, you know, 33%. Yeah, 33%. <laughs> <laughs> right. um, the government says that there's a 33% chance that's going to rain and it rains. He wasn't lying to you. Right. Uh, so, and, and Pennsylvania uh, right now is 64% uh, favored towards Biden, according to, you know, the model. And so, but if we give that to Trump, um, Trump became, if we give Pennsylvania to Trump, Trump has an 83% chance of winning the election. There we go. Four more years of bad jokes. Oh my God. Can you, and, and those, uh, that genre of Twitter comedy where people do fake, do the miming for the Trump voice. <sighs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't take four more years of that. I'm going to have I kind of like the lady who does that. She, she was okay at first, but you know, it's, it's, it's yeah. I saw the one where she did the the bleach uh bit, you know, where he's talking about injecting bleach and she did the voiceover for it and or she lip synced it. I thought that was pretty hilarious, but then I get, saw like two or three more and I was like, okay, that's it gets funny. tired pretty quickly. <laughs> yeah, did, but did she, uh, get a, did she get a, a Netflix special? Did she for that? Really? Where's my <laughs> Netflix special, Gene? Where's my where's my big deal? Once we once we uh, you know once we do our um, online well, role play thing, yeah, maybe we can we can pitch a new Star Trek series to uh, to whoever oh, yeah, makes yeah. Star Trek because they're making tons of Star Trek series now. So yeah, uh, we, we can could, we could pitch sure. it. Yeah, yeah, it's in, in Star my... Trek workers commune. Yes, that's right. Oh man, that's great. Yeah, and and my kid will play the mascot. I don't know what the hell does that mean? What does what does that mean? He's been playing a retro nineteen. Uh, he's been playing Fallout, right. which is kind of nineteen fifties aesthetic post apocalyptic game. Yeah, I'm, I'm I'm vaguely aware of it. You know, I so, keep yeah, some that's, tabs. That's on. where he's got that from. He's like he wants to be the the pit boy that they have. The, the little. I played that game briefly, but it was super boring, so I I didn't really go through it very much. But. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so in that game, you're allowed to pick your character as the mascot for the series or for the... No, game. but everything... Ha there's all the robots are like uh, 1950s greeters, like, welcome to the world of tomorrow kind of things. Oh, I see. It's, it's no, a I see. So he's basing his robot on the ro robots in Fallout. Yeah, I think I think that's what's going on right there. Yeah. And on the 8th, we're going to do a, the first of our uh, communist role-playing game series what what did i call it the uh, zero quest zero quest yeah and uh uh we're gonna play mother uh, ship and then we're gonna play a game of comrade we're gonna play comrades that. yeah which is the specifically comp com communist role play game right yeah that will be a lot of fun and ben i expect you to learn how to play a role playing game and join us as a <laughs> celebrity leftist guest yeah i've actually sure. never in my life played a role playing game but um it's really hard to believe i think you're lying yeah, it, <laughs> it's super hard to believe. Yeah, I find that super. Hard. <laughs> yeah, you're did too busy have... like collecting Pokemon cards or something to play role. Uh, I never games? did. Never did that either. Yeah, I, magic uh, the role playing. I don't, I don't know what to tell you. I mean, I've, I've, uh, um, yeah. I mean, I never really, I never really did any of that stuff. I mean, I, I did nerdy things, just not those nerdy things. What, what nerdy things did you do, Ben? Like I read science fiction novels. Okay, like that. well, that's good. <laughs> for, for like ben, he, encourages. It's like okay that's good yeah. <laughs> what uh, what science fiction did you read uh, the, you know, he's a science oh, fiction writer burgess is he was a science uh, fiction I, yeah, author. Not, not lately but uh but i but i have um i uh, actually had a publication in uh tour.com back in uh, 2013 uh which is the last um uh oh thank you uh very much, La Fin Absolute Demand yeah. for the uh, for the super sticker. Um, oh uh, wow, 
I guess this must be an East Lansing person in the chat. Uh, yeah, okay. So I did. So uh, it refers to the fortress in El. I think I did go there, but not to not for role playing stuff. Um, I uh, just to buy comic books, which is also something I did. But. Yeah, that's that's a legitimate nerd activity. Zero Quest, by the way, is a reference. Is it a reference to Hero Quest? It's a or reference to Harmon Quest. Harmon Quest. Okay, Harmon <laughs> Quest. And Harman. Yeah, yeah. I actually did go see a. Uh, I did see a um, when I was visiting my brother in Los Angeles years ago. Uh, <laughs> and thank you for the super chat. Uh, ben, are you an action figure guy? No, I, I was never that. There should be a Ben. Maybe Bruce. Somebody should figure. make a Ben action figure. There should be like uh, a yeah. uh, progressive YouTube left action figures, and I think Ben definitely would deserve one. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, but uh, but yeah, um, let's see. Uh, what was I going to say? Uh, yeah, I mean, science fiction. I mean, it's all. I mean, the stuff that's coming to mind is stuff that I read much more recently. Uh, than, than any of this, um, you know, than, than when I was like growing up. Um, so I'm trying to. I'm what trying have you been reading recently? Um, so relatively recently, uh, then. Um, so I think uh, Ken McLeod uh, is a is a Scottish science fiction writer that I like. Uh, he um, uh, he wrote a series of books called the uh, the Fall Revolution. Um, uh, Ian Banks, uh, mm -hmm. the, uh, uh, read some of those, a couple of the uh, the culture books. I've also read some of his realist fiction, which I also liked. Um, I guess right now I'm just naming Scottish people. I don't know why. Uh, they, uh, Are you a fan of Ursula Le Guin? Uh, you know, I actually have read very little Ursula Le Guin, which is weird because uh, uh, she's such a big name. But I... Like there's act there's an Ursula Le Guin short story that I'll sometimes assign in philosophy classes, the ones who walk away from Omelas, but uh but but I've I've read I actually haven't read any of the big any of Ursula Le Guin's novels. Have you read The Lathe of Heaven or or No, no, I haven't read any of her novels. I I, I don't know why not. It's, it's, it's weird. I, I was I was a huge in terms of people who are like big name people, I, I was a giant Philip K. Dick fan. Like I, yeah. I read tons of Philip K. Dick books back in the day. Uh, I I was low key obsessed with uh, Vallis uh, and yeah. uh, uh, read uh, yeah read a bunch of the others. I also read a couple. Is that of your books. favorite Philip K. Dick uh, Vallis? Uh, it is, yeah. Uh, Me which, too. Which I, I think yeah, like it's it's very. Um, I mean, I guess I guess it probably it's probably significant, right? Because I, I read it the first time when I was a teenager, and it's it's very philosophy heavy, and uh, and so it was, it was probably you know, probably says something that, that I was into it even then. Um, I had uh, <laughs> all, um, I shouldn't say shit like this on stream, but whatever. I, I, the, uh, after the, uh, I'm drinking more uh, on the, uh, it, you know, I, I read Vowels the first time I was a teenager and, and like, I, I, I was kind of into it, but I didn't know what to make of it. And, and I read it again. Um, and in, in my twenties after, after uh, tripping the first time and yeah, uh, and and I got more out of it then, right? Um, but, um, but yeah, I, that that is my favorite. I, I think it's also like weird because it's like, I think it probably says something about me that it is my favorite uh, and you, I guess, because the uh, because it's a sort of combination of being. Uh, oh, uh, thank you so much, Adored Priya, for the uh, super chat. Uh, mm -hmm. so, um, but it's uh, it's not a because um, it's both like very like gonzo conceptually like out there but also in a weird way it's almost a realist novel uh right. like, like, like it's mostly about just like processing grief and arguing with his friends and uh right right and, yeah. and, you know things like that yeah, uh, yeah, yeah um no it's a it's 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 really good but it i think it's a one of those books that divides the Philip K. Dick fandom. Like there are either people who like Vallis or like the man in the high castle or. Well, I, I, like, I like man in the high castle. Well, I like that too, but I'm just saying like your favorite is like one of those kinds of books. I'm not sure yeah. if it's. Yeah, no, I, 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 can, I, can, I can see that. Yeah. No, Vallis is definitely my favorite. Uh, there, um, some of the other stuff that's, I like, uh, I guess is somewhat similar, like thematically, like, um, Scanner Darkly and uh, and flow my uh, tears. The policeman said, "My second uh, favorite would be um, Time Out of Joint." You read that know, one? I don't think I have. That's it. the one where it's like deconstructionist. He goes around 
his little fifties town and, and uh, like he goes up to a lemonade stand and the stand disappears. And all that's left is a little note card that says lemonade stand on it. And he realizes that the fifties town he's living in is a facade that he's being brainwashed by airplanes that are flying overhead to believe that it's the fifties when really it's 1984 or something like that or 1993, actually something somewhere the far future, you know, and uh, yeah, that's a good one. Time at a joint. Cool. Yeah, no, I'll, uh, that that sounds good. I'll check. Uh, yeah, should, should, we, uh, should check that out. Before uh, I joined your live stream, I, I was actually talking to a guy named Ankur Dianmote, who's a kind of a psychedelic explorer, and he's a, a biologist as well. And and we were talking about Nick Bostrom's uh, simulation theory, and uh, you know, and Vallis came up in that conversation as well. Um, but the whole reason I thought of it was like. Four years ago, it seemed like um, everyone believed for a moment we were living in a simulation when Trump got elected. Yeah. <laughs> so I was wondering if we we're going to feel that way again tonight. Yeah, I think I think less so if Trump wins again. I mean, that, yeah, because I, I, I thought about that a lot because the three times in my life when I've had most of that that feeling. Ah, thank you very much, Brock, uh, for the uh, for the super chat. Uh, just says choo choo. Uh, but, uh, uh, but yeah, the three times in my life I've most felt like that, um, were, uh, nine 11. Uh, I'm old enough that I was in college when that happened. Uh, and, um, and I, uh, I guess I would have graduated if I hadn't taken a year off, but I, I was still in college at that point. Um, or no, I, I wouldn't have quite graduated. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Nine 11 Trump went in and the COVID lockdown starting, right? Th those were, those were the three times that I, I felt like this, this um, this feels like something that would happen in a dystopian novel, not something that would happen in real life. Yeah, uh, but but I think now that now that Trump already won once, I don't think him just winning again would be quite enough to trigger that feeling. Certainly not in me. Um, uh, thank you very much for uh, for the super chat, Daniel. Wow, that's a nice one. Yeah, we get all super chats. I think people like the science fiction uh, science fiction talk. <laughs> yeah, I'm yeah. getting out of it. Uh, right after after this election. Actually, so another, bring, another good bring, political. Oh, sorry. I bring bad luck to countries because, literally, you know, three days before I, you know, maybe a week or two before I moved to Iraq for my job, ISIS took over Mosul. So you know, and then I got a job here in 2016. I moved here, and Trump became president. So I, <laughs> right. when I moved from Turkey back to England after living in Turkey. The Tories got elected, so I bring reactionary forces with me wherever I go. Yeah, I knew it. You're you're a crypto fascist. You're bringing in these people with you. It's the typhoid Mary of uh, right wing demagoguery. I told I, my, my family that when I voted for Biden, I said, you know, I've never voted for the winning candidate ever. <laughs> okay, so we have two theories about why uh, Trump why may Trump be winning, right? but it's probably not, right? Yeah, probably not, but he might. Uh, we're up to thirty-three percent. Seventy percent. Anything could happen. Yeah, um, I was just going to say while I was thinking about it, another good uh, political novel that I've always liked, uh, Jane, science fiction novel, is uh, China Mountain Zhang by uh, Maureen McHugh, mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, set in a world where, uh, like, cultural revolution era China uh, is the dominant power in the world, and and. Um, uh, and and America has a has a communist government that's 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 aligned with it, and um, and and it's an interest. It's a really interesting novel. Like in some ways, it's like kind of like a quiet realist novel. Even uh, that that's Probably a Ben Shapiro novel. <laughs> yeah, it would be a Ben Shapiro novel if uh, if it were like being played as a straightforward dystopia. But it's really not. It's 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 just kind of like oh, this is. You know, this is how things are, and and whatever life goes on, all governments kind of suck. You know, uh, uh, there there are good things and bad things about this. Like 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 the the tone is not like like an alarmist cautionary tale. This is just sort of like oh, it's interesting how history works out sometimes. I mean, yeah, I think I think uh, that's why. I mean, I don't know if you guys enjoyed the movie Death of Stalin, but that's why oh, yeah. Death of Stalin was a good movie because it showed that you know dictatorships are absurd more than terrifying. You know, when you've been to authoritarian countries, you realize like nobody really takes the ideology seriously, like super seriously, but also they follow the rules. So, you know, it, it, 
the death of Stalin really captured that peculiar aspect, which, you know, something like the, uh, the movie version of 1984 is very scary, or you watch, you watch other dystopian movies, it's all very serious and scary. Whereas death of Stalin really captured how stupid. Oh yeah. It is. Yeah. No, I like death of Stalin a lot. Um, yeah. I, I, I actually got my uh, elderly parents to watch the death of Stalin. And as I was watching it with them, I was like, Oh wow, there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot more stuff in this movie that I was remembering that I feel slightly awkward to watch with my parents. But then, um, then they were both into it. So who knows? Mm-hmm. Uh, so speaking of movies, uh, somebody asked in the chat uh, about the uh, scanner darkly movie, which would, which I thought was excellent. It's, it's actually the only um there are, there are about 100 movies based on Philip K. Dick uh, stories and novels, and that's the only one that actually uh, feels like Philip K. Dick. Yeah, I, 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 yeah Blade right. Runner is my favorite Philip K. Dick movie. Well, I think, well, well here, here, here's my quick take, and I promise we're going to get back to the election in just a minute. Okay. <laughs> my quick take on Blade Runner. Um, actually, Ursula K. Le Guin, who uh, Gene mentioned earlier, um, so I used to subscribe like way back when like in the late 90s or something to uh the uh, magazine of fantasy and science fiction and she had a mm-hmm. column in there and i remember one of those was about uh blade runner well one of those was about uh classic science fiction novels that she wished would be turned into movies and one of the ones she mentioned was uh do androids dream of electric sheep which is the novel that blade runner is based on and she she mentioned in her list and she said yeah yeah i know about blade runner I mean, a movie of do androids dream of right, right, right. Uh, <laughs> which is exactly right. That like technically uh, most of what's in do androids dream of electric ships and blade runner. Uh, but, it, but the feel is very different. Now I actually think blade runner is probably a better movie than do androids dream of electric sheep is as a book. I mean, to a large extent, uh, blade runner is what gave us cyberpunk. Uh, but, um, but it's, it's just very different, right? Like, like in uh, like, for example, in uh to Android's Dream of Electric Sheep, you have, because the world is so depopulated and even animals are very precious, so you have universal vegetarianism. Uh, yeah. And one of the ways you tell that somebody's a robot is, is whether they're appalled by the thought of killing animals. Uh, people have, like, pets, uh, even a even like a, for example, a sheep, right? Like farm animals as pets to practice empathy with. Uh, and so people who can't afford real animals because they're so scarce have the electric ones, hence the name. Uh, you um, you have uh, everybody practices this bizarre religion called mercerism uh, right. that involves doing uh, virtual reality uh, contact with this uh, this mythic figure Mercer, who's this old man who's walking around, made hit with stones and stuff. Deckard is married in your Android Dream of Electric Sheep, and he has an unhappy marriage. Yeah, well, it's a Philip K. Dick marriage. They're all unhappy, right? I know, but I mean, like that's so yeah. far away from Harrison Ford. Yeah, so far away from the right. It should be played uh, by like Richard Dreyfus or 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 Woody Allen should play, you oh, know the. Yeah. <laughs> Hasn't has Woody Allen being canceled? Well, yes, I know, but I'm not. I'm not. That doesn't mean I can't retroactively yeah. in the past <laughs> cast yeah. him in the '80s version of Blade Runner in my head. Yeah. Well, well, I also re Woody Allen. Right. I'll say this. Um, like, because I <laughs> a few. Uh, <laughs> and now I'm getting dropped from the zero books list, but uh, the, no, not uh, at all, not at all. But I'm just uh, like we're way uh, off topic here. As Trump is no, taking no, no. America, we, we, back. we are. We're, we're gonna we're gonna, <laughs> we're gonna veer back in a minute, right? But okay. I, I was just gonna say, like several years ago, when a bunch of stuff came out, where various Allen children. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Daniel, for the super chat. We are going to steer back to the election in a second. Uh, but uh, when there were a bunch of, there were like a few articles that came out by like dueling members of, of the Woody Allen and Mia Farrow family giving dueling accounts of what happened. And I remember there was a time when I was like all fixated on it. Cause I like, I would like read these and like form opinions about who, who was probably telling the truth and whose story was more plausible than whose story. And then I just kind of had this epiphany, like, wait, I don't know any of these people. I'm never going <laughs> to any of them. Right. I, I, I don't like, clearly whatever happened in this family of total strangers is incredibly sad, no matter who you believe. Uh, right. But there's absolutely no reason it should be important to me to know what really happened. You know, uh, whether, whether Woody Allen really abused uh, uh, Dylan. Uh, Dylan or not. Um, right. You know, I mean, some people think it's important because they think that you have a moral obligation not to consume art by bad people. Uh, but I've never understood that. Like that the idea that this is some sort of punishment, for for Woody Allen that you you wouldn't um, 
you wouldn't see his his movie, which uh, which if you were going to do that, you'd have to do it in an incredibly organized way. And also, I've never really understood the principle behind doing that. So just putting that out there. But uh, let's see how the election tracker is doing. Yeah, uh, I want to say like we should take this moment for the, maybe it'll just be a brief moment in the night that we will look back on and say, ha ha ha, we were paranoid and stupid, but. Let's discuss because I only have a little bit of time before I need to, yeah. you know. I mean, I don't know when you're going to kick me off, but I, I figure maybe 10, 15 more minutes for me. But yeah, um, that's, that's, that's about how long I was planning to do this shift and then bring yeah. in David Feldman and Mark Warren on after that. But go on. Yeah. I was going to say, let's entertain the notion that Trump wins tonight. Yeah. What do you think the impact is on the on the left? Uh, I have a lot of views about this, but uh, but but I think Gene has probably had fewer chances to talk about them. So. My thought would be that liberals are going to be even more cautious and conservative. I think there's a there's a there's a faction on the left that thinks that this will accelerate things, but I think on the sort of left side of American politics, the left coalition, we'll see polarization. We'll see radicalization further to the left, so we'll see a stronger social democratic socialist wing. But I think mainstream sort of like normies are going to be even more timid about making making any change so i think that's going to have that that's my that's my general sense and i also don't think much is going to get done because all political mobilization that's going to take place after this uh, if trump wins is going to be defensive political mobilization so i mean i'm not a big believer in the kind of accelerationist argument when i look at you know when i look at history i guess i tend to see Sometimes when there's been openings, or at least there's been an opening and then a closing, or something like that. But I don't think the consolidation of Trump's presidency is going to be a particularly good thing for the left. It's also something I'm personally. Worried. Are you typing while you're talking? Because your typing is interfering with your talking, Gene. I'm not typing. My hands. Oh, weird. I'm, I'm, I'm typing. That's my fault. Oh. Uh, okay, go. I mean, my my, it's just I, uh, you know, I'm personally worried about it as a as a as an immigrant, I guess, or an expat, as I like to think of myself. But you know, in a general sense, I, you know, I think we'll see a more timid, uh, uh, centrist uh, wing of the Democratic Party dominating politics, and then I think we will see more growth on the socialist left. But I don't think that it, there's going to be progress my general thought is that you know however sort of lame obama was at least under obama's presidency you had new social movements trying to push the envelope forwards trump kind of stopped that all and so i just i have you never mean like um blm really and, and occupy wall street you're talking about under obama well, like bml occupy wall street bernie sanders's campaign i don't know if you like I don't know. I wasn't in America during the Bush years, yeah. mm -hmm. but uh, I, I wasn't either because it wasn't America know. anymore. It was some other country during the Bush years. It was unrecognizable. Yeah. I, I, mean, I, I mean, but but I think but I think that's that's clearly right, right? I mean, like one of the funny things about people who uh, we were talking about this earlier in the stream. One of the funny things about the way that some people on the left will say, "Oh, it's actually better for us if if Trump wins because if Democrat wins, everybody goes to sleep." You know, there's not like big uh, you know, people aren't protesting. It, I always think, do you, like, one of the weird things about this, granted, these are just individual data points, you know, maybe it's statistically meaningless, but at least the last couple of presidencies are a really weird fit with that view because um, very little uh, was going on in the left during the second Bush term. You know, there was the anti-war movement in the first Bush term, although that had fizzled out by the end, uh, largely because of uh, the, the perceived imperative of defeating Bush uh, which is which is what took the yeah. energy away, away from it. But under the Obama era, as Gene is saying, there was tons of stuff going on that uh, you know Black Lives Matter started, uh, Occupy Wall Street started, uh, Bernie Sanders won twenty two states, uh, and and so all of that is at least anecdotally some reason to think that it's actually better uh, for uh, for the radical left uh, if there's a centrist Democrat in office than a right wing Republican because. With a right-wing Republican in office, oppositional energy tends to focus on uh, the person of the president in a way that with the centrist Democrat in office, it's more likely to focus on at least somewhat more systematic issues, right? Whatever critique you might have of BLM, et cetera, right? You know, that it's at least about 
ongoing institutional issues more than personalities. Well, I would I would say that you know in the first, I mean, so in the in the, after the first term of Bush Jr., that yeah. the left rallied against Bush in much the same way as the, the left is rallying against Trump now. Yeah, that he was hated, and that was why everyone had to vote for Kerry, regardless of who he was, really. And um, but the difference then between then and now is that. Then we said we had to oppose Bush because of his illegal wars. Right. And now we have to oppose Trump because of Trump, mostly. It's because of Trump's character and because of a variety of different things Trump's, Trump has done, but not nearly as it's not nearly as focused politically. There wouldn't be a unifying other than, I guess, the, um, uh, the separation at the borders. Um, the separation at the border, which is, I, to my understanding, no longer a policy in any case. Um, uh, that uh, there's not really a focus on what the left is trying to stop exactly, except for Trump. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think, I think, um, I think the uh, the, uh, the the negligent response to COVID maybe filled some of that role. Yeah, well, that's people. but see, I don't even think that, that's not a left thing. Per se, no, no, it's, it's that's not. just like a rational. Like this is the first time in my life no, I've voted in my own left. interest it's against the president. Thing. Like I'm not they, voting as a leftist, as in my own interest, I want Trump out because I would like not to die of COVID. Yeah, which which, which, which is which is more or less what Richard Spencer said. He said he was voting for Biden and not for any sort of accelerationist <laughs> reason. Handle <but he laughs> COVID more confidently, <laughs> right? So Richard Spencer and I agree, and you can yeah. take that. And take that clip. Uh, yeah. Right. right. Yeah. Oh, oh fair More enough. Uh, <laughs> so for uh, for whatever it's worth, um, look at the New York Times. Um, Florida is ninety one percent reporting, and it's uh, Trump plus two. North Carolina is seventy three percent recorded reporting, and it's Biden plus four. Uh, Texas is 64% reported. It's Biden plus 1.3, but I don't believe that's going to last. I'm looking at uh, the New York Times and it says North Carolina is um, up 1.2 for Trump and it's leaning Trump, but maybe I'm. Oh, well, maybe one of us needs to refresh. Let me try refreshing and maybe it's me. Uh, oh, yeah, just refreshed and it says New uh, North Carolina Biden plus four. Um, and Ohio, Biden plus nine, uh, Georgia, Trump plus 15, although that's only 30% reporting. So I don't know if Atlanta uh, has reported yet. And Pennsylvania, okay, well, Pennsylvania, Biden plus 37, but that's 14% reporting. <laughs> Clearly, he's not going to win Pennsylvania. Well, that's going to be the deciding state, yeah. I think. With Florida in the tank for, and if it, Georgia goes to um, Trump and it's looking like it will, how much is reporting right now? 83% in Georgia? Yeah. Uh, Georgia. Hold on. What's going on? I keep refreshing, but you have more recent numbers than I have. I think so. Let me. 60, 62% and it's Trump is, no, 33% reporting. That's what I've got. From okay, the... reporting, and uh, I see an eighty-two percent probability. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We're looking at the same thing. Yeah. So, sorry, I just looking uh, at the different. Yeah. So. So. Uh, okay. Yeah. So. Oh, okay. I think that explains the North Carolina discrepancy too. So it says North Carolina Biden is ahead by four with seventy-three percent reporting, but they're still saying there's a seventy-nine percent chance uh, Trump. that Biden uh, that Trump is going to win the state. Um, right. Fair enough. So okay, yeah, there we go. So yeah, so uh, yeah, if you give Florida, Georgia, and North Carolina to Trump, um, it's a forty-eight percent chance of Trump winning the election. Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of there are a lot of bitter ironies right now since. Um, you know, one of the reasons that was made most big a deal of that we couldn't have Bernie Sanders as the nominee was that uh, his accurate statements about Cuba would mean that he would lose Florida. Um, <laughs> and uh, and then also um, we've got uh, also one of the, wor the worrying things is it looks like Biden is really underperforming with Hispanics, which are a group that Bernie generally, you know, outside of Florida did very well with. Um, yeah. So 
I remember watching on Rising, uh, both uh, hosts uh, uh, said that uh, that if if Trump wins, it will be because of the Hispanic and black vote. Yeah, uh, which would be, uh, man, actually, that would be really interesting. Uh, now, granted, I mean, to be clear, when we say that, we're still talking about very small percentages, but um, sure, yeah, I, I think, um, you know, it doesn't take much to be way better, you know, than than, than before. Yeah. And, uh, although Trump did, uh, Trump did outperform Romney, I believe, with both groups, not that. Yeah, he far. did. And it, it's going to be like. It was something like 30% of Hispanics supported Trump in 2016 and a little bit more are now. Um, Which did quite well with Hispanics too. So, I mean, people, Hispanics are a particularly heterogeneous group. Right. It's a very, not very useful terminology. And it comes down to, I think, America's obsession with racial categories, which don't always make sense. I mean, like, when we talk about black Americans, and we've talked about this before, Doug, we're actually yeah. talking about black as an ethnic group specific to America. A Nigerian obviously is black, but there's a very different background to how a right. Nigerian has. Well, 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 it's it's also it's also funny, right? Because especially the way we talk about uh, Hispanics, uh, we treat it as a racial categorization, right? You could be white, black, or Hispanic. Uh, which is certainly, at least in you know my six and a half years I lived in Miami, not the way that anybody who's from a Hispanic country that I knew thought about it. Sure. Uh, you know, like uh, you know people who look white who come from Latin American countries thought of themselves as white. Uh, they would use uh, when they were referring to um, like Anglo white people, they would say Americans to differentiate them from themselves, but they wouldn't say white like to contrast to themselves. Uh, you know, they they would they would say no. These are countries where there are white people and black people. I mean, some some of these countries actually racial hierarchy is much stricter um, and, and, and you, much more obvious uh, than and it you is. Look at Middle Eastern voters, although a smaller group of people, there's huge divides between that between the attitude of Christians and Muslims is very different, and the attitude of when people talk about American Muslims, it makes me giggle because there's a huge difference between a Pakistani and a Saudi. And you know, the way that an Iranian might look at a Pakistani Muslim would be, you know, pretty racist. So, you know, you have, uh, you have, uh, you know, a, a, amongst my sort of Kurdish, Turkish, Iranian circle of Middle Eastern people, they hate Ilhan Omar. Uh, oh, yeah? Really. Yeah. I mean, they, they hate her because they see her as an Islamist and, and this and that and the other and representing a type of Islam that they don't like. So it's you know and, and and large numbers of Muslim voters are like deeply secularist, especially the educated types who came to the West. Mm -hmm. Never heard any more anti-Muslim stuff than from Iraqi Kurds. That's you know, mm -hmm. spent five minutes with my dad and you know, very upset. So Ben, who are you talking to? That's more important than your two guests or on the on screen. Probably talking to David <laughs> Calvin. Oh yeah. Oh, see now he's talking to someone. Typing and someone off the well, screen it's, to the it's, left. It's the same person uh, who who's my wife Jennifer. Who oh. uh, I I do value our relationship as writer and editor, Doug. But uh, she is actually more important to me. Just for the fine. Record. Okay. Uh, well, I, now I'm gonna. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, but yeah, the pizza is finally here. That's what. Oh, I'm good. About. That's good. Uh, That's good. But uh, but I'm also going to. Um, uh, bring on uh, Mark Warren and David Feldman for the uh, for the nine o'clock shift. Um, but uh, thank you guys uh, both uh, both so much, and I'm actually glad that we, uh, frankly, uh, rather than uh, rather than having to spend a hundred percent of the time, uh, you know, worrying about what was going on in Pennsylvania, that uh, that that I got to spend a few minutes talking about science fiction. That was I fun. get to go and pick up the pieces of my roommate off the floor as he looks at Florida's outcome. So I, I'll look forward to doing that. And I'll go do the washing up. So it's been it's been a pleasure, Ben. Thank you so much for having us. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Jane. Thanks, Doug. All right, I am uh, now joined by uh, Mark Warren, who's a philosophy professor at uh, Damien College, uh, has, uh, has written, uh, done academic research on, uh, on meta-ethics, uh, teaches a really interesting class called Critical Thinking in Google about how to make people less weirdly irrational about um, internet research, but I think most significantly, 
uh, is a human being who doesn't have the ability to uh, to kick. Uh, if he if he tries to kick something, he he falls down on the ground. I've seen it; it's really interesting. Uh, and also by uh, David Feldman, who I don't know, he makes he writes fart jokes for a living. I think I'm the least educated among the three of us, so I plan to do the most talking. Hey, man, have, have at it. I'm I'm the one who doesn't belong here. Hello, internet. <laughs> <laughs> if everyone's looking at me and wondering who the fuck that guy is, you're right. I I have like 40 followers on Twitter. That's that's my kind of fame. I don't know why I'm here. I'm wondering who canceled at the last minute. But I did, but I'm still on. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so, for it's nice. It's nice to meet you, uh, Professor Warren. Oh, thank you, David. It's, it's a pleasure to meet you too. I'm, I'm a fan. And I'm a big fan of Ben Burgess's. What, what, now, what, can I ask, do you mind if I ask a question? What's going yes. on? Because I've been so busy opining about the election results. I actually don't know what's going on. It's my yeah, understanding. Yeah. It is my yeah. understanding. And this is why I should do most of the talking, because I have no idea what's going on. It's my understanding that yeah. Trump is going to win Florida. Texas is in play. Ohio and Wisconsin look pretty good. I mean, the night isn't over, right? We're not looking at 2016. Is that correct? I mean, it's uh, yeah, the, the night, I mean, the night is not over. That's true. Uh, so yeah, uh, Trump, uh, Trump seems to have won Florida, um, which, um, which is a, a nice little, um, you know, really, really gilds the lily for, for how we, uh, we were told back in March, uh, in February that we couldn't have Bernie Sanders, as the nominee because his entirely accurate <laughs> statement about Cuba would mean he would lose Florida. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so we we got, we, we got Biden and, and lost Florida anyway. Uh, and um, right now, actually the last I saw uh, this might have changed uh, bizarrely enough. Uh, there was, I mean, Ohio's looking good, right? Yeah. Please. Ohio's looking good. Uh, I did not see, uh, okay. Uh, so bizarrely enough with 65% reporting, uh, Biden is actually 0.7% ahead in Texas. So make it that what you will. Right. All right. New Mexico's right. looking good with 0% of the votes counted. So, sorry. What do you say, Mark? I think they, uh, New York times called New Mexico. Why did they? Yeah. With okay. But they called it. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, Indiana's been called for Trump. South Carolina has been called for Trump. Uh, what about it, North Carolina? Uh, North Carolina, last I saw, Biden was still ahead. Yeah, Biden point Biden plus three with seventy seven percent reporting. But, so, but the, the New York, the needle that we've come to trust and put our faith in uh, New York time needle has Trump winning probably 84% in North Carolina. Well, an 84% probability of Trump winning North Carolina, right? Yeah, right? yeah. Okay. Yeah. And it's my understanding that we don't, we, they Biden, I'm voting from the, we, the Democrats don't need Florida. They may not even need Ohio, which seems to be turning blue. They need, Arizona, Wisconsin, and Michigan. But and it's spooky that the polls. Uh, it's spooky that the polls are are as off as they are, right? Like you know, five thirty eight had Florida. Uh, the the average of the polls was something like Biden plus four or something. That's quite a that's quite a ways off. Uh, I'm, I'm I'm Ben. Calm me down. <laughs> Uh, I don't know. I mean, last I last I heard, uh, Nate Silver was saying that Trump was up to a one third chance of winning, um, which is where he was standing the day before the election uh, in uh, in 2016. Uh, so I, I think you know I, I think I think Trump might win. I mean, I think I think Biden's probably going to win, uh, but Trump might win. You know, there's there's suspense. I don't know. David, say something funny. <laughs> well, the, 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 this is what's not happening to me. Uh, I remember 2004 when I was guaranteed that Kerry was going to win. And I turned on CNN 
and the Bushes had it from the beginning until the end. This does not feel like 2004. 2016, as I recall, felt like 2004, where we kept waiting for Hillary to do well. And as I recall, it was, we were being told, yes, Trump is in the lead, but when they count all the votes, and then they never, that never materialized. This feels better. This just yeah. feels better in terms. I'm just talking about the, the as they vibe. say, the ju the vibe. The vibe feels like there, there's something going on here. Oh okay. no! I mean, no, it, it does. It does feel better. Um, I mean, I, I, I hope, I hope you're right. I mean, I think that if it's, uh, if it is that sort of situation where it's like, oh, Trump's winning, but when all the votes are counted. Uh, Biden will win. Then I feel like um, I, I saw, you know, Freddie DeBoer joke earlier on Facebook that his his prediction for the final vote count is uh, six Trump, three Biden, uh, which um, you know is entirely possible. Uh, but but I, I still, as far as I can tell right now, the most likely thing is still Biden winning, and there's a real good chance of Biden winning by enough that we find out tonight. Right, right, and. Here's something that I did it like I'm seeing Biden in, in the New York Times. Biden is leading with 119 votes in the Electoral College and Trump has 94. That, you know, that just looks good. David, you know, tell me, why, why are you, why are you vibing? What's, where, where's the vibe coming from? Is my vibe? vibe? Yeah, you said you got the, you've got a good vibe here. Is it? Because I think he's going to lose. And you're a philosophy professor, so let me explain to you how it works with me. Okay. I talk to God. Maybe you don't believe in God, but I'll explain to you. I don't have your book learning. Mm -hmm. Okay. I just, this is just through empiricism. I talk to God every day, and we have a relationship, and I trick God. I said, like in 2016, I made the mistake of saying, Trump doesn't stand a chance. And Not God that. said, oh, really? Oh, really? Yeah. But now, yeah. now, I've, I've, I'm a three-dimensional chess professor. I've said, I don't think Biden's going to win. And I've told God that. God is it's, surprisingly easy to trick. I am outsmarting him. And I know he doesn't, no offense, Ben Burgess, but I know he's listening to Joe Rogan right now god well i mean joe rogan is kyle kalinsky and my understanding is is alex jones i mean i, I would if I, I, if I were god i would i would watch that not this yeah yeah so I mean, if, if, if you're literally omniscient and so you can just <laughs> you can just tune in the power of your thought to whatever election stream you want to uh then then obviously that one you know i mean with what are mark warren and david feldman going to say that kyle kalinsky and alex jones right. are going to right if god, you're god. For a second, and he was like, "Why is this Mark Warren guy on the street?" <laughs> I'm God. I don't know who that guy is. I, I yeah. honestly believe God would be spellbound by conversations about mixed martial arts. I, I don't think God. I mean, if God wants to just chill and you know relax yeah. the brain, he's going to microdose some DMT. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I think I got to go. I think I'm going to go. I'm going, go, I'm going to go watch that. <laughs> but uh, may I may I say that, in all seriousness, this is probably the most important election of the past two years. Like, can we agree on that? That this. I think it could be. I think it could yeah. be. That's okay. Kind of That's good. And yeah, I special also, elections and some municipal elections, but I, I think this is the most important since 2018. Yeah, and I know that God isn't watching but our friends over at ice are they're keeping track the good people of ice and i would like to follow in the tradition of great americans like elia kazan and uh burl ives and uh gary cooper and and name names because i want to cover my bets ben burgess lives at 1414 bonnie meadow lane in Atlanta, Georgia. You might want to pick them up between the hours of 
eight in the morning and nine. I know that's when he he walks his walks his dog. And I am willing to cooperate with ICE because uh, they've promised me a vegan gulag. So I'm very excited about this. So, so, so sorry, is, is, does that mean a gulag where they serve vegan food in the canteen, or is that a gulag where vegans are imprisoned? They, <laughs> you know, I forgot to ask. Damn it. Yeah. Oh, my God. They tricked me again. Anyway, I'm making peace with ice. That's what you have to do, Ben. That was the mistake all my relatives made in the 50s. They didn't cooperate. Didn't if, you co if you cooperate and name a couple of names, then they, they, you can placate ICE. They only want a little. They don't want a lot. So you're vibing. You think uh, Biden's still got this thing. You still, you still feel confident. But you're also ratting Ben out. Just well, to I'm ratting Ben out just to rat Ben out. <laughs> that has nothing to do. We're thinking the trouble with the election. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'm hedging my bets. You got to hedge your bets, Professor. Yeah, that's smart. That's smart. This is something they don't teach. This is not something you get from your book learning. This is what you get, like Trump, from contracting COVID-19 and spending a couple of days in Walter Reed. And then you end up knowing more about the, the virus than the doctors. That, so that's what book learning yeah. don't teach you. Yeah, yeah. No, I remember that he said he uh, he went to school, the real school, not the not the kind where you read books. Yeah, um, which you know, is the inferior kind of school uh, that involves that involves reading books. Uh, the better kind of school, presumably, you just vibe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, is it no. inefficient? Is it my imagination that we this country should turn voting over? to the private sector that it takes, I mean, isn't this just a government boondoggle where it takes a hundred million people to vote before election day? I mean, that's kind of inefficient. When, when there are pollsters out there who can take a sampling and tell us what we want. What do we need to, to, to waste our time voting when there are experts out there? Yeah, like or, Better yet, you could just get um, you could just get like M NBC pundits maybe uh, to uh, to predict based on their their sense of where the voters are at uh, who would who would have won if we'd had an election and then just just empower that person as president. Right. Steve Kornacki is on top of it. If you watch MSNBC, he's on top of it, and we can stay home. We don't have to vote. There's no voter suppression because they're predicting what we want. And if it falls within the margin of error, we let the Supreme Court decide, which seems reasonable to me. Well, that <laughs> I think well, in practice that last part might already uh, might already be there. Well, don't you think that? Well, that's true. So, what do we need an election for? No, that makes sense. So, I see somebody in chat says Michigan looks bad. I'm looking at it right now. Well, that's not uh, nice. Ben is from Michigan. There's some yeah. nice parts of Michigan. It's not great. Yeah. Uh, well, so far, uh, Trump has 59.3. Uh, Biden has 38.4. It seems like it leaves. A, OK. And then Joe Jorgensen has 1.5. Uh, but it's also. Oh, so good. We have somebody to blame. Yeah. Yes. It's Joe Jorgensen. It's her fault. Isn't waiting by more. Um, yeah, the libertarians. Yeah. Although I will say. Um, so. Trump's yeah. Detroit isn't reporting. We don't know from we've only it, Wayne yeah. County has three percent, Oakland which, County. Yeah, which what, is also although that's an argument I feel very awkward making, uh, because uh, as I mentioned previously on the stream, I remember uh, in 2016 I went to the um, Chapo live show in Brooklyn, and then after that was over, uh, you know, a bunch of people from there went out to the bar, and uh, and I spent uh, I spent the whole night telling people. Don't worry. I grew up in Michigan. I've I've seen you know like I've I've watched the results coming in in Michigan, all these different election cycles, and the Republican is always ahead early in the night, and then Wayne County comes in, uh, the Detroit vote, and then the Democrat wins, uh, and you know maybe that is what will happen. Uh, that's certainly what's happened more often than not in elections the last few decades, but I guess my um, 
irrational vibe in is always to think that whatever happened last time will happen this time, which is why I was I was crazy overconfident that Clinton would win in, in 2016, uh, because I remembered in 2008 and 2012 when the people who seemed to know what they were talking about said, uh, said that um, Obama was going to win uh, for sure. And there was no suspense. And then, uh, then Obama won. And so I figured it would be the same thing in 2016. And then uh, after being wrong about that, my assumption all year this year has pretty much been that uh, we were living in 2016 and Trump was somehow going to win again. Uh, so I, I hope uh, that my, well, okay. If God did tune into the stream, you know, then that, that might, um, then, then he might, um, he might hear me say that and, and, and decide to teach me another lesson by having Biden win. But, I seem to remember, uh, Ben, you and me and our mutual friend, uh, Ryan Lake, um, haranguing one of my old high school buddies on Facebook back in 2015 because he was a uh, racist idiot, Dunning-Kruger type of guy. Be we said, oh, we think Bernie Sanders would win because of the polls. And he's like, polls are stupid. And all three of us, kidding, we were graduate students working to get our PhDs. All of us were like, oh, you ignorant, backward hick, moron fuck. You don't know anything. Polls can be trusted. That's science. And, you know, Bernie didn't, didn't run. It wasn't uh, the, the candidate, but uh, I, I cringe at that memory. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I mean, anybody who wants to go look through my old posts, I mean, I was, I was super sure that, that Clinton was going to win uh, in 2016. Um, and um, which, which I guess, again, is, is why I've been, you know, jo all joking aside, I know that Biden's probably going to win. I've known for some time Biden was probably going to win, but it's why I can't rest easy with it, you know, because because uh, I was wrong. I was so wrong so recently. Uh, and, and you know, which is why I, I've been uh, nervous about it and, and doing all these things that probably don't really matter very much, like getting into arguments with um, – uh, you know, with with other leftists about what you know what people should do in swing states. You know, since uh, since it, it gives me it gives me the illusion of, of of exercising some degree of control over an uncontrollable situation. Well, I uh, I'm looking. Did is is Biden losing in Flint, Michigan? Could that be possible? Uh, so that would be was it Genesee County? Uh, what yeah. how, how how much? What's the percent reported? Uh, hang on, I'm trying to get out of the. Uh, let me see here, Michigan, Flint, Genesee County. Donald Trump with 28 percent of the votes reported. Trump has 59.4 percent. Biden 38.8 percent. I would what be if, very surprised. If you want Genesee County, but Trump, um, Trump, yeah, Trump, if Trump won, but Genesee County, um, but I guess twenty eight percent reporting. I mean, that's that's significant. So maybe he will. Um, if if he does, I mean, that that certainly seems like a very very bad sign. Um, somebody, okay, somebody in chat saying North Carolina looking good, although um, again, until the needle says so. Yeah, we can't, um, we can't trust your viewers. Uh, and they don't know anything. We must go to the needle. Yeah, seventy nine percent reported in North Carolina, and Biden is up by two two percentage points. Yeah, the the uh, that sounds right. I hear what you're saying, David. But the needle says that Trump is quite likely to win. So who are we? Yeah. Well, Although I also you got it depends what you put in that needle. Oh, yeah, that's I've true. been. I've been playing with some herbal oils. Oh. I, yeah. I, okay. I, you know what? I, in all seriousness, I think that Biden is going to win. I think this is going to be, I, I, again, I'm not making a joke. I think this is going to feel like 2018, where it wasn't the tsunami we were expecting. It was a slow trickle. And, you know, at my age, I understand a slow trickle. So you get to be your needle. Uh, yes. I, you know, this is like standing at the urinal waiting for something to materialize. And at the end, maybe a couple of days have passed the bar closed, reopened, 
closed and reopened again. But when all is said and done, you will have hit that urinal mint with all that you've got. And, and you look down on your work and you're happy. I think I think we're going to be surprised by how big the win is for for Biden. Oh yeah, I hope so. Um, Texas is going. Texas is going back and forth. Are you watching this? What? Uh, Texas. It, I mean, I, I thought it was a pipe dream that that Biden might win, win Texas, but it's Biden up, Trump up, Biden up, Trump up with uh, seventy percent uh, response uh, vote, votes reported. Uh, they're both tied at forty nine point three percent. Right, and. How I mean, I guess the big issue in Texas is Dal the Dallas area, right? The traditionally red cities, Dallas County, Joe Biden is leading by, is almost double Trump right now. Really? Yeah. I'm from Texas, so that's uh, not too far from Dallas. That's pretty... Yeah, uh, real um, uh, dedicated podcast listeners will know that that Mark Warren is my uh, second favorite Texan. He's in between David Griscom and my wife, but um, and Jack Ruby. <laughs> I, I like his work, you know. But I know. No, actually, didn't you get a VIP pass at the Carousel Club? Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, sure. you're too. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> Actually, I don't. I, I don't like his. I don't like his work. I think. I think Lee, Lee Harvey Oswald uh, is the uh, is, is the better assassin of the two of them. Yeah. But um, in terms of choreography, Jack Ruby was. I mean, the way he and the Dallas Police Department yeah. were able to choreograph that assassination of Oswald. Not since Martha Graham. <laughs> Fair enough. But I digress. Uh. Um. Yeah, fair enough. Um, so let's see. Yeah, okay. I think Georgia is probably a lost cause. Um, I mean, I mean, who knows? Uh, well, maybe not. Um, so right now, right now, Trump is way ahead in in Georgia. It is only thirty nine percent reporting. Uh, on the Flint point, actually, somebody pointed out in chat. But in Atlanta, know. hang on, it, only 15% of Fulton County okay. is reporting. So you're going to get a big rush of votes from Atlanta. August, well, Augusta is in. Mm. Yeah. I just had, uh, David, I had, my wife and I had twins uh, six months ago. Welcome to babies into the house. Oh, and I thought you meant the other kind of twins. You mean like? No, I, I don't want to say. It. I'm sorry. My mind is goes elsewhere. So, you, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. So we had twins, and uh, because of that, uh, I've just kind of been checked out. You know, twins during pandemic, no childcare, just full, two full time jobs, and I have been. Um, which again, why the fuck am I here? Very odd choice, but right. uh, I've been uh, I've been checked out and kind of scoffing at people for following along, you know, really getting all the minutia, doing the silver thing. But now I sort of do wish that I I had a sense of like what do we expect to happen with Texas? Like who's how are these votes coming in? Is Dallas how far how far in how much how many of the Dallas votes do we have? Are we does the Dallas stuff, stuff come in first, and then we're going to get all the bumfuck votes? Why don't you ask your twins? <laughs> Why don't you go ask your twins, <laughs> Mister Wholesome Family Values? Uh, yeah. Tonight we find out whether or not it was a smart move to bring life into this world. <laughs> yeah. Don't you think you should check first? Don't you think you should look around? I mean, I was smart enough to wait till Gorbachev was in charge of the Soviet Union before I started making kids. But I mean, to to have kids now? Yeah. See, that's later. another example of of books. Book yeah, you're right. You're absolutely right. Yeah. 
Um, fair enough. So, so we all agree that Mark made a bad decision there. Um, should should not have procreated. Um, I guess um, you know, so Georgia could. Um, I can give you parenting advice if you want. <laughs> Please. Okay. The secret. Well, you, but I, I, I listen to your podcast. Don't they dislike you? Isn't that the... Well, that's the secret. You don't want to get emotionally attached. Uh-huh. Look, look at what Ben and I, Professor Ben Burgess and I, are going through right now. We have so much skin in this game. like it's, and, and that's a mistake. You should never get emotionally attached to anything because it's just going to break your heart. Like, I can't believe that if Biden loses... I hate Biden, but because I'm team blue... And he loses, I'm going to wake up depressed tomorrow. Like if the the Dodgers lose, I'm depressed. And this is the problem with having kids. You get emotionally attached to them. And you live vicariously. You got to just live through yourself. Don't live vicariously through parties, baseball teams, or your kids. Be your own human being. And go mano a mano with your partner in raising these kids. The trick to raising kids is psych out your opponent. Know who your enemy is and you're, psych you're them out. Your, your kids. I'm not yeah. saying. I'm just saying watch yourself. Protect yeah, yourself. All right. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the super chat, Brock Lewis. He says, LMFAO. That was an absolute evisceration. I love it. Um, so uh, committed to reading out super chat. So, um, uh, yeah. Yeah. So I, I was going to say, though, um, on now, now that we have established that Mark you know, has made the bad life choice of procreating, especially if he was going to love his children, uh, he really shouldn't do that. Uh, then um, I can stop, though. I mean, I, there's still time, right? This is like Georgia. There's still time for things <laughs> around. I can. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, breaks. Yeah. That's, that's fair. That's fair. Um, can I make a suggestion on how to fix the electoral system? Oh, yeah, by all means. Just stop the count. Like, there, there should be, like, you vote and then you just stop the count randomly. Like, you know, now, like, a radio station will will give out tickets to see Common. Like, it's so, you know, so, the first so, five so like, callers. Like the 100,000th voter gets to decide who's president? Yeah, just stop the count. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know that. Them. Sure. Uh, I believe Jason Brennan suggested something similar. Um, so, so yeah, no, makes sense. Um, Alex Guerrero, I think, is actually the guy I'm thinking of the lottery elections. But um, uh, uh, Brennan is is the one who thinks that we should uh, we should uh, have um, we should have an epistocracy to uh, to stop the ignorant masses from uh, from making decisions that would violate his libertarian principles. Well, um, what is it? An F for what? Uh, he calls it epistocracy. So what he means is like the rule of knowledgeable people, uh, oh. which, which, uh, so like uh, one of his examples in his book is that you, uh, that you have like economists to like veto uh, rent control. Um, he's, he's a disgusting piece of shit. But anyway, um, on, uh, on Georgia, I guess I have to say I was in, um, uh, you know, I was, I have been assuming that Georgia was kind of a lost cause, although I think maybe my reasons for assuming that weren't very good, uh, which is that basically just that I figured that uh, in in Georgia, they don't really have what in other countries we would call free and fair elections. And if uh, if Biden won, it probably wouldn't be very, very much. And so it would be close enough to steal. Um, but I also think that's, you know, actually thinking about it a little bit more. That's not a knockdown case. You know, Biden could still win Georgia. Yeah, I don't think Kemp is going to st- – the governor is Republican, and he would hate to get a reputation of somebody who steals votes. Yeah. <laughs> sure. That, that, that sticks with you for a long time. Yeah. No, that's right. Um, he actually uh, – he trusts in his own impartiality so much that he was willing to uh, serve as Secretary of State while he was running for governor uh, making decisions about his own election, which which is really a testament to um, – um, to how he's known for integrity or, or else he just wouldn't have been able to, you know, he wouldn't have been able to do that because he wouldn't. He's have- inviting scrutiny. He's, I mean, the, he's, he's saying I'm the guy who counts the votes and I'm running for governor. 
I'm that clean. You can trust me. You yeah. must really believe in yourself. The same way Jeb Bush was governor of Florida when his yes. brother won. Yes, that's right. They're beyond reproach. Yeah. Otherwise, they wouldn't do it. No, that, that makes perfect sense to me. Uh, but, um, yeah, I guess. Uh, so I'm not seeing. Uh, so I, I have to say, I keep on seeing uh, Jorgensen being reported, but not Hawkins. So. Um, so I, I think that the um, I think that the, uh, the the Hawkins campaign's uh, seminal goal of, of making it to two percent might not happen. So Ben, can I ask? I want to ask a question that's not about what's happening right this second. Okay, is is, is it about is it about child rearing? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, back to David. How do I stop loving them? What's the what's the trick there? The trick to stop loving them. Yeah, is it more drinking or drinking is good. Yeah. Uh, usually, usually they stop loving you first. Uh -huh. It's done for you. <laughs> but, but the drinking is what expedites that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you can drink enough that you're a little bit neglectful and abusive, it probably, you know, really greases the skin for that process. Uh huh. Um, I, in all seriousness, my, my advice is this isn't raising kids is not your life. They trick you. Something starts coursing through your veins where you actually think this is who you are and this is your life. And then all of a sudden, like seven years later, the state takes them away from you, hopefully because they're going off to school, not uh, for other reasons. And then all of a sudden you go, what? Uh, I'm sorry, what? Not to a vegan work camp, but not to. Yeah. And you go, what was that last seven? That's not who I am. Like they, they really do. There's something happens where you actually get fooled into thinking you're now a different person, but you're not. You just go into a state of suspended animation for seven years. This ancient machinery in the back of my brain that has been loaded up, you know, 300, 300 million year old machinery that's, just taking over me. I feel like it's like a zombie movie. Yeah, it is. It yeah. is. But you'll go back. You'll go back to who you were before. But I kind of sucked before. You can't what? I kind of sucked before. You can't. Whoa, I, I'm sorry. You can't. He, said, what? he says he kind of sucked before, so it's not. You good kind of sucked do. before. Well, now you'll have less money. Okay. <laughs> that was what was really dragging me down. Yeah, <laughs> that's what you have to look forward to. Is You'll never buy yourself a toy again. You'll never treat yourself to anything ever again. Yeah. So how did establish that? You you were gonna ask about something else, Mark? <laughs> did you see him take his drink? Um. Yeah. So I, I did want to ask you. I, actually, I was. I wanted. To, I've been wanting to ask you this, Ben, but I'll, yeah. David, I, I, I'd like to hear your uh, non-expert opinion also. Uh, if Biden does win, scale yeah. of one to ten, how likely is it that you think he's going to do any of the radical shit that people on the far left are fantasizing? Like, how likely one scale of one to ten? How likely is it that Biden does anything for DC or Puerto Rico statehood? One to ten. Um, a lot closer to zero than one. David, you're same. Yeah, I don't think anything is fundamentally going to change in the yeah. world of Joe Biden. <laughs> As Joe Biden once put it. Um yeah, no, that that seems that seems right. I don't think he's gonna do the um I don't think he's gonna do the the court expansion either. Um the like uh yeah, I mean maybe the filibuster, but that'd be that'd be about it, right? Like um the the court expansion certainly though like I think uh, my take on that you know was talking we were talking about this earlier in the stream my take on that has always been that um, the reason um, the reason that he and Harris didn't initially want to answer the question is because any possible answer would be bad for them because uh, if they said yes a that would alienate suburban moderate Republicans that are obsessed with courting and b uh, it would uh, it would create an expectation 
uh, that uh, that they would then disappoint uh, if they won anyway, because there's no way they're doing it. And if they said no, which would be the honest answer, it would demoralize the base when they need the most, because they would be admitting that the Supreme Court was lost for the foreseeable future and taking away one of the historically most effective arguments for voting for Democrats. So um, I'm, I, I actually thought it was chef's kiss that uh, uh, that ultimately when they did come up with an answer is they were going to have a commission to study it, which is like peak Democrat. Yeah. So I'll have yeah. more else on my list then, right? That's, is, there anything that, is there anything that we can do? Is there anything that the left can do to actually try to push for those things in any meaningful way over at least the next two years? Uh, in the I, next two years, I have a hard time saying what. I mean, yeah. I'd love to be wrong about that, but but I don't know. Um, I don't know what uh, what that would look like. I mean, long term, sure, but I mean, like like the ne- the next couple of years. I mean, I, I think my um, earlier when uh, Harvey J K was here, you know, uh, not on those issues, but you know, he he had more optimistic projections about what might happen in a uh, Biden administration uh, than I do. But but I, I I mean, I just think like you know as as somebody who who does think it's important that the Biden wins um i i just thought it was uh like i've i've always thought that it's it's just a matter of hitting the sleep button on the alarm that you know that it it puts off the worst effects of a trump presidency um you know by by a few years although of course if 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 indeed nothing fundamentally has changed and there isn't some sort of successful left challenge by that time um you know Donald Trump himself probably won't run for president again, although 100% guarantee he'd talk about it. Uh, but he, um, but uh, but you could certainly get a Trump-like figure, maybe even worse this time. Yeah, I mean Tom Cotton has, I believe, already made some moves to possibly run for president in 2024. Um, you know, Josh Howley, even Tucker Carlson has been talked about as a possible candidate. Uh, I think any of those things could happen, especially if if Biden only serves one term, which I think is what he said. Uh, and in any case, seems likely because um, you know he he seems to uh, he seems to be falling apart at the seams. Um, then uh, then I think that it's it's entirely possible that some sort of horrible right wing Republican could could win in uh, in twenty twenty four. And and I you know I don't think much has changed. Um, I I don't think much will change between now and then. I think I think that the the version of Biden that was telling the truth was the one who told the room full of donors that uh, that nothing would change. Is there a left? Like, what is the leadership of the left? Who do we have? David Feldman. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. But who who do we have? I mean, look. Other I than think, Bernie. Other than Bernie, how deep is our bench? Uh, the bench sucks. I mean, Bernie. Uh, like like Bernie. The reason Bernie is still the leader is is there's nobody. There's, there's really nobody else. Um, I, I'm not. Um, like I don't know who the hell would run in, in 2024 unless there's some amazing anti-aging treatment so it can be Bernie again. Um, you know, this is something we were talking about, you know, a couple hours ago that um that like I like AOC, I'm a defender of AOC, but uh but I don't think that she could play that Bernie role. I mean, for one thing, her her national approval rating sucks. And uh and I think more generally, I think that part of why Bernie you know, it's a touchy subject, but I think part of the reason that Bernie was as effective as he was, that he came so close, uh, is that he had the knack of having correct progressive positions on all the social issues, but not presenting it in a way that would be off-putting to people outside of the progressive bubble. Uh, and um, and un- unfortunately, I mean, I think... AOC, at least for now, maybe she might change in the future, but you know, she she's she has the same positions, but she speaks this kind of woke intersectional language that's very much preaching to the choir. Um, and and so I have a really hard time imagining her. And I guess maybe somebody else in the squad, I guess. I don't know. Um, you know, I mean, you could have um I mean, I guess, you know, if you're super optimistic, you know, you might think that uh Rashida Talib, uh, but um I, I sort of have a hard time wrapping my mind around that one either. And then I don't know. Cause it's cause, cause Bernie is a weird fluke. I mean, there's a reason why uh, Bernie Sanders and Jeremy Corbyn, you know, were both these um, you know, the, these dinosaurs uh, because those are both people who, who preexisted the big neoliberal turns in the democratic party and the labor party. 
and and they they were able to to kind of uh, survive after the meteor hit uh, as as these weird like marginal backbenchers who are sort of comic relief figures. It's like oh yeah, there's that like guy running around the back halls who's still some kind of socialist, I guess. Okay, that's weird. Uh, and and then when the winds shifted, they were there to to uh, to play a big role again. Uh, but then both of those opportunities have been lost. And meanwhile, we've had these decades and decades where we're not really making new Bernies. Uh, we're only just barely starting to, and and I don't think we've, and the new ones we've started to put on the bench. I don't think the, um, I don't think the formula is quite right. So when, I mean, when you say the right, we know who the right is. We know who the leadership is. When we say the left, it's this vague, it's something vague. I mean, and so until we, I, I, and I think that's what made, is that why Bernie didn't do as well as we had hoped? Because I don't I mean, know. He was a bet, right? Bernie was a bet that we could, we could get some sort of leftist politics in a position of power without having the underlying underlying base of like you know union power of like any sort of like left power in America is totally withered. We we tried our damnedest to do it via electoralism, and it just like that's just not learned. I mean, I bought into it too, but I think in like twenty twenty showed us it was actually an object lesson in like why you can't do that. Like if you, even if you have a really good shot at it, and God, we really did have a good shot. I've got a, a wonderful poster from Bernie Sanders and Public Enemy, right, right on my on my wall over here. Back in March 2020, which was seven years ago, back when we thought we could do it. But I mean, it was an object lesson. We saw why we can't do it because if you try to do it that way, the powers that be will coalesce. So it's seen. It seems to me that the, the takeaway from Occupy was it'll work because there's no leadership. If there's no leadership, they can't cut the head off the snake. That the, that the branding of, of the 99% was, act, was quite brilliant. You don't need a leader if you're talking about income inequality and the 99%. And I believe that, and I believe that we... From Occupy, we got Bernie. In politics, I think you need leadership, or at least in, in American politics, you need a, a leader. I think that had Obama been the uh, closeted Marxist some of us projected onto him, he did a pretty good job convincing some people that, you know, it is hard. He'd rather give you Medicare for all, but this is, the, this is you know, in the best of all possible worlds, we would have Medicare for all, but this is the best we can do. Uh, well, it turns out that was bogus. He's not a closeted Marxist. However, however, had Barack and Michelle put the thumb on the scale for Bernie, and said, this is the guy. Yeah. He would have won Super Very Tuesday right. because course, in the right. end, especially with, with a low information electorate, which is what, we're, what we have here in the United States, we rely on, unfortunately, our heroes to tell us what to think. And I think, you know, we, we put too much faith into the idea that Bernie is so great, which he is, and what he's selling makes perfect sense, which it does, but we didn't have the leadership other than Bernie. We didn't even have Elizabeth Warren. We, we had nobody to back him up. I mean, you know, sorry, Ben, go ahead. Oh, no, I was going to say, um, I mean, I, I think, like, I think there's some, yeah, I mean, like the gamble, like Mark said with Bernie was, was that uh, you could, um, you could sort of do things the other way around that rather than having a, a, a really built up movement that, um, 
that, that <clears throat> generated the, the candidate, the candidate could generate the movement. And, you know, to be fair, it almost worked. Um, like it came shockingly close. Uh, but, but maybe, um, I don't mean to interrupt, but uh, maybe, maybe we're, we, we're not dealing with what country we're living in and, and the forces we're up against. And that without, you, you cannot move the needle in this country without people getting your back. Because if, it, you know, everybody was against Bernie because they didn't stand to benefit from his leadership. Somehow you have to co-opt your party. Uh, and the problem with the Democratic Party is they're anything but leftists. They see no they see no virtue, no opportunity. So of course he was up against he was up against everybody. There was no way he could surmount that. Is there? Is there any way well, you can surmount these? People? I mean, look, I, I think there's a way that they, he could have surmounted it, which is that um, if if the Democratic Party had been as dumb in 2020 as the Republican Party was in 2016, uh, yeah. that the Republican establishment clearly didn't want Trump. Uh, but um, he also could have been meaner. It would have been nice if he was uh, a little. If he was a bit of a bastard, that would have been. I mean, I don't know that it would have made the difference, but hitting Biden early on things that were the obvious shit, I think that yeah. would have I, – I, I don't know that. I, even if he'd done it, you know, maybe it would, now it would be Buttigieg losing Georgia. Yeah. Of Biden. But but I think that it would have been – it would have been nice if he – he's too, just too – he's just too nice. Yeah. I mean, I think that was a downside, but I also think that, like, if – you know, I mean, like that was my optimistic pro projection uh, for the 2020 primaries that, that it could play out like the 2016 Republican primaries that uh, everybody thought that Trump would just self-destruct at some point. So you had a bunch of people competing for like the uh, the, uh, the the serious Republican lane. Uh, and then by the time and then nobody they didn't coalesce. If the Republicans had coalesced then they could have stopped Trump in 2016, uh, but they, they didn't think they had to. Uh, and Democrats, unfortunately, were smarter about it. And they did coalesce uh, at the right time to stop uh, to stop Bernie Sanders uh, in uh, in 2020. Uh, I would say, by the way, on Occupy, I think that even for even for that kind of street protest movement, I think the leaderlessness thing uh, was a huge mistake. Uh, that um, that what that ends up meaning is that if you don't do if you don't have like leaders who you know who you you designate by some sort of democratic process, uh, and uh, instead, uh, well, one you have informal leaders. If you don't have formal ones, uh, that's just inevitable. And then two, um, that what that meant is because you didn't have representative decision making bodies. Everything had to uh, to be done by these like endless mass meetings, uh, which uh, most people don't have time for, uh, and most people who do have time for hate. Uh, and and any normal human being would hate, should hate. Uh, you know, it's, it's it's interminable and awful, especially because you had all these like anarchists and quasi anarchists who who were uh, addicted to this this consensus process. Uh, you know, where where you do things like you know the the jazz hands instead of uh, instead of uh, uh, you know clapping. You know, uh, and and you had to. Uh, and you have to achieve near consensus, which uh, which a is incredibly undemocratic uh, because the only way that you can have actual consensus is if you either never make any decisions or you expel dissenters. Uh, and um, usually, consensus based organizations end up doing the second thing. Uh, and uh, and and it's it's just it's just really it's just a weird alienating thing that takes up way too much time, uh, excludes most of the population from any possible participation, uh, and, and makes things way too easy uh, for, uh, for people who want to straw man you as like, oh, who knows what these guys even want. Uh, when, you know, it, if you, since you can't do, you can't just have an easy process to just vote on, on, on an official list of demands. Uh, so, so I think that all that was a mistake even then. Uh, and I'll also, of course, the anti-electoralism uh, was a mistake. I mean, like, I think Mark might be right that it's, at, at the very least, it would be a huge long shot to do it the way uh, the way Bernie was trying to do it. I mean, the biggest reason, you know, 
Bernie could have won if the Dem- if the Democratic establishment had been dumber about it, like the Republican establishment was in 2016. But the biggest reason Bernie lost is just that they were uh, they were better. Um, there were more of them, and they're better organized. And you know, I mean, it was it was an honest representation of what the balance of forces was on the ground, especially in Democratic primaries, which is a huge structural problem for the strategy, uh, because uh, because you can't like a candidate like Bernie uh, would do way better in a general election than a Democratic primary. For one thing, in a general election, like if your whole idea is that. Part of what makes you more electable is that you can uh, you can mobilize people who otherwise wouldn't be inspired to come out and vote. Uh, then that a primary is a terrible place to test that because uh, in a primary, like on a general election, everybody votes on the same day, and anybody with a pulse who's caught even one minute of TV coverage at any time in the previous two months knows knows what that day is. Whereas in uh, in primaries, like every state votes on a different day. I mean, a bunch of them vote on Super Tuesday, but like different states vote on different days. Uh, lots of people, especially working class people, don't know uh, what day their state even has their primary. Uh, and so they certainly don't know far enough in advance to register for it. Uh, and so it tends to favor structurally uh, middle class people who uh, who are more clued into the political process and who are less likely to vote for for somebody like Bernie. So in, in a way, it's surprising that he did as well uh, as he did. And I mean, I don't take any pleasure in this because these are structural problems that would exist for any future left challenger. And I don't know what the solution is. Uh, as we're as I was talking about earlier with with David Griscom and um, and and Daniel Daniel Bessner, um, you know, it's very easy to say and correct to say that you need to rebuild the labor movement. So you have those ground troops for a revitalized left, but um, you know, it's easy to say that, right? Like what, what does that actually look like? Uh, but meanwhile, on that optimistic uh, note, uh, now joined by uh, Vic Viana, uh, who, if you have ever seen um, uh, one of the, um, the uh, illicit history uh, videos uh, that, uh, that Michael Brooks did, uh, you have probably seen Vic's work. Uh, so welcome, Vic. Hey, good to be here, Ben. Thanks for the invite. Thanks for the intro. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so what's uh, uh, so what's your sense of how things have been going? I mean, you know, you look away from your phone and for 10 minutes and then everything is more bleak all of a sudden. Um, you know, I mean, yeah, he's behind in Ohio now. And I mean, the you oh, know, sure. the Florida results, everyone was talking about those for, for a while while other things were coming in and that um i mean it seems like it was really uh miami that sunk everything right and that's i mean there's multiple reasons for that right but i mean one question that i'm thinking about too is kind of how much you know in though you know in that particular community right like that is such a unique kind of you know how indicative is the miami cuban vote going to be towards like not only like other hispanic voters but like you know other you know georgia north carolina you know, will that correlate? I mean, I, I have no idea. It's, I mean, we're, we got to see how these other, the rest of these numbers are looking, but I mean, I'm pleasantly surprised by Ohio, but now he's behind a little bit, it looks like. So who the hell I, I have him it? winning in Ohio. Yeah. Okay. I, mean, okay. Uh, I just like- refreshed and he's like slightly behind in Ohio now. Okay. Um, you, I refresh your refresh. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, fair enough. Um, so somebody in chat reminded me because because Mark said earlier uh, that that Bernie Sanders might have been more effective if he'd been willing to uh, be a bit meaner uh, in the debates, uh, which reminds me of something amazing that I saw the other day. Now, to be fair, I saw this on social media, and I have not had a chance to to actually look up the page in the report to make sure that this is. There's a no real- need. There's no need. Okay, there's no need. Okay. As, as someone who teaches this stuff at the college level, uh, if you see something on social media, you should just believe it. Okay. Just believe it. <laughs> if, if, if you vibe on it. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, I vibe very powerfully with this. This is a. Um, I think this is. I think this is real because the person who posted it. But um, this is a screenshot, uh, supposedly from the. Um, in, uh, the investigation into anti-Semitism in the Labor Party that was the pretext for uh, expelling Corbyn because he said he disagreed with the report. Um, so this is a quote. I'm just I'm just going to read this out. Uh, this is this is a thing of beauty. 
Uh, one complaint by a member of the House of Lords centered on the issue of personal harassment. When the Lord was present in a room, Jeremy Corbyn would begin to describe what he described as uh, what he described as a radar ping noise. This noise would become more frequent the closer the Lord came to uh, Corbyn. When the Lord was within speaking distance, Corbyn would stop and typically say, "Sorry, I forgot to turn off my nonce radar." <laughs> So um, the point of that story is just that Jeremy Corbyn is awesome. And, uh, <laughs> and honestly, I actually, speaking to people who are uh, entirely too nice, uh, I think that maybe if, if, um, if, if Corbyn had shown a little bit more of that insult comic and, en you know, energy uh, when he was campaigning, that <laughs> played well for him. No, nonce is a, a British word that is for someone who, Molest children? Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, it's, yeah, I, I, I it's British for pedo. Referred to as, as Tories, I believe. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. No, yeah, we need more of that in our politics. More accusations. <laughs> I mean, there is plenty of those kinds of accusations in our politics these days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I do kind of want to see what happens with QAnon if Trump loses, uh, in particular, because uh, for anybody who really follows uh, QAnon, um, which you should, it's a good use of your time, uh, then um, a like a weird turn that a lot of them took, you know, they made these predictions, right? Q said a storm is coming, which which was which is supposed to mean that there was going to be these mass arrests. Of all of the um, the the liberal politicians who are uh, who are cannibalistic pedophiles, uh, Satan worshippers, and uh, and then it it didn't happen when they predicted it would, and so the um, kind of the same way the Jehovah's Witnesses you know uh, said the invisible kingdom of God started on whatever date in the early 19th century uh, they they made their prediction about the end of the world. Um, the way a lot of them have gone has actually been to say that. Um, that that did happen so that various public figures who were clearly, you know, out there making appearances uh, who they said would be arrested, they were arrested and uh, I think in prison or even executed and, uh, and replaced with, depending on your flavor of Q um, holograms uh, or, or replicants uh, or something of that nature. And so I'm wondering if, if Biden wins, uh, if, if there's going to be a wing of Q that's going to decide that Trump won, uh, and and there's going to have some explanation like this, like like Trump won, but we've all been put into the matrix uh, in this right. in this world where Biden won. Right. Yeah, from what I heard, they were all really thrown off by Trump getting COVID. Also, I can see that. <laughs> it's, it's weird because once you're willing to make the uh, the oh, it's uh, these are clones ad hoc maneuver, it feels like. Anything else, nothing is going to throw you. COVID shouldn't, it shouldn't do anything. You're willing to, you're willing to invoke clones into your world picture <laughs> to like, to keep your original hypothesis safe. So it seems like COVID, losing an election, easy. Yeah. More clones, yeah. right? Right. You have resources to, to solve all this. Um, so uh, there's a, um, there's a thought experiment uh, in um, philosophers who deal with questions about about the mind, uh, where about uh, philosophical zombies, meaning somebody who um, who behaves exactly like anybody else would, and, and even has the same like if you sliced open their head, their brain would be the same, but there are just no thoughts or feelings attached to it. Uh, and uh, there's another uh, traditional uh, philosophical problem. Uh, for for theists, for people who who believe in God, like like David Feldman very strongly uh, indicated earlier that he is, uh, yeah, uh, who um, about well, you know, it's the problem of evil, right? Why is it that if there's an all all good, all powerful being, there's all this apparently undeserved suffering by innocent people? And uh, our friend Ryan Lake, uh, who is was the illustrator on uh, my first book, give them an argument. Um, that that picture of uh, David Hume hushing Ben Shapiro. Uh, uh, years and years ago, he had a, uh, a brilliant solution uh, to uh, the problem of evil, which was to invoke the philosophical zombies thing and to say that all of this apparent suffering going on in the world was just being experienced by philosophical zombies. So uh, that's the solution. None of it is happening. 
uh, you know, which which has some good some good Q energy uh, behind it. But let's see. Let's neurotically refresh the New York Times. <laughs> um, so uh, North Carolina, uh, Biden uh, is up by 0.6, but it's the, the needle still says 95% Trump. Um, Ohio, it says Trump plus two, but I actually don't see a needle forecast. Um, yeah, I think they said they're only doing the needle for North okay. Carolina, Georgia, and Florida, because yeah. those are the most tipping pointy states on okay. Trump's side, I think. Yeah. Well, I've seen I the needle see and the damage done. That's all I can say. <laughs> uh, I saw that um, Milwaukee and Philadelphia are not going to finish counting absentee ballots till the morning. So that's also wonderful news. <laughs> uh, nice. So what's going to be a late? Yeah, it's. Uh, I don't. Yeah, I, we are. I mean, Trump is going to come out and say he won, I think, tonight. But uh, I, I don't think we're going to actually know who won. So mm. I think we're, we're in that scenario, unfortunately, I think. Yeah. All right. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I am going to jump off because I have to opine <laughs> on another show. <laughs> Uh, David, it was really a pleasure to, to meet yeah, you. Thank you for, thank you for making you, fun of me for having kids and bringing life into the world. That was that was really nice. <laughs> In all seriousness, uh, congratulations. How old are they? Six months. Oh, you're in heaven. You are. Yeah, no, it's fucking. It's, it's really, it's really great. I'm having a great time. And in all seriousness, uh, it's not your life. This is temporary. And uh, you have no, you can't even imagine how much you're going to miss it. Them that small, once they turn into actual human beings. Yeah. Are they boys or girls? One of each. So let me do. One and done. We're we're now we're now finished. We got we got one of each. No reason to try anymore. That must have been an expensive gender reveal party. How how yeah. much woodland <laughs> did you end up burning? Yeah. Quite a bit. Awesome. All right. Thanks, David. I love you guys. Here's my prediction, Professor Ben. Yeah. When we wake up tomorrow, Joe Biden will have been arrested. That's how well. He's been. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think uh, he will have done so well that he will have been arrested. I think he's going to win. Here's open. Uh, so, yeah. Ben agrees with you. That's I, I, as a longtime friend of Ben. I can I'll read that that sound he just made. He absolutely agrees with you. He's signing on 100. <laughs> percent <Well>, Anyway. <laughs> yeah, see you, David. That's what I do when I'm confident that somebody said something correct. All right. Thanks, David. Thank, really you, appreciate it. Thank you for asking me to be on. It's an honor. Always. You guys are great. Thank you. I mean, Thank you. now I'm going to do the thing where I pretend I'm off, but okay. I don't know if my microphone is still on. No, I'm not going to do that. Yet. <laughs> All right. Bye. Think good <laughs> thoughts and bad okay. thoughts about you know who. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, I think, I think he, I mean, I guess probably. He's right. Yeah. About the arrest. <laughs> yeah, that Biden will be arrested. That uh, <laughs> that then he'll finally he'll finally be held to account for his Pizzagate crimes. Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> uh, well, let's see. So, a uh, friend of the show and uh, former guest Cole James Cash. Uh, just texted me. He's out canvassing right now. Um, he's in the uh, the Bay Area in California. I said our our DSA housing candidate uh, is way ahead, uh, but nice. we're making sure. Uh, so he he's uh, doing last minute door to door, uh, which is arguably almost as useful as being on YouTube having opinions about what's <laughs> going on with the election. Um, I would say that until you went into that long diatribe about philosophical zombies and the problem of evil. <laughs> That's what it got useful. That's yeah, that turned things around. <laughs> um, yeah, 
I mean, are there any other um, analytic philosophy thought experiments that that we could that we could really bring to this? So it's a it's a unique product that's different from from other election right. streams. That is kind of your niche, right? Every once in a while, you throw in a, throw in the name of a fallacy and maybe bring up something that Klein said a long time ago. It's great. Yeah, yeah. Um, I always. Uh, I always sort of vaguely suspected Quine of being a fascist, but um, I, I guess I, I don't know for sure. I, I didn't know you. This is Vic. I apologize. Ben, you should kick me off really soon. I'm, no, I'm, no worries. i really, I have no business being here. Feel free to to kick me off. But it, yeah, I, I didn't know that Quine was right wing at all. This is the. Yeah. The so, so, here to so oh, uh, speaking of which, uh, yeah, Eli Chup, uh, who is a um, philosophy professor somewhere in Texas now. I do not remember the name of her institution off the top of my head, but I knew her from Rutgers, uh, showed up in the chat. So hi, Eli. Um, if, you, if you have any thoughts about whether Quine was a fascist, please weigh in. Uh, so um, people don't know what the fuck I'm talking about. Uh, Willard Van Orman Quine, WVO Quine, is uh, one of the most important um, analytic philosophers of the, uh, of the 20th century. Uh, and, um, he's probably not literally a fascist, but, um, he's, he's somebody, uh, but what first made me think this was he has this classic paper called on what there is, uh, which is a really like entertainingly written paper. And, and, um, it's, it's, a you know, it's, it's, it's fun stuff, but he's got these analogies in there about like clearing out the, the slums of thought. I always thought I was like, oh, this that comes a little weirdly easy to use an analogy, clearing out slums, like especially as something that you think is positive. And I think I remember flipping through his his autobiography once, which is like mind-numbingly boring. I remember uh, seeing an old uh, description of this book because I think it's called like the times of my life, and the way that people made fun of it was uh, was saying uh, uh, that the way that Quine wrote the times of my life was like at time T one, I did this at time <laughs> T2, I did that. Right. And uh, in there, I think he's got some like super caustic references to protest movements in the sixties and stuff. So I believe he was somewhat right wing. Although our friend uh, Noel uh, is a huge Quine fan. He'd get upset at me when I'd say that. So who knows? Um, but uh, yes, that's the one with the thing about desert landscape. Um so uh, let me, uh, um, I am actually, uh, I have to, uh, to get off for like 30 seconds. Can you guys talk to each other? Yeah, totally. Oh, fuck. Oh, wow. <laughs> uh, 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 so, uh, wait, so how do you yeah. know Ben? Uh, ben and I went to grad school together. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Cool. 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 Yeah. So I've, um, that's the time to say. I've seen him vomit so many times. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, just something to just something to know before he got his life together. You know, he was a right. philosophy grad student, and uh, right. <laughs> yeah, so actually, it's been great watching him um, over the past couple of years. Just you know, do exactly what uh, he's he's perfectly made for this, right? Yeah, Arguing, totally. you know, no, I mean. Um... Yeah, he, he's so great at like simple. I mean, I read it, you know, I read his book like when it came out about a year ago. Yeah, he simplifies so many of those. And I never studied philosophy in college or anything. So like, yeah, to the kind of layman, he really makes these things uh, very understandable. Well, and he's also like, he just, I, I, I don't know how many times I went out with the crew because it was a very alcoholic group of grad students. And went out with Ben and like got into an argument with him about something I was pretty confident I was right about <laughs> an hour later I've been like, how am I getting my ass kicked about this thing that I know I'm right about? You know, he's just, he's got chops. Yeah. This is yeah. definitely, definitely where he, right. He, he can give them an argument. <laughs> yeah. He can. He really can. But you, you know, Vic through the Michael Brooks show. Is that? Or, that yeah. 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 yeah I know. The Michael Brooks show? Sorry. What'd you say? Did you know Ben through Michael Brooks show first? Is yeah. That? Yeah. Yeah, I met him. Yeah, we, uh, yeah, actually, yeah, we met in real life through Michael as well, like uh, about a year ago. Yeah. Um, we all, yeah, there was like a dinner, you know, they were in Queens randomly for a, some event and yeah. I had to meet up with Michael to talk about something. And then we just kind of like, you know, all shot the shit for a little while. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I never, I never met Michael, but I actually, um, 
I introduced Ben to Michael's podcast a long time ago. Oh, wow. Like, you know, he and I, he, Ben introduced me to Chompa a long time ago, so we've kind of been fellow uh, travelers okay. on that. Um, totally. I was like, oh, yeah, you, sh you should listen to this. This is really good. And, yeah, that's great. You're trying to, to watch, this, watch this thing blossom. Yeah. Yeah. Man, I don't, I'm trying to find another – like, some of these maps, they, like, are not uh, – well formatted and then I, I want to see like county level breakdowns you know but uh yeah yeah uh, i'm i've just been i registered with the new york times tonight mm. and get the my email address just so i could get this that's a good idea and follow it i was kind of you know like i'm getting bummed out i got a little panicky and I, it's stupid because you know i'm I know this isn't the only thing, but like this is it's pretty important. It's, yeah, it's, there are Ben's National uh, Labor Relations Board thing. That's true. Trump yeah. on the environment. That shit's real. You know, like I, I'll yeah. stop talking about having kids, but I do have kids, and like there is a legitimate difference between Trump and Biden on, on totally. the environment. And so I did get a little panicky earlier. I have to admit, a little panicky with the whole Florida, Georgia, uh, North Carolina thing. Um, but yeah, it's it's still okay. We don't have to. I don't have to freak out yet. There's still. Yeah. Okay. It still feels like there are more paths for Biden to get it than, than Trump. Yeah, it looks like he's way ahead in Arizona. Actually, that that just came through at ten. And, and oh, really? Person. Yeah, he's. Uh, as of now, Good. it's he's like uh, it's fifty three forty four uh, Biden in Arizona with seventy percent in, so that's good. Yeah. <laughs> um, but we'll see. I mean, but literally all the other swing states are now slight all they're and they're all slightly for Trump. The ones that are for Trump. So this is, you know, it's a, we're gonna get fucked by the electoral college again if uh, uh -huh. this happens. Yeah. Oh yeah, Pennsylvania shit. Yeah. So, so the. Um... The event. Yeah, I've been uh, gone for an hour talking to Ben. <laughs> Fair enough. Shit, yeah. <laughs> okay, so yeah. maybe I'll panic a little bit now. Yeah. I'll panic a little bit again. Yeah, but yeah. Michigan too. I thought that that would come back a little bit when Detroit yeah. came in. I don't know. Well, weirdly, I feel like they must have not counted certain votes or something because, like, Detroit is li was light red on a map that I saw. So I feel like they're not. They have not started counting absentees or something like that because that's that's not going to hold. Like, to, you know, no, no, but, okay, right? Yeah, yeah, I mean, that would be wild. Then that would be like, oh shit, they totally did get all these random black dudes to vote for Trump. Like that would like that would be truly insane if it was that much of a margin. But I mean, yeah, D Detroit, Detroit is not going to. Go for Trump. I think. I mean, like Trump yeah. might win, win Michigan, but he's not going to win Detroit. This yeah. scenario where Trump win, win Michigan. Oh, did you vote in Michigan or Georgia? Michigan. Okay. Uh, yeah, my wife and I actually moved moved back here. Um, I couldn't right. vote. You know, we didn't. Right. We don't have an address in Georgia right now, but um, since we're going to be on teaching online at least through the end of the spring, uh, so yeah. so we gave up the apartment in Atlanta. Um, so uh, so yeah, just to. Uh, uh, just to backfill the uh, the lore here, I I, I met Vic at a um, so yeah Michael and I went out to Queens and had dinner with him because we were about to go. Uh, there was an event for there was a Bernie Kratt like congressional right. primary Ashcraft. candidate. Uh, yep, uh, Lauren Ashcraft, uh, who uh, who was um, uh, and uh, and so. Um, she was. Uh, she did this like fundraiser that was like the stand up comedy night, and uh, and so we went up to that, and and actually, um, and so if you watch, uh, I think the time this was in October, so I think if you watch uh, when I was in studio in uh, on TMBS in January, they uh, there's a I was on at, I was on with Lauren Craft, and there was a point where Michael turns to me and he says so. Um, uh, do you have any questions for her? And I was like, yeah. So there was that night where you did that stand-up comedy night. Uh, were you going to release a video of that? And and like, I think that, uh, uh, I mean, he he thought it was funny, but I think he was also kind of disgusted. You know, he's like, you know, he's like, <laughs> you know, like waste my time asking when she's going to release the video of you doing stand-up comedy. <laughs> uh, but uh, we're we're now joined by uh, by Ryan Lake, who uh, who was the uh, the illustrator on. Um, Give them an argument, uh, and was uh, and was also um, 
referred to earlier because because of his brilliant solution to the problem of evil, uh, <laughs> yep. and um, and and he uh, he he is on right now because he was offended that Mark was on and he wasn't. Yeah, if you're gonna have one clueless friend on, you should, I, I feel offended. I'm I'm every bit as clueless as Mark. I have no idea what I'm talking about, so I belong. I feel like at this point, Vic should be offended. <laughs> Yeah, Vic really should. I'm I, Vic. I'm very sorry for. Uh, How dare you? Yeah. <laughs> I also did want to say, um, contrary to what you were just saying a little bit ago, uh, we are doomed. I feel super doomed. There is I this this feels dark. This feels just like 2016, especially like watching the watching those Florida results come in. Like I just deja vu. This just this feels bad. Uh, yeah, uh, I don't know if you were watching when Feldman was on, but do you do you have an opinion about whether it was a mistake for Mark to have kids? Oh God, what the what the fuck were you thinking, Mark? <laughs> Jesus. Um, <laughs> do you yeah, see the world we're in? Pandemic, uh, Trump getting rid. I mean, good lord. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I. Um... <laughs> All right, I'm not going to tell that story on stream. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what it was, but, but thank I, you. I, I kind of want to hear it. Uh, if, it if it was a story about Mark, yeah, I want to hear it. <laughs> it's it's a story about Mark, but it implicates okay. other people. So, so I'm not okay. going right. to tell it. Uh, yeah, look, I mean, I, th I think it's um, I think it's premature. Uh, you know, yeah. you, you could be right. Like, I've got some of the same queasy feeling in my stomach, but I don't think think that the evidence is particularly pointing in that direction yet yeah mm -hmm. i don't know you gotta trust your gut this is a truthy thing we gotta trust mm -hmm. my gut is telling me this is uh this is bad right. yeah yeah because i mean at the very least right if maybe it's not close enough or bad enough that uh trump can win it clean like 2016 but it's yeah. close enough that they can steal it i think at this yeah point. Like, th if it this comes down to pennsylvania and michigan and that's it like yeah they can steal it yeah. It does. Like, we, I came in sort of thinking, like, okay, maybe we're gonna have a night where Florida gets called for Biden, and then we can just we can just relax. I can sit with David Feldman, do my material about yeah what what Biden wouldn't wouldn't do. I had a yeah. bit, but now instead, <laughs> we're we're gonna do the oh, this is gonna take a really fucking long time and be yeah. Off. Like, even if it goes the right way, it's gonna be a bad like week is that are we thinking the bad yeah week? yeah i mean this yeah this is yeah like vic was just saying this is the nightmare scenario like even if if we're depending on pennsylvania to get biden in this is this is where yeah. all the shady stuff can happen um, yeah this, that, is where that, the, that, this is where the supreme that, court can decide it um, mm. yeah that 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 uh dark little freddy de boer joke that i i uh, quoted a couple times earlier about um, Freddie's uh, prediction for the ultimate outcome of the election is that Trump would win uh, by six votes to three votes. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So. Yep. Yep. I'm predicting five to four. <laughs> yeah, so Robert, will, uh, yeah. you're not. I think, I think Roberts, Roberts will do the right thing, but yeah. right, right, because it doesn't matter if he does or not. So he yeah, exactly. He, lo yeah, yeah. he loves doing the right thing when it doesn't matter. So right. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Christ. yeah. Ooh. Damn, yeah. Trump's technically ahead by the popular vote right now too. <laughs> oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess because you know absentee ballots are still right, right, there, and right. we don't have California and all that. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. True, true, yeah. True. yeah. Yeah. So how, how are absentee? I, I guess this is one of those those things where like I should have been paying attention. I know that there's there's supposed to be like a flood of absentee ballot. Absentee ballot votes coming in. I think yeah. it depends on the state because some yeah. have started counting them already, and some yeah. have started when polls closed. I guess. Yeah. And they're not really that. That should be reflected in a lot of these maps and shit. But uh, yeah, I'm having trouble finding anything you know where that's reflected. Yeah, I don't think the maps show it. Uh, yeah, but very, yeah, Pennsylvania is one of the ones that just started counting today. Um, right. I think okay. Okay. Michi okay. Michigan. Okay. Go on, sorry. No, just is Michigan one of the, I think Michigan is one of those two. I think I saw something about uh, Milwaukee and Philadelphia specifically are yeah. going to continue their counts tomorrow, which yeah. uh, you know, yeah, kind of fucked yeah. up right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, this is dangerous because um, the 
because I mean, I always thought like, okay, the three possible things that will happen are that um, Biden wins and it's a blowout, and we found out on the night of, mm -hmm. and um, it drags on for longer, but Biden eventually wins, and uh, and it drags on for longer, and then and then Trump either wins outright or steals it, um, and it's. Yeah. It always seemed like the first thing was the most likely, but it also seemed like if the first thing didn't happen, then uh, it seems like the second thing might be more like the, the Trump wins. Uh, it drags on and Trump wins seems slightly more likely that it drags on than, Bi than Biden wins, just given how the courts are. Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah. Yep. <sighs> <Ooh. Yep. laughs> Somebody in chat says, uh, and then uh, Amy Coney Barrett uh, pops out of a cake with, cake with the verdict. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, what a nightmare. Yeah. Hopefully not a nightmare, but yeah, I just, I have a bad feeling. Yeah. Don't feel good about it. Yeah. Um, let's see. So this point neurotically refresh um <laughs> yep uh north carolina trump is ahead 0.7 with 89 percent reporting mm -hmm. uh arizona biden is ahead by nine with 75 percent reporting okay that's something uh ohio trump is ahead by five with 74 percent reporting mm -hmm. um, okay Georgia Trump is ahead by 13 with 55% reporting. Okay. Uh, Michigan Trump is ahead by 11, but it's only 33% reporting. I will say um, with, you know, whatever sort of uh, standpoint epistemology uh, move you want to make here that uh, half of the people on the stream right now are from Michigan. And, and I think as a, as a uh, Michigander, uh, I will, I will say that, um, you know, Trump might win, but if he does win Michigan, I, I think it's going to be pretty narrow. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't take those initial numbers very seriously. I expect no, I, yeah, I, yeah, I really have high hopes for Michigan, but yeah, and I voted in Michigan this time, so it, it feels like that should make a difference. But <laughs> uh, uh, um, yeah. All right, Thomas in chat says, "Someone tell Mister Illustrator to bring some good vibes, please." So, uh, <laughs> Ryan, Ryan has his instructions. Uh, okay. Bring uh, some good vibes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Biden's totally gonna sweep the rest of the swing states. It's gonna be great. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, narrow it is still a win, but it's but the the problem yeah. is that a narrow loss is still a loss. Um, yeah, and, and that's you know that's entirely possible. Yeah, I, I also I mean frankly I wonder um, if uh, I mean I don't know I mean maybe people don't pay enough attention for this to matter, but um, if Biden might have fucked up more than more than we realized by by embracing the the uh, the uh, the uh, endorsement by Snyder uh, that that could uh, that could depress uh, yeah. the um, that could that could depress the vote in, in well Flint certainly and in, in Detroit yeah 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 in suburban areas too you think or uh, suburban areas I don't think it would necessarily hurt him I mean maybe it would even help there but uh, but certainly Detroit and Flint would hurt yeah 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 that's a good point. Uh, so with it's like, it's like with Biden playing Despacito on his phone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, weirdly, apparently uh, the Hispanic numbers are not great. Which you, you right. would think that would have sealed the deal. Yeah, you think was, everyone would have been like, "Oh, he knows our music." <laughs> <laughs> uh, Lord. Well, you know, Trump put out that Latinos for Trump salsa uh, commercial, so <laughs> it's, it's actually like the worst thing ever. Is it? <laughs> Wait, did really? and they, they legit played that in, in Miami, I think, on the air, uh, which is really funny. It is very funny. <laughs> oh, man. All right. Trump's ahead in North Carolina. I just looked at it. Yeah, that, yeah that's very yeah. – that was like the one uh, yeah. that might have worked out okay. Yeah. 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 Um, 
Not by much, but the New York Times needle seems to be pretty sure that he'll win. Yeah. There. <sighs> so. Yeah. Um. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's, uh, yeah. Um, that's fun. Yeah. Um, but yeah, if I don't know. everyone's zombies, it's okay. Yeah. I mean, I, but I know I have actual experiences and, and I'm feeling anxiety about this. So I don't, <laughs> yeah. I don't know how that, you know, I don't know how that works here. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, Ryan, uh, Ryan, I should say, um, uh, wrote a uh, award-winning uh, dissertation about uh, free will and determinism. <laughs> Uh, called uh, uh, No Fate But What You Make, uh, which uh, from the uh, Terminator mm -hmm. line. Uh, but um, so I don't know. Maybe uh, maybe he has some uh, some thoughts uh, about uh, about how you know how none of this you know. I mean, he had been he had been a compatibilist. So he had had the view that even if determinism mm -hmm. is true, we mm -hmm. still have free will. But if he's if he's flipped positions, maybe he has some comforting thoughts about how all this is out of our hands anyway. So we didn't have to worry about it. Yeah, no, this is all our fault. I don't, I don't have anything to help you with there. <laughs> we're, we're, yeah, our nation is shit and we're fully responsible for this. Uh, yeah. It's the worst of both possible worlds. We're both, it's our <laughs> fault and there's nothing we can do about it. At this point. That's right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Yeah, that's right. I that's think right. I think that is this world. Yeah, that's the upshot of compatibilism is that we are in the world. Nothing we can do about it. It's all determined, and it's our fault. Yeah, fair yeah. enough. Um, yep. So, so one very small glimmer, you know, uh, consolation prize if Trump does win uh, is that the uh, I don't think. I mean, who knows? If it's super narrow, you might still get like the Hawkins vote being bigger than the spread between. Um, uh, between Trump and Biden in some states, but I will say, as I've been like neurotically checking and rechecking the results, um, like I've seen the Jorgensen results. Not that those have been, you know, whatever. I mean, they've generally been lower than one percent. But uh, the Hawkins results have apparently been marginal enough that they haven't bothered to report them, mm -hmm. which which gives me some hope that if if Biden loses, it'll be slightly harder to uh, to blame the left for it this time. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that that would I guess be a tiny upshot. I mean, you think, <laughs> do, do you, a consolation prize, Ben. Yeah. <laughs> do you think after this election um, that centrists will stop lecturing us about nominating the centrists? Like, <laughs> can, can that can that argument just die? Uh, no, it, I mean it, it, it won't die uh, because you know clearly uh, you know Hillary Clinton uh, bombed in in two thousand and sixteen. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and like in a, in a specific way that you'd think if anything was going to teach that lesson, that would be it because yeah. she struck out in these, uh, these rust belt swing States, uh, that, you know, have, um, where like, I mean, whatever, I guess the official liberal explanation is that people are more racist to the upper Midwest, but, uh, the, uh, yeah. but like. Uh, but like, it seems like the obvious explanation is that her inspiring message of America is already great. Wasn't really playing. Right. Um, right. But, uh, but that doesn't, you know, whatever. We still got by in 2020. Yeah. Yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. uh, remember if we nominated uh, Bernie, uh, if, if you can get in the way back machine, uh, the, the reason not to do that was that, um, his saying accurate things about Cuba's healthcare. Right. That's right. Would have meant that he would have lost Florida. Yeah. Um, so obviously we could take that risk. Yeah. Good thing we nominated the guy who was going to deliver Florida. Yeah. <laughs> <sighs> uh, good God. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, I really don't think there are a lot of consolation prizes here. Uh, like, no. I think that if, I mean, I know uh, this is something we talked about several times earlier on the stream. Uh, but, uh, but I, you know, there's a view that you get on the left sometimes that it's actually, uh, well, for various reasons, people say that it would actually be better, right. You know, for, for Trump to win. And one of the reasons they'll give, mm -hmm. uh, is, oh, uh, if, uh, if Biden wins, then, you know, we don't have another shot until 2028, but, you know, Trump wins, 
you know, get this do over in 2024, which one assumes somehow that Biden makes it to two terms and yeah. two, um, I, I think is, I think it's just completely wrong on its own terms because if, um, I mean, again, why did Biden win this time? Like we can say yeah. that he approximately he won because uh, the centrists, you know, the Democratic mm-hmm. Party establishment learned the lesson from 2016 when yeah. the Republican establishment didn't coalesce behind Ruby or whoever when it had the chance. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, but like, why was Biden even somebody who people were willing to vote for in that scenario? Yeah. And and a big part of the reason is that like. Trump was so bad and, and uh, democratic primary voters longing to just like, you know, just go back to normal, which, you know, whatever, like we can pick that apart and all the reasons that's not really possible, but like, that's how they felt. Yeah. Uh, they're longing to go back, just go back to normal was so great that it just seemed like a safer bet to go with Biden than Bernie. Uh, yeah. And uh, in, in t- uh, 2024 primary, even assuming that magically somehow there was a candidate who'd be as successful as Bernie on the left, who I don't know who that would be. Yeah, yeah, uh, but yeah, even, yeah. even if that did happen, uh, then we're still um, we're st- we'd still be in a scenario um, hmm. where that longing to just go back to normal that lead that led people to pick Biden this time would be off the charts. It'd be so much more powerful after eight years of Trump than four years of Trump. Yeah. So if if yeah. there's a if there's a meaningful consolation prize that's not on the level of the sort of thing that I just suggested, I don't know what the hell it is. Right. Yeah. Um, that's a good point. Um, yeah. I mean, that's the thing yeah. too, is the man, the bench is just so thin, like that mid tier bench of like who, you know, like yeah. anyone who is coming up, you know, they've been in the house for like two, three, you know, two years, maybe Ro Khan has been it for four years, but like there is no bench for 2024. That's the, that's the rough thing too. Yeah. Uh, no. No, I don't. I don't don't think it is. Um, I mean, I guess the. uh, (laughs) You know, it is funny. I was saying earlier um, that that when I was I was working on my new book um, at the beginning of the year, you know, I mean, there were times I was thinking, "Man, what's wrong with me? This is so stupid." Uh, By the time this book could possibly come out, um, I, Bernie Sanders is going to be president, and um, and we're going to be like half a million people in DSA. Mm-hmm. And um, and this book, you know, like criticizing all the ways that the, the left uh, is self defeating is just going to seem like weird and irrelevant. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I guess the personal upside for me is that they, they the <laughs> yeah, there you go. There you go. <laughs> really happy for you. It's great. There you yeah. go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very. It yeah. feels good. That's yeah. actually what I remember 2020 as. It's the year that Ben was vindicated. <laughs> <laughs> great year for all of us okay. yeah 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 no that's mm-hmm. right that's, that's what you want right like, like that's the ideal scenario when when yeah. you're when, when you're telling people that um that they're fucking up and we're not going to win uh like what you ideally want is for us to continue to fuck up so so then we lose and then everybody can see that you're right <laughs> that's that is the important thing. Yeah, <laughs> that's the most important thing in that scenario. <laughs> you personally be vindicated. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Jesus Christ! All yeah, right, let's learn. see. Yeah. Um, results. Uh, let's see. Okay, North Carolina is still Trump plus point eight. That hasn't changed. Arizona. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This all. Works the same. Uh, yep. Yeah. So, yep. Yep. Uh, let's see. Yeah. All right. Well, Michigan, Trump's gone from 11 points ahead to 12 points ahead. It's 36% reporting. So I think that's meaningless at this point. Yeah. Uh, uh, Joe Jorgensen's yeah. broken to 1%. She's getting 1.3% in, in Michigan, although oh. I suspect. I suspect that that won't last either when Wayne County comes in. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. Um, it looks like he, uh, Trump's pulling, opening up a lead in Texas. That's a, mm. that's a trick. That would have been, would have been nice. We could stop worrying. Yeah. It would have been. Um, yeah. And yeah, be like the best. Like actually, that'd be kind of the most awesome way for for that to happen. It, uh, that would be incredible. <laughs> yeah, 
lose uh, every swing state, but we get Texas, so fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That would be if Texas turned, we could finally just say fuck you to Florida once and for all. Just right. done. <laughs> As somebody who's lived in Florida. Yeah. <laughs> goodbye. Yeah, goodbye, fuck you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, that's that's right. I um yeah, I lived in I'll um let's see. Um Vic, did you do you used to live in Florida? No. <laughs> I did date a girl from Florida in college though. But so oh, I have okay. so that yeah. Counts. Oh, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. She was Jewish and Cuban, so she had all wow. of the whole uh, <laughs> wow whole experience right there. Oh, yes, you <laughs> essentially dated the state of Florida, so you see. So yeah. Was, then, was yeah, she yeah, also yeah, was she yeah, also yeah. retired sixty five? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, yes. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I lived in I uh, lived in Florida for for six and a half years. I think oh, wow. Mark more than that. Um, Ryan, I believe for for thirty. Is that right? Is that like thirty years? <laughs> about, uh, about I lived there about ten years. Yeah. Well, okay, actually, I've lived there more than that. I lived there for a few years as a kid too. Okay. Uh, yeah. um, Ryan um, Ryan uh, took his time uh, in graduate school. This is how you of- get an award winning dissertation. You don't rush that thing. <laughs> you take your time with it. <laughs> <laughs> oh good god um yep so let's see uh, do, um yep michigan's up to 37 percent. i'm gonna stop checking that uh god that's depressing if he takes michigan god that's just i'll be yeah. so disappointed in in our people uh yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, you think um, like it's it's very hard. I mean, I guess it depends on on how he he wins Michigan if he wins Michigan this time. Um, because yeah. you know, if he just wins it because the uh, the Democratic vote is really low um, for whatever reason, you know that that might happen. I guess that's not too bad. Uh, but if he um, but like, if there are a bunch of people who didn't vote for Trump last time in Michigan who voted for him this time, yeah, uh, like, uh, that's dark. That's yeah. dark. Uh, yeah. can, can you imagine what tonight would be like if there hadn't been a pandemic? Oh yeah, yeah. Like well, he, this is what we do. Yeah. We killed after he caused seventy nine yeah. eleven. Yeah, yeah. Oh, this like, is yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean this. Winning. Yeah. Uh, nightmare economy. He destroyed the economy. He just he just handled the pandemic as badly as possible. That this should take in any presidency easily. Like I mean, sometimes sh- I think I, I wonder if, to a certain extent, his supporters and you know people who are open to supporting him, right? If the pandemic, in, in if his approach to the pandemic, in, in in some way, they're attracted to it because it's let's pretend it's not happening. Let's get back to the real world. You know, who cares if people who aren't me die? You know, people people might just that's a return to normalcy for people, right? Like, yeah, no, that's Maybe. that's true. I and mean, he, yeah, he I mean, that is kind of his explicit pitch, right? I mean, one of his, yeah. one of his last couple of weeks, I remember there's a line about how if you're voting for the Democrats, you're voting for not having weddings and high school graduation parties yeah. and Christmas right. and you know like so yeah. that's the pitch like I'm offering pretending that it's not happening so you can just enjoy your life. And yeah, maybe right. that maybe Biden's whole like you know we're learning to die with it thing maybe that actually didn't play <laughs> play well with voters. Uh yeah yeah, yeah. um <clears throat> Yep, I, I remember that uh, as a uh, as a Chapo observation. It was weird how often when people were praising Biden's virtues, they they mentioned his uh, uh, how good he was at consoling people who were grieving. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was the job that he interviewed yeah. for. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. Oh, you know, America is dying. You can have the the like crazy go out in a blaze of glory way of dying with Biden. Right. With Trump. Yeah. You know, go with Biden, and he'll be very comforting during the last days. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah death with dignity was never the American way. 
Yeah. <laughs> 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 oh, oh, good God. Uh, let's see. Um, well, it looks like in Michigan, Wayne County is still only at around 28%. So that could be okay. swing thing. Okay. That's, but, that's something. That's something. Man, wait, Trump's ahead in Grand Rapids and Flint, and it's half and uh, half the votes are in. That's well, Grand, Ken Grand County Rapids. and Genesee County. I mean, that could be not including absentees, I guess, but I, I would expect that in Grand Rapids. That would make mm. sense. Um, okay. Uh, well, I, I, I guess let's be clear. I'd expect it in, I mean, we, we've been Grand Rapids, we mean like Kent County. Uh, Kent, uh, County. Yeah. Kent County. Kent County. That's yeah, a yeah. real distinction here because. Okay. Um, I think the city of Grand Rapids, yeah. like Western Michigan in general, is pretty conservative. But I think yeah. that the actual like city limits of Grand Rapids is a bit more liberal. Yeah, yeah. right, right. Okay. I will note last time Muskegon County, where I'm from, uh, went for Clinton just barely. It was the, it was like a little lonely island of blue in West Michigan. Um, so hopefully it does the same this time. But yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, fun uh, fun fact: uh, Muskegon, Michigan, uh, uh, gave us uh, gave us Ryan, who of course contributed that cover image to give them an argument, uh, and also um, uh, the deputy editor of uh, Jacobin, Micah Utrecht, uh, is uh, is from Muskegon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, good people, so that, good people out here. Yeah, <laughs> uh, and apparently there used to be. Um, was there some industrial stuff in Muskegon in the early 20th century? Uh, I think so. Yeah. 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 Cause it was apparently uh, Micah. Um, I remember him telling me a while back that he discovered some, like, like the communist party had some sort of um, Muskegon publication in the thirties, which is just like a weird thing to know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You, know, you wouldn't really <laughs> expect it. Uh, you know, you yeah. Know. That, that was news to me. I only discovered it cause you pointed, pointed out uh, his tweet to me, but yeah, that's, that's yeah. kind of amazing. <laughs> yeah. Oh, good God. Yeah. yeah. Um, Yep. Let's see. Ohio, Trump is ahead at six with 80% uh, reporting. Um, yeah, the three That's places with, with the needles, um, Florida, North Carolina, and Georgia, uh, it's um, all, all three of them, the needle is indicating Trump. Uh, interestingly yeah. enough, uh, by the least in Georgia, although it's still saying 81% for Trump in Georgia. Mm. So okay. kind of make that one. Yeah, Georgia yeah. looks like there's a lot still outstanding. Like uh, Fulton County, where Atlanta is, is still at 37 mm -hmm. percent votes in. So okay, uh, yeah. what's yeah? Meanwhile, Arizona seems to be going for Biden with some. Yeah. This is such a weird election. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I heard that the Arizona race that, uh, I mean, and we'll have to see how uh, Mark Kelly's doing, but the, the Senate candidate might be carrying Biden a little bit there, actually, because, um, you know, everybody loves an astronaut who, you know, <laughs> he's, sure, he's, yeah. like, you know he's a good candidate. <laughs> All right. yeah. um, so uh, David Griscom is going to come back on the stream. Oh, sweet. Uh, yep. Which, uh, so... Um, Maybe he'll uh, have some sort of positive perspective. This is actually also a uh, a particular meeting that I'd like because um, uh, because uh, I yeah um, because because uh, I always I'm always I always sort of associate um, David Griscom and Mark Warren in my head because they're both they're both very tall Texans, uh, <laughs> um, and so I'm always very like. Um, like every time I, I, I like, uh, every time I get drunk with Griscom and, and then like, I'm reminded that he can't put away whiskey the way that Mark can, uh, I'm always <laughs> you know, I'm always like, no, it's, this isn't how tall Texans are, you know, like, you should, you know, <laughs> he's tall too. I didn't, I didn't realize he was tall. Yeah, yeah. He's a pretty tall guy. I mean, he's not like Mark Warren tall. Mark Warren, if, if he, he's sitting down now, but he's like freakish, uh, mm -hmm. in his height. Uh, but but that, 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 it pisses me off that he's tall too because <laughs> <laughs> you 
you know, Ben, ben introduces Chris Kuba as his, his second favorite Texan after his wife. Yeah. <laughs> and I remember the first time I heard that, I was walking my dog. <laughs> I, I, I scared a neighbor because I was what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> I actually had the exact same reaction. Like, wait, it's not Mark. Mark's not the yeah. first favorite. So like, <laughs> well, I, I did. I did correct myself about thirty seconds later. Yeah, 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 I literally thought that he meant that I was his first, his favorite Texan. <laughs> that, was, no, that was that was literally my first thought. It's like, oh, that's sweet. Mark is just. Oh wait, no, his, right. His wife is also a Texan. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, awesome. <laughs> yeah. Um. Yeah. Yeah. No. Then. Uh, then I guess after. Uh, after. After the number three spot, it gets less obvious. Well, we've got. Yeah. I mean, we've got Noel Alphonse. He's got to be up there somewhere in the. Uh, in that. In the top five, at least. Ted Cruz. Yeah. <laughs> sure. sure, sure. <laughs> yeah. Ted Cruz, right, 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 yeah. right. Beto, Beto O'Rourke, you know. Beto O'Rourke, yeah. Did yeah. you see? Uh, actually, I think, you know, the thing, something I used to talk to uh, to Michael about um, was how we really, uh, we really shared a fondness for 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 Trump, uh, not as a politician, but as an insult comic. Yeah. Uh, and um, <laughs> you know, like, yeah. like he really, when he's on, he's on. Mm -hmm. And uh, and and one of the things I think that I saw. Uh, that I was, you know, one of the times I was like, oh, fuck, I wish I could text Michael about this was the, uh, when um, John Bolton's book came out and, uh, and it said that uh, Trump had referred to Juan Guaido as the Beto O'Rourke convention. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so good. So good. Yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, and why couldn't uh, Trump just be an insult comic? Why couldn't he just do that? Yeah. Oh boy! <laughs> oh boy! David, how you doing? Man? <laughs> how are y'all doing? Good. Oh, good. Right, in there. <laughs> oh man, it's looking pretty wild. I mean, sorry, I don't mean to just jump in the middle of everybody. If y'all no, were going, no, we were hoping you'd come in and cheer us up. That okay, was, uh... well, I have no good news on. That. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's it's been pretty wild to watch for the past couple hours. I mean, I, I yeah, like. The, the thing I'll say is this is like, I actually do think it's still pretty early not to say like the same old thing that every dumbass on CNN is saying right now. Yeah. Um, but the narrative that we were sold uh, yeah. has been proven completely yeah. false. And I yeah, think, absolutely. I think um, not to do too much Texas talk, but I think it is an important state because that was such like an outlandish claim uh, yeah. that they were going to win Texas. Um, yeah. I think it's like really uh, horrific to actually see the results as they're coming in. Uh, that Biden, for example, is just like did not do very well in South Texas, yeah. a part of the state that Bernie, yeah, killed in. Mm -hmm. um, and, and all in, he had, all they had to do was hire Chuck Rocha for <laughs> you know, Latino <laughs> Outreach Coordinator, and 100%. they would be killing it right now. Yeah, a hundred percent. But they they saw a model that worked. With, you know, I guess it's like what makes me mad is we had this narrative that like, oh, the Bernie coalition is just so out of touch with POC mm -hmm. and what they yeah. really like. It's not policies that help them, but they like it like, you know, they like more dance scenes or whatever the hell, uh, you know, they were pushing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, you know, and and we're seeing right now, it's like not only, I mean, look, it's not that Trump's winning those parts of the, the country or anything like that, but it's just, there's just no enthusiasm for, for Joe Biden there. No. no. Or anywhere. <laughs> Do you know how that um how uh that candidate in Austin is just Siegel? Do you know how he's Mike doing? Siegel. Yeah. I should check. So the last I saw, the uh, Secretary of State in Texas had shut down um mm. their their stuff. But I will double I'll double check that as we're going. I mean, like for fun news, you know, uh, it looks like Austin's going to get a you know a train, a metro train, which they desperately need. Uh, okay, nice. Proposition yes. A pass. So that's oh, yeah, traffic is like horrible over there, right? <laughs> yeah, it's really yeah. bad. I don't know. I mean, I'm looking for I'm looking for pauses, right? I don't know. It's still it's like it's too early. Oh, uh, to DC decriminalized yeah. shrooms. <laughs> did they really? Oh, right. yeah, yeah, they did. Oh, hey, all right. Seventy to thirty. Oh. Uh, nice. That's a consolation prize right there. There you go. 
All right. Thank you, N Starks 007 for the uh, for the super chat. It says good love for New York good night. Um, yeah. Well, I hope when you wake up that it turns out that Feldman was right. Um, and, yeah. You know. Anyway. Good night. <laughs> Hey, I gotta go too. I gotta. Uh, I I didn't expect to be on this long. I'm, I gotta actually give my daughter medicine at eleven o'clock. So. Oh my god! Oh, Do you hear uh, nothing that David told you? Yeah. <laughs> you think I just shouldn't give her the medicine? <laughs> just start. Yeah. Just start withholding now. I think that's <laughs> what Feldman was telling you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, he said to stop loving them. I don't. I guess what that means in terms of medicine is up to you. But, uh, <laughs> Uh, Stop appreciate coddling it. them, Mark. Come on. When, when I told um, when I told my wife Jennifer uh, this morning that that I'd invited uh, Mark on, and, and she was like, "Oh, Mark, Mark, or Mark," and I was like, "Yeah, I, th I think I think he and uh, and Feldman would have a funny interaction." And she said, "Yeah, I mean, Mark would have a funny interaction with a worm, you know, like like it's funny." <laughs> so, uh, it's true. It's true. Uh, all right. Thanks, brother. Uh, yeah, hey, David. Um... I don't know. It was a little awkward. We didn't talk to each other, but we have to have a. We're gonna have to hash this out at some point, you know. Uh, oh, <laughs> who's the better? You don't know what I'm talking about. Yeah, no, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> this is a question about which who right. is uh, Ben's favorite Texan, and I thought you should be a gun longer, but. <laughs> yeah, so. yeah next, next time. Death with the Bowie knife. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> the obvious way to solve that. Uh, yeah. Toy Tank the Texan says, way. Yeah. Uh, if they aren't getting their own medicine, they'll never be able to compete in the marketplace. So it's something to think about. Yeah, uh, yeah. Good point. It's a good point. All right. Maybe, maybe it's time for tough love. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Love you, Ben. See you. All right. Good night, y'all. Um. All right. Yeah, just the people like it's still looking. Um, it's eighty-one percent, or what I'm seeing right now on the Secretary of State for Texas uh, ten, which is you know Mike Siegel's race, um, and uh, he's losing unfortunately. All right, um, but who knows? Who knows what the story is? It looks like Harris County slow to show up. Um, okay, we'll see. Which is Houston? If people aren't familiar, right? Yeah. yeah. Um. So Anok, uh, I believe this is my patron Edwin. Um, uh, thank you for the super chat. Uh, says Ben and Griscom together for an election stream. Hell yeah! What do you guys think Sam Harris's thoughts are in the current election? Uh, <laughs> oh, good lord! Uh, it'd be good if it, it'd be good if Mark was around for this because there was a point yeah. actually a few years ago uh, at Mark's wedding um, yeah. that uh, that that Mark and Ryan and I were were sitting around. It was a uh, it, uh, at the at the venue. Um, uh, you know, a little drunk and a little high, I think. And, uh, and, and we, and we had this idea that we actually like, I think spent hours talking about, about how we were going to uh, start a website called Sam Harris is wrong.com. There would be nothing <laughs> but a uh, yeah. constantly updated list of all the things that he was wrong about. <laughs> yeah. I, so, so, I mean, I haven't listened to Sam Harris in a while. i Bet he thought Biden was going to win tonight, so this just might oh, be so this time. Is another thing. <laughs> Sam, Sam Harris was wrong about, yeah. He's, he's, he's wrong about uh, Palestine. He's wrong yeah. about meta ethics. Uh, he's he's wrong. Uh, he's wrong about race and IQ. He's he's, he's wrong about determinism, and he's he's also wrong about what was going to happen tonight. Yeah. Um, now a lot of us were also wrong about, it, but that's not the subject. The subject <laughs> yeah. no, no. wrong. Let's let's stay on topic. <laughs> what I what I'd like to hear if I can make a request of the YouTube chat is for somebody to report on uh, what they're doing on the Joe Rogan stream right now because I oh. flipped over to it a couple times and uh, oh, they they were yeah. complaining. I do not know what state they were complaining about. Uh, you know, restrictions on how many people you can have over for Thanksgiving dinner. Oh, um, <laughs> come on, come <laughs> you're on. Bored and stuff. Yeah. Um, so I'd be curious to see what's going on yeah. there. So, so, so Alex Jones is on right now. I don't know if he's on just right now. I know that he's oh, popping he in. Yeah, okay. he's popping. Oh, yeah. So is Wait, Cal Kalinsky's doing it with him, right? Kalinsky's yeah, yeah. there so, too. So, so, yeah, so yeah, the yeah. Joe Rogan stream tonight, uh, as I understand it, is uh, <laughs> actually is Kyle, Kyle Kalinsky and 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 Alex Jones, which is very funny to me for several reasons. Uh, if if you're not familiar with with Kyle, he's a um, 
he's like a left wing YouTuber um, who who you know who I like, you know, and he's he's somebody, um, you know, he'll and um, and you know whatever. I mean, like like I I would appreciate it every once in a while. Somebody will send me. It's like, oh yeah, Kyle Kalinske talked to you up on the you know on the stream today or whatever, and, and they'll send me the clip. Um, okay. And uh, you know Alex Jones uh, is <laughs> one of the world's most entertaining lunatics. Yeah. Uh, so well, uh, I can't imagine <laughs> what the combination is like. Uh, that that does sound interesting. Uh, I, so I guess Joe's just being fair and balanced. Uh, I, I, and, I, <laughs> I mean, the thing about Joe Rogan is that it's always it's always exciting because you never know where to come down on anything. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's yeah. like a. You know, it's it's like a surprise Santa thing. What's going to be in the box? You know, like yeah. could, like he could think <laughs> anything. Uh, is is how Joe Rogan generally works. Um, and you know, I, I say that even as somebody who's uh, sort of a defender of Joe Rogan, I think that like some people on the left uh, are are hypercritical of him in ways that like really get his politics wrong. I think, mm -hmm. uh, but also only sort of a defender of him because I think a big part of what they're missing is how incoherent he is. Yeah, uh, like it's, it's not like he has some sort of right wing worldview. He's just yeah. he's just all over the place because yeah, he yeah. spends most of his time thinking about like psychedelics and mixed martial arts and you know like half yeah. a dozen other topics besides politics. Yeah. Uh, and then when he does talk about politics, he has a bunch of political impulses, but they haven't really cohered together into a consistent <laughs> worldview. Yeah. Um, so so he's just all over the place. Um, yeah. I did see uh, earlier. <laughs> Oh, somebody in the chat says Rogan stream is talking about disinformation in MMA. That's perfect. <laughs> that's, that's pretty good. <laughs> nice. Actually, uh, if I uh, can, we play a quick game. Um, yeah. So guess so there. So people were right that Sam Harris is definitely a little uh, upset about the results so far. Uh -huh. um, but guess what he is blaming the problem. Um, I'm, honestly, it's a slam donkey. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm, uh, um, yeah, social SJW, so just social justice warriors. I mean, no, I exactly, uh, yeah. whatever happens, can we agree that defund the police was among the most idiotic phrases ever uttered in the hopes of achieving a political goal? There you go, there <laughs> reality you go. check businesses are boarding their windows throughout the United States out of concern that a the left might riot, b the right might riot. Both or C, both A and B. <laughs> yep. Yep. Our boy, our boy is just yep. spouting nonsense out there. But seriously, this website would just write itself every day. We wouldn't, it would be no work at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's, uh, I don't know. I mean, that's so out of touch. I mean, it's just like, you know, I think what's being, which is more clear. Um, than anything from what we've seen so far is the problem with the Joe Biden campaign wasn't that they were asking for too much or presenting too much. It was literally that their whole campaign was, you know, centered around the idea of him not being Donald Trump, which at the end of the day yeah. only makes Donald Trump seem more formidable. And, you know, unfortunately, yeah, right. there's a lot of people who like that means something to it. They like to see somebody who's strong and, you know. Yeah, uh, you know, it's, it's yeah. seen as a yeah. powerful person. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's sure. a bad strategy. Uh, yeah. yeah, actually, funny story. Um, in uh, 2018, I guess uh, I think that's right. Uh, I spent three weeks teaching in China, uh, Jilin University, which is in like extreme northern China, like almost up at the border with North Korea. Uh, they they had this international education weeks thing where they'd like bring a bunch of people in to teach these three week classes. And yeah, it was great. Right. I mean, I'd, I'd really recommend it to anybody. It was, it was a, it was a fun time. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, had, uh, you know, ate, ate tons of good food, had a, uh, you know, had, had lots of, of like crazy, uh, whatever they call the clear liquor in China. I don't even remember. Uh, but, um, but one of the weirder things that happened to me then was uh, I, uh, there was one of the people there for the International Education Weeks was the Swedish uh, American Marxist anthropologist, and he he got excited because he found out that at Jilin University, um, like lots of universities in China, they had this uh, Marxism department, and he was like, oh, what do they teach in Marxism classes in China? He was like really fascinated to like find out, so he was going to do a meeting with them. So I was like, oh, I you know, I tagged along to to it. I really want to see this, and there were a couple of Marxism teachers. And um, like one of them talked more than the other. There was like a student there to translate. And um, in this 
brief meeting, uh, what we found out uh, was um, that the uh, the main things that they taught people in these Marxism class uh, were about um, uh, self-discipline and building up the Chinese nation, you know, those two concepts that Marx was constantly talking about. And, uh, and um, like the, the, the Swedish guy kept trying to like sort of shift the topic to economics and they had a few vaguely left-wing thoughts about it, but it was like nothing you wouldn't get in the Paul Krugman column. It was like <laughs> stuff, about, you know, uh, avoiding bubbles and things like that. And, wow. um, and then the very last thing before we had to leave, cause one of them had to go to, to, to class, uh, was that uh, they marks one of the Marxism professors said that he liked Donald Trump better than Barack Obama because he was a strong leader. There you go. <laughs> so, the, the Marxist it, science. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I think they've crossed the event horizon uh, in that regard, but um, yeah. Uh, but yeah, right. I mean, I think it does help him. Uh, I mean, if the if the issue is it's. I mean, whatever. I mean, I, I would have thought that this year, if any year, not being Trump was going to work, this this would be it. I, I don't know. Yep. Um, but uh, but generally think, speaking, know. when somebody runs on not being the other guy, they lose. Well, so, I mean, yeah. I mean, I, I don't mean to be the uh, you know to push back too much because I'm very much on this like this is a disaster, a sinking ship uh, kind of train, and I'm almost regretting every conversation I've had you know the past like 72 hours on this. Um, just because, I mean, I'll admit that I, I thought that this was going to play out a little bit different. You know, I was just, I mean, like, I don't know, like, uh, not to get too much of my own personal stuff, but it's just like, you know, doing this as I, I do now, I feel a little bit bad, uh, not digging deeper into things and sort of accepting the general narrative on this. I don't know why, um, I would have thought that it would have been any different this time, but I don't know. I mean, like, I don't know if it's necessarily lost yet. Um, I, I really do think that we might see a shift as, you know, Michigan and Wisconsin start to come into play. Yeah. Um, and I think what is going to be really funny about this is like, if those do flip it, because it does seem like these kind of wild fantasies that like Texas and Georgia were going to lead to a Biden victory. Yeah. Um, it's going to be very ironic uh, to see that, like, you know, if Joe Biden is able to squeak out a win here, mm -hmm. that he'll be doing it basically on like the, uh, you know, the white working class union vote right. that was such the, yeah you know, the, the group that was attacked for so long for these past four years, no. uh, you know, post Trump. Um, I don't know, just like the opposite narrative of what they were sort of presenting their, right. their strategy and plan to be. Yeah. 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 Is there, is there any sense Ben about Michigan? Um, is it just going to be a long slog? Is it, are we going to kind of think it's going to be a long slog? Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know if it's going to be. Um, you know, the problem is we might have that like red mirage kind of situation uh, where where Trump uh, is slightly ahead at the end of the night, even though he didn't he didn't really win. Uh, because mm -hmm. I believe, if I'm remembering right, uh, the um, I don't think this was the courts. I think this was. I think this was like the state legislature in Michigan might have even passed something to say you couldn't actually start counting anything uh, yeah. until uh, until election day. Yeah, I think Michigan uh, the states. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, so yeah. since you know, since I imagine that like everywhere else, most people voted in advance. Um, mm -hmm. You know, then. I think that's really prone to that kind of situation uh, mm -hmm. where uh, where Biden probably won, but it would, you know, it like at that point, you're in this really dangerous territory of arguing about which ballots you're going to count. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, um, yeah and I mean, like, um, I, I'm just on the New York Times site as they're like, you know, going through the results, <laughs> and it's like the absentee votes uh, for Biden in Michigan, you know, 65 to 33. Yeah. I don't know how I don't know how many uh, you know that's like 270 280,000 for Biden. I don't know how this 13% of the of the total. So I don't know how fully representative that is, but you know it's very funny too how that that political dynamic is showing up just even in the way that people are voting. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The yeah. It's, yeah, it's insane that, that should be a political divide. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, and that's it's also the weird thing about this like I mean, whatever. It's not an original point, but it's just weird uh, that uh, that like 
the the Trump campaign like seems so committed to making these voters single use, like uh, you know, like like we're gonna bring them to the rallies, we're gonna get them to vote for right. us, and you know, if they die, they die. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Like, 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 not even just COVID. There were also like a couple times when they left like these huge numbers of rally attendees out in the yeah. cold. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. multiple yeah. times. It's wild. Yeah. It's <laughs> it's insane. Yeah. And in Omaha, Omaha, at least they like harvested ballots at the rally, and then they were like, "Okay, cool, get hypothermic." <laughs> yeah. Not even cab fare. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, Oh, oh, I should get God. going here too. All right. Uh, All right. I'll, uh, ben, I'll thanks for having me on. Yeah. All right. Jason, David, nice to meet you. Meet it was you. nice to meet you too. Love you, man. Love Bye. you too. Bye. Yeah, y'all. I don't know. This is, uh, I know. I mean, again, it's still super early. And I, it's like you're watching this and, you know, I don't know. We're all sort of nerdy guys. We're getting a little giddy watching like the election results coming up, trying to figure out what they mean. Right. Um, I still think that they're, I don't know. I'm just like, I'm going back and forth to being like, all right, this seems, I'm getting very much like 2016 vibes. Um, and then reminding myself that actually like these results are actually coming in very, very slowly. Even. Yeah. Um, right. I mean, so much is because of the mail-in ballots. I mean, because around this time they had already called it for Trump in, in 2016, if I remember correctly. At least yeah. you know somewhere around yeah, midnight. midnight I think. Yeah, you yeah. know, so we're approaching that. I mean, who knows? But uh, um, I, I don't know. I, I think like the I think the best result that we can sort of hope for right now is that we get a squeaky Biden win. Um, yeah. But this kind of narrative that they were pushing that they had figured out some new formula to win politics uh, in, in the United States going forward. <laughs> Uh, it's just proven to be completely incorrect that this kind of symbolic neoliberal politics is just not going to work. Uh, yeah. yeah, and even if they did win, that would be such an uneasy coalition, right? Because the he got part of what you know was going to put him over the top, right? Was oh, he's getting like a sliver more senior voters now than you know he's converted some senior voters uh, from Trump voters and. They were not going to stick around necessarily post pandemic, you know. Well, it's dude, it's an old people's election, and that's like yeah, the, that's the thing that's very funny about it. It's like the Republican states, like mm -hmm. so, like Texas, Georgia, South Carolina, all those places. It's just the elderly group of people who are you know typical voters there are voting Republican, right. and uh, you know what it's looking like at least from some of the exit polls and things that I'm seeing that are making me feel confident about mm -hmm. Michigan and Wisconsin. Is that elderly voters there? Right. Um, you know, switch um, flip to Biden. So it's just yeah. like I don't know, like the story of this election actually being like old guys again. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's just it, it just is very opposite of the kind of uh, you know yeah portrait that we've been being painted. <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, so Cole Heiderman, thank you for the super chat. Uh, says I asked earlier, but didn't stick around and chat for the answer. What are y'all drinking? Thanks for doing this, but in and out, trying to prevent anxiety by not focusing on the election exclusively. So um, uh, I am drinking uh, uh, Whistle Pig, which is a rye. Um, nice. So it's, uh, it's it's pretty good. It's like one of these nice. Um, it's like a uh, they do like they have this nice thing where it like. Like it goes down very smooth, but you get this like really strong rye aftertaste. So um, Ooh, nice. That's, oh, uh, that sounds good. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a I'm trying to support uh, you know a good working class uh, victory in this great state of Michigan. I believe I, should, I hope I don't have to eat my words. Uh, <laughs> I'm enjoying. Uh, where is it? Where's my camera? There we go. Our friend oh, Bells. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Log Logger of the lakes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I actually uh, lived for two years in uh, Kalamazoo, uh, which is where the uh, Bell's Brewery is. Um, I, I did, uh, I got my master's degree at Western Michigan, which is in Kalamazoo. So it's like kind of funny to look back on now because like people would go out to that brewery where it just to like get a drink or whatever. And it was like, it, it was, it was like kind of even boring option. It's like, oh yeah, I get to go to again. Right. Uh, <laughs> like now it's like, oh, that sounds nice. 
Nice. That's all. You know, I mean, Michigan, uh, I mean, if we're doing uh, booze takes for a second, <laughs> best states for beer are Hell Maine, yeah. Maine, Michigan, um, Colorado, and Oregon. I just okay. think, by yeah. Far, I mean, there's good beers in all all states. Don't get me wrong, but I feel like that's a, a seal of approval for me. If I know it's from those states, I usually have a lot of trust in it. Especially Maine, man. Maine, Maine's blown my mind, and I might. Huh. I mean, I don't know. It's obviously, it's regional. When I'm back in Texas, I, I like. It's all Texas beers, which is great, but I can't get those around here. So maybe I'm drinking too much Maine right. beer because I'm in New York right now. But Maine, <laughs> I love Maine beers, man. Maine Beer Company is great. <laughs> right. What's which ones are based in Maine? What's like? What's the microbrewery you'd uh, recommend? Um, I think Maine Maine uh, Beer Company is the best oh, okay. um, by far. Is Allagash is Allagash in Maine too? I might oh. be wrong about that. Yeah, yeah. Allagash is in Maine. Allagash is Maine. I, ha- I was having Allagash earlier. That's why. Nice. It's funny. Allagash is good as hell. Um, I don't know, man. Just places like you know where you have a lot of opportunities to spend time on a craft, but also right. Uh, not so much. like New York. New York craft beers. Like there's some fancy ones, obviously that are really good, but they're too gimmicky. I, yeah. I find, across the board, um, I don't want a beer that is like syrup. And you know the only reason people want it is because it's like a quadruple hopped IPA or whatever the hell. Right, right. <laughs> you know my favorite my favorite Michigan brewery is Founders. I was I was just gonna bring up. Oh Founders. yeah, they're great. I'm actually a big fan of theirs. I was actually there. Um, yeah, also a place uh, that that I used to live. Uh, uh, Grand Rapids is is where I um, uh, went to undergrad, and it's where the Founders Brewery is. And I was I was just there uh, last summer. It's it's really nice. I like. Um, yeah, I like I like founders a lot. Like I'm 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 pretty regionally loyalist about my my. Uh, <laughs> it's usually one of those two. Oberon's another good uh, Michigan one. I well, like yeah, it. Oberon's is is a Bell's, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah, it's but yeah, oh, but I, I love Oberon. I mean, that's 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 probably my favorite beer. Um, that's always like one of the things. Um, a little bit less so now because it's. Um, it's become more popular, so it's a little easier to get everywhere else. But like it, it was that was always kind of a thing um, when I was living other places, and I'd come back over the summer and you know visit my family. I'd uh, you know that like coming back to Michigan over the summer, you know, since it's a seasonal thing, you know, I get the uh, get the bells over on, and you know that always made it feel like a Michigan, like you're back home. Um, I mean, that was like me with Shiner uh, Bach for a long time, which is like my one of my favorite beers. That's like my go-to. But you can get it up in New York now, uh, which is nice for me. But it, yeah, I don't get that same kind of like excitement when I when I get it when I'm back in Texas, just because you know I'm still drinking all the time up here. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't know. It's like it's it's always sad. You know, another thing that's really sad. Uh, Vic, you're, are you back in New York? I, I've asked you. This yeah, before. yeah, I'm I'm still in New York. Um, but you know, for our friends down in DC, yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. One of my favorite, you know, beers from around that area is Natty Bo. Have you, y'all ever had? Natty oh yeah, Bo yeah, yeah. Well, that's technically Baltimore. <laughs> oh no, no, it's hundred percent Baltimore. Yeah, hundred percent Baltimore, no yeah. doubt about it. Well, unfortunately, though, it's actually all made in in Georgia now because all those corporations brew uh-huh. in these massive sites. Right. Uh, Lone, Lone Star is a similar thing, unfortunately, too. Um, but anyways, I bring up Natty Bo because whatever your uh, you know local cheap beer um, is always gonna be good and a good time. But Natty Bo, I think, like takes it to a devotion uh, that I haven't found in other places, including the fact that there is a cocktail uh, called a Natty Teeny, uh, <laughs> which is probably the most Maryland Baltimore thing you'll ever have. That's great. Um, so it's what you do is you take a glass, like a you know, like a pint glass, and you give it an Old Bay rim. And then you pour your Natty Bow in, and it's a Natty Teeny. <laughs> Very fancy from the folks down in Baltimore. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I think uh, actually Founders, I'll, I'll also say, like I think one of the things I, I like about them is they, they do they do some really good uh, bourbon barrel ales. They have like a few of those. Uh, nice. Um, uh, you know, you know me. I'm gonna like, you know, I'm gonna like beer, beer more when it tastes like whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> oh boys, what the hell's happening? It's uh, uh nothing good. <laughs> yeah, 
I'm trying to see. Like, uh, it seems like things have kind of. I don't know. I feel like the numbers haven't shifted in a little while. I think we're gonna hit that for for uh, a bit. Honestly, I think we're not gonna get Michigan for a while. Yeah. Um, okay. Wisconsin says there's no. This is from. Uh, uh, let me double check this. Um, Bloomberg Bloomberg News reporter who covers the U.S. Treasury, uh, Saleha uh, Mosin, right? So, um, but uh, Matt Leck just sent this to me. Uh, Wisconsin says there's no way they're announcing tonight. Michigan needs until Friday. Pennsylvania isn't coming out anytime soon either. Uh, these are per officials of those states. Okay. Um, so that seems to be the scenario that we've all been, honestly, it's not necessarily uh, a surprise there. Um, but it definitely makes anything happening in the interregnum. You know, we're just sort of waiting for Godot. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, yeah. So somebody in the chat points out, right? I mean, technically we are, uh, they say I'm looking at Biden 192, Trump 114. But I think the problem is that's not really the the number you have to look at, right? I mean, they, what you have to look at, um, you know, because I think, I don't think the pop, like, um well, look, the popular vote—I don't think is in any doubt—and the um, uh, and and like the the states that you know, like safe state number, like safe state numbers that have come in aren't right. aren't right. California has been called. So. Yeah, yeah. So that like so obviously he's going to get a bunch of electoral votes for California, but that doesn't matter because that was already big. Yeah. Game. So the reason to answer the uh, person in the chat's question for all the doom and gloom is that uh, is that in the in the states that are actually going to decide it, you know, that that some of them don't don't look good right now. I mean, obviously, you know, we'll still see, uh, it, it sounds to me, uh, like, uh, like we're, we're at a point, uh, where I think we could rule out, um, maybe not rule out, but you know, I, I think it's probably not going to be called tonight. Right. No, like, I, I mean, who knows, but, uh, uh, I don't think so. In if, if, uh, sorry, I didn't mean to take the lead on this, no, but no, uh, please, I'm just yeah. pulling up other things. Yep. If people are curious, the, um, the Senate races. Oh, um, yeah. I don't want to push too many of these early early results, but, you know, uh, Tuberville, who is a pig in Alabama, of course, was beating Jones. I mean, Jones is just a, a, just a boring ghost, yeah. um, really represented nothing, and he won his election because he's literally up against the fucking actual right. pedophile. <laughs> I mean, in, like, the most absurd way. So that was an obvious loss for the Democrats, I think. Uh, Lindsey Graham looks like he's run away uh, yeah. with the Senate election in South oh, yeah. Carolina. Wow. Um, but what is interesting is what we're seeing from Arizona. Yeah. Uh, where uh, Mark Kelly uh, seems to be uh, running away with that Senate seat, the Democrat there. So that could be a good pickup um, for them. And it's interesting because that's coming at a much larger margin than we're seeing for Biden already. Like, so a lot yeah. of people are splitting the ticket. Um, they're not actually voting for for Kelly, um, but for Trump for president for God knows what reason. Yeah. Um, everyone's least favorite neoliberal, uh, Osif in Georgia looks like he's gonna be kicked. Ooh, he's getting crushed pretty hard. It's still super early, it's like 65% reporting. So, like, you know, who knows if there's counties that are missing? Um, that would show a big time for him, but. He's getting beat pretty badly while Warnock, um, who's the Democrat running in the special election, is uh, much closer. Yeah. Um, I This is super um, early, and I don't know if this is verified, but my friend uh, who works in the media and is doing uh, a show f about, you know, the elections right now just texted me to say that it looks like Biden won Arizona. So that's that's okay. significant. Okay. But yeah, I don't know. I don't know where he's getting that from. But that's he's like he's in the war room. He's in the Democratic war room right now in Pennsylvania. Okay. So he might be getting information a little bit earlier than the rest of yeah. us. It says it's seventy five percent counted, so that that might be enough. That you know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's just like this is the sort of uh, I don't know, y'all. I mean. I, I feel like what we're seeing, though, there's no doubt about it that the polling was wrong again. Yeah. Right? All wrong. I mean, if it's 
yeah, more wrong than last time, if anything. Because last time it really was in like the margin of error, right? And for the popular vote, especially. But like Biden was a supposedly eight ahead. And, you know, it's fine because the poll said Hillary was three ahead. And, you know, she wound up, you know, being only two ahead. But yeah. like, if it's, if it's he was supposed to be eight ahead and now it's like three, you know, or two, <laughs> that's insane. <laughs> Did, did y'all talk about this Amy McGrath and uh, and uh, the Turtle Boy in Kentucky? No. Oh yeah, she got smoked, just well, destroyed. I mean, yeah. that's I mean yeah. that that was just a weird like. Um, I mean, that's that's like almost a scam at that point. Oh right? yeah, she was like taking money from Democrats around the country. Actually, you know, this this was something that I wanted to see, but so she actually is running at similar margins to Paula Jean in West Virginia and uh, Marquita Bradshaw in Tennessee. They're all like around 35, 65, wow. you know? And so, you know, even with a million dollars, she got the same percentage of the vote that like neighboring progressive candidates did in that region. So there's really, that that's the, you know, that's the natural experiment right there, right? All else being equal, you know, a moderate needs like a million dollars to get the same percentage of the vote that like a progressive does in Appalachia. Right. Well, it's just, I mean, it's disgusting um, what what happened with her. Uh, oh, yeah. Just, I mean, just because like she like, yes, I mean, you know, I, I made a comment on Twitter about like, you know, it's, it's despicable what happened where when. Let me catch my train of thought here. One storyline that I think is really important for people to understand, especially people who are listening to this show, um, is that there is there are people who work in this field in politics um, who are interested in winning power and doing things with that power. Uh, most of them are very delusional, delusional about like what it is that they're going to do, but they are interested in the kind of end result of politics. And then there is another group of people who are so cynical. It's, it's, it's hard to really describe them if you haven't met any of them before. And they are all in it for numbers and particularly money. Um, and the kind of idea that like, you know, the electric, the electorate is like just something to be manipulated. Uh, you know, politics is all show and theater and they measure um, their success not by winning elections and, you know, doing things like, you know, Medicare for all or expanding healthcare access. Uh, but but how much money their candidate was able to raise, and um, uh, you know how much percentage points they were able to get per dollar spent on ad buys, things like that. Um, I just think people need to understand that dynamic to understand what happened in Kentucky, uh, where a group of people thought realized that like we can sell a bunch of assholes in Park Slope, uh, New York, uh, in Los Angeles. Hell in Austin, Texas, which is you know another big piggy bank, honestly, for the Democratic Party too. Um, this idea that all these idiots in Kentucky they'll vote for uh, you know a Democrat if we just say that this person is you know pro war a little bit and pro Trump too, um, and they'll we'll just be able to you know fundraise an incredible amount of money off that that idea, um, and you know and they did it and they were definitely right about their donors. <laughs> yeah. uh, they were 100% wrong about the voters in Kentucky. And I think that's really, it's just such a shame because I love Charles Booker's yeah. campaign. The idea from the hood to the holler looked very, very uh, promising. Not even necessarily saying that he, he was going to win outright, but at least they're doing something with that campaign. Right. And right. building coalitions and communities. Uh, just, just, to, uh, just interject, by the way, for yeah. what it's worth, uh, Fox called Arizona for Biden. There we go. So that's the that's the you know that's a move. Um, I don't know. They they definitely uh, were just dead wrong in in Kentucky, and it's a shame to you know, it's yeah. a shame to see. Well, but you know, that's a that's a big that's a big pickup for Biden. I actually didn't think that Arizona was going to go that way. Yeah, yeah, it is. I mean, I'm still um uh I mean, it's not well, okay. So I mean, whatever you thought before today was going to happen, um you know, if you've been kind of following it for the last few hours, it was pretty consistently trending that way. Um but uh but yeah, I mean, look, it like a, this is a good thing. I don't know 
Uh, I don't know how much it nudges up the chances that it could actually be called tonight. I'm still kind of thinking no, but uh, but but still, yeah, it's big. No, I mean, I think it's big. I mean, I think Nevada goes, you know, uh, blue here. I think Montana goes to Trump, right? So that's the West is settled at this point. You know, Hawaii and Alaska are sort of automatic, right? Right. Um, I think Texas is looking like unless there's just some insane story that we've missed that a bunch of rural Texans have all just voted overwhelmingly for Joe Biden out of nowhere. <laughs> uh, it's looking like that's going going to go to Trump. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I mean, I'm telling you, it's sort of been what everybody knew. I, first of all, I mean, I'm just doing my predictions right now, which is a stupid thing to do. Uh, sure. it's, I'm going to eat my words later, but you know, we have to, we have to fill some time. Um, I think Iowa goes Democrat. I think Wisconsin goes blue. I'm feeling Michigan's going to go blue, as is Minnesota. Um, Ohio's going to Trump. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, we're going to play a Pennsylvania game, man. I mean, but I think yeah. like with those, with those states, though, I think like uh, being able, Biden being able to like reclaim uh, Wisconsin and Michigan, I think, can settle the board. Because there's not really, I mean, I think Trump's going to take Florida too, and uh, yeah, and Georgia. But um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's just like, obviously, we don't know. It's just, uh, I, I think that the the big wins that Biden would need to sort of change the narrative for Tuesday night, November third, twenty twenty. Um, I don't think any of those states are going to come anywhere close to a result before midnight tonight, yeah. and I'm sure not until tomorrow. Probably even later. I think Pennsylvania is going to take two two days, actually. At least. Yeah, they actually I, officials have said they expect most votes will be counted by Friday. So yeah, so because <laughs> oh, they also extended the mail in ballot deadline. I think it just has to be postmarked uh, before today, and then they'll count it. So I think that's also why that might take long. Well, thank God there. Yeah, uh, but I mean, I'm telling you, like. Uh, not to sound like you know too much of a pundit or anything like that. The thing that's going to be weird about this election is that we saw an increase in voters, a significant increase in voters. And traditional wisdom would say that that'd be good for Biden. And we found out that that's actually not the case. Um, right. Right. So, I mean, just man, all you know, I think mean, the day like happened in 2018. If I remember correctly, that like turnout was up among Republicans too in some regions. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I remember that being a sort of a thing. I mean, 2018 yeah. took, a, if I remember correctly, took a little while. It looked yeah. bad. It looked bad for the, the Democratic Party in 2018, and then it sort of flipped. Right. Um. I mean, I'll just say this: like, I mean, I don't want to speak for Ben here, um, but I would imagine that you probably think about yourself in the same way. You know, we're not like uh, analysts in like the CNN uh, New York yeah. Times sense that we're trying to call states or like do that kind of thing. Sure. What we're interested in is advocating for a kind of politics that is going to help people in right. the um, in the long run. And it's just like all this is saying is that the world is a lot more open than than people think. And uh, even what we we're talking about earlier with Daniel Bessner. Um, about you know what our strategy will have to be going forward, I think very much stands uh, even more so now than than then, uh, in the sense that like if there's anything that you've learned in the past few years, anything that you think is impossible is actually a lot more <laughs> possible. You know what I mean? Like any kind of idea that there's like any kind of political certainty out there that things are set beforehand, I think it's just absolutely wrong. Totally. And we should like, you know, moments like this is like, oh, you know, it's, it's worrying and stuff. We don't want to do more, more Donald Trump nonsense. Obviously, we don't want to do Biden nonsense either. But, you know, that's the calculus today. Um, but, you know, I, it's just like we need to be very prepared and, you know, actually like quite hopeful and, and, and bold in our in our political strategies, because. If anything, we're seeing from voters across the globe right now. It's just like nobody wants to play by it, the old rule book. Yeah. Which honestly is probably a good terrain in the long term for us. 
Yeah. 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 No, I, I think that's, I think that's right. And I, and I like the distinction um, that, you know, that you made, that you made before. Right. I mean, like I'm, I'm perfectly happy to, um, you know, to sit here and make a few predictions on the stream and about the same spirit that I'm, I'm happy to, uh, to, to talk about my favorite kinds of beer and whiskey on the stream. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, like whatever, it's a fun thing and people like to see it. So why not? But, um, uh, but, but I certainly, I certainly don't, you know, claim to have any kind of like special insight about that. Um, you know, I, I, you know, obviously like the kind of political commentary that I'm interested in doing is the second kind, uh, the second kind that you said. And, um, and, and I like it. That's, that's a very like elegantly said thing, you know, that like, if there is a, um, if there is a silver lining, uh, in, what looks like it might happen here. And, you know, of course it's, you know, we, we don't know it, right. Arizona's yeah. been, uh, lots of places we won't know for days. I still think it's entirely possible that Biden wins by too much to steal. But, um, but if there is a silver line lining and the possibility that that won't happen, or even just a silver lining and the fact that, um, uh, the fact that, uh, that it's, it's going to be so much closer, right. That than we all thought it was, um, then that it's it's that that sense of of openness you know which is uh which is useful uh, mm. right because obviously you know in this particular case you know we wish that it were a little bit more um you know that it were not so right uh but uh but but long term right i mean obviously look if the things that like conventional wisdom thinks are most likely to happen are the only things that are ever going to happen, then we can all call, you know, like, hang it <laughs> up, right? I mean, what's the fucking point? <laughs> like, yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> you know, like radical politics is by definition about holding out hope that the thing that the thing that's going to happen isn't necessarily going to be the thing that's most likely to happen. Um, so I, I guess, I guess, look, I mean, this has been about six and a half hours. I think that if we, if we find out tonight, it's going to be very late tonight. Uh, yeah. so, <laughs> And we ordered, you know, the pizza uh, my wife ordered came a long time ago. So uh, <laughs> I think I, I think I am going to, uh, you know, going to call it here for the, for the night. But I, I guess just to just to leave it on this note, um, I think that uh, <laughs> um, I sorry, I was laughing at the chat. Um, but I think that um, I think that like this. Um, yeah, we can have the discussion about the the things that are funny about this another time, and and you know whatever. I'm 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 not going to deny that there are things that are objectively funny about this, but uh, mostly it's bleak. Uh, but uh, I mean, it's certainly bleak, you know, objectively. Uh, but I guess uh, you know, since I started the show, um, uh, thank you, Matthew. Uh, I have like something I've said a few times. Uh, and and like the presentation is a little jokey, but I'm 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 dead serious about actually all of it uh, is uh, is this that you know we are in a period of defeat, uh, and and I think we just need to be real about that, right? Like like there were some there were some real possibilities with Bernie and Corbin, and um, and none of that happened, and uh, and that doesn't mean that you know that doesn't mean that we're gonna that doesn't necessarily gonna mean that we're gonna lose you know, struggles that are happening next year or the year after that, uh, you know, but it, it does mean that if you're going to get through it, like we are in, you know, what, um, when, uh, you know, when they're to, when the commentators are talking about my beloved Detroit Red Wings, right. You know what they politely call a rebuilding period. Uh, mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, and, and we are in that right for the left. I think, I think that's just true. Like we, we thought we were going to have, this uh, this cheat code, the shortcut, uh, where instead of building a movement and having that um, having that generate successful uh, electoral campaign, we thought we could do the electoral campaign and that would generate the movement. And you know, it came shockingly close to working uh, with Bernie, but it, it didn't work. Uh, you know, we we've obviously got work to do, and none of this is to be defeatist uh, at all, actually, uh, about the long term. But it does mean that you need to have a slightly different perspective. Um, it's it's like uh, that that story that Adolf Reed likes to tell um, about the um, the Soviet officer, you know, the Red Army who who held out, uh, you know, this like one building that he was in charge of defending against the Nazis, you know, for like two months. Yeah. And, and and he's like, look, do you think that guy was was uh, was was 
like really like clued in to like developments that were going on in the Western Front or whatever. It's like, no, he had, he had one job and he did it, right? You know, like and he'd, he'd tell this story to reassure these like nervous Bernie volunteers who are obsessed with everything that was happening minute by minute in every state. Um, and and I, I think that I think that sense of perspective is really important that uh, that we are undergoing some defeats long term. I think we can win, but uh, but I think you also have to be real about the defeats. And I think you just have to think about things in a certain way that doesn't necessarily come easily to um, you know millennial socialists who who maybe uh, got used to things looking you know more short term optimistic. Uh, then, then they're necessarily going to be long term. So, uh, I, I guess um, you know. I guess I'll just close out on um, you know for myself. You know, let, before I let David and Vic sign off, by just repeating what I've said several times on the show, which is that if you're going to, you know, you have to have a certain attitude if you're going to buckle in and and get through this stuff. Um, you know, don't don't live and die with uh, with the daily news cycle. You know, uh, like uh read Marx, drink whiskey and develop a taste for country music it'll get you through all of this much better <laughs> than any of that will for sure well said all right thanks guys i really appreciate Thank it you, this is great all right talk to y'all later get seeing y'all take care guys